Another confirmed prediction regarding Noah's Flood was just published the other day. So rather than just link a technical article, I thought I would break it down for you. But first, let's go back in time and set up the prediction and why it was made in the first place. In 1858, young Earth creationist Antonio Snyder Pellegrini predicted that the Earth's continents were moving on plates and that they once all fit together in the past into one large supercontinent. This prediction was later confirmed to be true, and now all of secular science uses his work today and agrees with it. Later, in 1987, young Earth creationist Dr. John Baumgartner proposed the original pre-flood supercontinent, which God made in Genesis 1, was surrounded by cold ocean floor rocks, and beneath these were the warmer mantle rocks. He stated that since heat rises and cold rocks sink, the ocean floor was prime for a trigger for them to begin sinking into the mantle. That trigger came at the start of the flood, when a massive crack opened in the ocean floor as the fountains of the great deep were broken open. Once this crack opened and the floor began to sink, the plates would have moved rapidly until all of the cold material had sunk into the mantle. This prediction would state that we should still see cold subducted slabs of rock beneath the earth because this event didn't happen that long ago according to young earth creation. Today we have found confirmation of these cold subducted slabs near Earth's core that could only be there if the subduction was rapid at one point in the past. So Dr. Baumgartner's hypothesis was confirmed, which brings us to our next and most recent prediction confirmation regarding seafloor spreading. First, let's look at what evolution considers different rock layers. We say that these are not ages, but rather mega sequences that form during the flood. We can look at the rocks in these layers and see water current direction moving over them. This brings us to the next part. Young Earth Creation predicted that we would see rapid plate movement in the early stages of the flood. In catastrophic plate tectonics, this would be expected to be found in both the Absorica and Zuni mega sequence. The Absorica mega sequence is the fourth mega sequence representing the Pennsylvanian and lower Jurassic systems. This is when catastrophic plate movement began to rapidly create a new ocean floor. The Zuni mega sequence was the second phase where the rate of plate movement would have now been at its fastest. These predictions have already been confirmed, however, with the presence of long thermal paths known as fission tracks throughout these sequences, which were the first to show signs in any rock layers to have experienced rapid plate movement. This brings us to the new evidence. The rocks on the sea floor in the following mega sequences show us that they begin to slow down. These rock layers fall within what is known as the sixth and final Tejas mega sequence, known as the Cenozoic stratigraphic units. These layers represent the end of the flood over the final 150 day period when the volcanism was activated, the mountains formed, and the water began to recede from the earth. The greatest slowing of the sea floor spreading and subduction rates coincide with the early Pliocene, which is the latest Tejas mega sequence, when most of the world's plates had also nearly stopped. This is also when we see the floodwaters had nearly drained off the continents completely, creating the high Cenozoic flood boundary. These layers were predicted to show evidence of a global flood and catastrophic processes, and that is exactly what we have found. Now the only thing left you might be wondering about are the ages given to these rock layers. The presumed ages are nothing but stages of the flood laid down, and the reason they date old is based on radiometric dating. I explain the radiometric dates best like this. If you were to find a watch on the ground and it tells perfect time, could you ever use that watch to determine when it was made? Of course not. Therefore, the dates that we obtain from them make no difference at all, especially now that we have witnessed these radioactive elements form and they date millions or billions of years old, even though they had just formed days prior. So to answer why do we see older radiometric elements in deeper layers, well that's easy. Because the elements with the most atomic weight and mass sink to the bottom and they also date the oldest. So I hope that clears that up for you. 
I just wanted to share with everybody that we have more confirmed predictions in the bank for Young Earth creation. All right, it looks like we are live. Welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie. And on Standing for Truth, we focus on the truth of biblical creation. We host interviews, debates, discussions, and more. And so if you're not yet subscribed, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. And also please share around this content as the truth is so important. Now, today we have a great show for everybody. Our guest tonight is a fantastic speaker with a ton of experience when it comes to creation versus evolution. He understands and appreciates God's word, and he is very well studied and very well informed on the science of creation, evolution, and the age of the earth. It is a privilege to have Russ Miller with me for today's very important presentation. The topic we will be focusing on is evidence for the flood, the Grand Canyon, and Grand Staircase. Russ Miller, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for giving us your time for today. Hi, Donnie, and hi, George, as well. It's a pleasure to be a part of your program today. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it, Russ. Looking forward to this. we got a great chat who are also looking forward to this. You're kind of a fan favorite, and we've already got questions flying in. So today is going to be fun. And I've also got here with me today our award-winning co-host, George Bond himself. George, good to have you here with us today. Uh, thanks, Tony. Thanks for waking, up, uh, waking me up early. And um, just to make you feel better, Russ, you're one of the esteemed people that we've interviewed, so it's great to have people like you on the show. And uh, true to my form, Russ, I'm, I usually start off with a little joke. Some people don't like them, some don't, but <laughs> here we go. So the other, the other day I told my wife, <clears throat> when I look into the mirror, I only see an old man. I need you to make me feel better, I said. So she, she came back and replied, you have perfect eyesight. No. <laughs> did, did that make you feel better? <laughs> Not really, no. Uh, You're feeling but, but, worse today, aren't you, George? <laughs> but, Russ, uh, I'll be in the background. I'll, I'll be collecting questions from people. But, but from time to time, I usually add, add a bit to the discussion. And at the end of it, I'd like to share some recent uh, research that was done by John Mackay. Uh, flume experiments that uh, really turned the uh, stratification issue upside down, really. Um, but I'll leave that as a surprise towards the end. Mm, sounds good. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate that, George. Uh, laughter is the best medicine, and that's why we have you here with us during these programs. So I appreciate it. And before we get into Russ's uh, must-watch and very important presentation here. I want to give our guest a brief introduction. Now, Russ has shared thousands of church service messages, authored five creation-oriented books, including The Cost, written and illustrated two kids' coloring books, developed 16 PowerPoint seminars, a DVD series and study guide, his Grand Canyon Rim, Raft, and Grand Staircase tours, hundreds of radio programs, led dozens of Grand Canyon creation-based river raft trips, and more. Russ has spoken on college campuses, at national conferences, and appeared on many worldwide Christian tele, uh, television programs. He also has a daily post on Facebook and Twitter, always encouraging people to believe the Bible word for word and cover to cover. Russ has 174 college credits and is an effective communicator with kids, teens, college students, and adults. In fact, sharing the information in easy to understand messages is his best gift. After building a successful nationwide firm, Russ gave it away in 2000 to form CESM. A former theistic evolutionist, Russ now ministers to Christians and non-Christians alike, stating, I am not attacking anyone who has been misled 
into believing in Darwinism, theistic evolution or progressive creation. I am here to help them just as someone helped me. Now you can find uh, this introduction and more over on creationministries.org. Russ, again, thank you so much for being here. And I want to hand it over to you for your presentation. And of course, if you would like uh, some additional words in terms of introduction. Well, thank you very much, Donnie. I, I appreciate that. And again, I'm honored to be a part of your program. So I actually uh, put this message uh, together from bits and pieces from other uh, messages uh, this morning for your program. And I want to uh, talk about the global flood, its role in the war of worldviews between the secular view and the biblical view. Uh, what I want to show folks is actually the global flood is a linchpin in this war of worldviews. So I'll, I'll spell that out and show that over the next few minutes. I want to go through some uh, evidences and some biblical statements before we actually get to the Grand Canyon and the Grand Staircase, which most people have probably never heard of, but both are really monuments to the truth and the authority of, of God's word. So let me go ahead and, and start. You know, first of all, whenever I talk about uh, science in the Bible, I like to point out that the Bible is not a science book but it is the true history book of the universe. So whenever the Bible makes a statement that can be scientifically tested, studied, or observed, if it's the true word of God, it should hold up. And there's actually dozens of tidbits found in the Bible that science finally caught up with up to 3,000 years after Scripture told us it was so. Um, just for one example, the Bible contains 83 verses about the need for cleanliness to prevent the spread of illnesses and disease. But these verses were written over 3,000 years before we discovered germs. In fact, those verses out of Leviticus were primarily responsible for stopping the great plagues that killed millions in Europe. So the Bible holds up fine to scientific discoveries. Uh, where, and I'm going to talk about the difference between operational and historical sciences in just a moment. Um, a, a fair question is, are science and the Bible at odds with one another? Because today we are told that they are in conflict. And I actually want to show people that, that what I call real science, operational science, is a believer's true friend. Operational science, what most people think of when we hear the word science, is knowledge that has been derived from the study of observable, testable, repeatable evidences. Something needs to be observable and testable for the findings to truly be science. And that knowledge derived from that observation and testing is operational science. It's led to many of the great improvements we've made over the, the past several hundred years. Most people today don't realize this. In fact, I'll speak in a secular school, and when I first go up to the podium, uh, the kids are just cross-armed glaring at me and mad, which always strikes me as being rather odd, because I'm only there to show them that maybe there's a better way to look at the evidence, but they've been so indoctrinated that they're, they're mad before they even hear anything I have to say. And God just gave this to me. I walked up to a podium one time, and all the kids were glaring at me with crossed arms. And the first thing I said was, hey, let me ask you all a question. How many of the branches of modern science, and there's 200 or so branches, how many of those branches do you guys think were started by Christians? And usually they, someone yells out, none. <laughs> and then I point out, Ashley, over 80% of the branches of modern science were started by Christians in order to study God's creation. And that just melts the cross arms and the mad looks on their faces. And all of a sudden, it just opens up their minds to, wait a minute, how come we've never heard any of this? And I just point out, you're involved in a war of worldviews, and the secular or the humanist side owns the system today, and they teach uh, what they want to teach as science. And Think about it. They, they think random chance brought us about and the magic ingredient lots of time. But how would you set out to study random chance? You can't. What, 
What started modern science were Christians who realized we have an intelligent creator and he probably put some laws and, and formulas in place to govern his creation. And if we study the creation, they call that nature today, we could discover some of those things and put them into practice. And that is what led to modern science as Christians began roughly 82% of the branches of modern science. The greatest scientist of all time, Isaac Newton, the father of the, of the scientific method, Francis Bacon, Louis Pasteur, and on and on we can go. Uh, many of the great science scientists of the past were, were staunch Christians. So let's go to uh, 2 Peter 3 in the New Testament. I want to show you a fantastic uh, prophecy given to us about 1900 years ago. And in the Bible, I should point out, is the only book in the history of the world that lives on its ability to correctly predict the future. Up to 2,000 prophecies have been made, depending on how you add them up, and over 90% of them have already come true with 100% accuracy. In fact, the Bible says the way you can tell the Word of God from all false uh, teachings is the prophecies will come true. The false teachings or prophecies will fail. Maybe one out of five come true and four out of five fail, but the Bible is almost 2,000 for 2,000. Uh, one of the great prophecies in the New Testament is they will come in the last days scoffers. Well, we certainly see lots of scoffers today, right? And Second Peter says they're going to be saying, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase this, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. The Bible foretold 1900 years ago that in the last days, non-believers were going to come along claiming all processes remain the same as they've been since the beginning. Well, that's today known as uniformity. Um, things that we see today have been pretty uniform with the way the rates were in the past. Or if you like big words, it's called uniformitarianism. But things are going to be the same, uniformity. Today, the secular side claims that the present, present processes are key to understanding the past, the past processes. And this was foretold in 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. And that brings us to not operational science, but historical science. I'll speak on a college campus and the science students will say, we've never heard of historical science. And I say, exactly. That's why I said, I'm going to show you things that you're not being told. Now, historical science are, is not knowledge derived from the study of evidence. It is assumptions derived from applying operational science, things that you can test, study, and observe today. Operational science and, and applying what you find in operational science to non-observable events from the past. Well, the, the assumptions derived here in historical science lead to the um, erroneous conclusions they often come up with. Uh, the bias of whoever the interpreter of the evidence is, and it's usually that bias is usually based on uniformity. The present rates are the same as they've always been, corrupt the non-observed assumptions of historical science. Christianity and operational science are not in conflict. Conflict comes when we are talking about historical science. That's where there's conflict between God's word and what they deem as science today. Well, today, a lot of biology and a great deal of geology are actually historical sciences, trying to take things we can see and observe today and apply them to past events that were not observed. Jesus told us in the book of John that Moses wrote of me. We need to understand the foundational issues to understand why all of this matters. Uh, in, the, in the book of Genesis, uh, penned by Moses, we're told that God gave us a perfect creation. Now, it was perfect. It, I think this is almost beyond human comprehension, but try to imagine a perfect creation with no death, no suffering in it. You know, one of the first questions a good scoffer will ask a kid in college to undermine their faith is, hey, how can you have a loving God in this world full of death and suffering? In fact, many of us, something terrible happens to someone we love or care about, or we see something evil take place in the world today. And a fair question is, how can there be a loving God in this world full of death and suffering? Well, we have to go back to the book of Moses or the book of Genesis penned by Moses to understand this. And here's the biblical answer. 
Folks listening today leave this with nothing else. Know how to biblically answer that question. How can we have a loving God in a world full of death and suffering? And the answer is right here in the early chapters of Genesis. God didn't give us the world the way it is today, full of death and suffering. God gave us a perfect creation. What happened to it was Adam's original sin. It was Adam's first sin that corrupted the creation, allowing death to enter. And that's why we live in a world full of death and suffering today, yet we have a loving creator. And that's the biblical response to that question of how can there be a loving God in a world full of death and suffering? Now, the answer, though, should continue on from there. It was Adam's original sin that brought in death, corrupting the creation. But that original sin also separated us from God. Adam walked in the garden with God. We don't walk in the garden with God today because that original sin separated man from God. And this required that we be reunited or redeemed with him. Well, we've got a big problem there. You have to be absolutely righteous, perfect, without sin, to be redeemed with God. And we can't do that. We've inherited our sin nature from Adam and we've all sinned. If you've ever said something that wasn't true, you've lied. If you've ever taken something that didn't belong to you, even a, a, a sticky note you, you've stolen, we have all sinned. So God is so loving that despite our sin that corrupted his creation and separated us from him, he sent his only begotten son to suffer and die, taking our death penalty so that those who believe in Jesus, accepting Jesus and his sacrifice, believing in him as our Lord and Savior, can be redeemed with him for eternity in heaven. That's the foundation of the gospel message of Jesus Christ, who is our loving God, creator and savior. Now, Moses also told us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that God has judged man's sin once already with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. Well, that would be a global flood. Now, had there been a global flood, I would expect the evidence to be overwhelming. I would think that the crust, the surface of the earth that we live on and walk on, would be made up of sedimentary layers stratified out by grain size, weight, and density by the moving water. Uh, you ever seen a miner with a pan? He scoops up some sediments and some water and he sloshes the pan back and forth. Well, that moving water stratifies out the sediments in his pan by grain size, weight, and density. Gold being the densest will fall to the bottom. Well, on a global scale, the year-long floodwaters would have been eroding the surface of the original creation and would have been moving these sediments around the planet stratifying them out by grain size, weight, and density, and then laying them down in the second half of the flood primarily. So instead of having one big brown conglomerate making up the crust of the earth as if it had formed slowly over long ages of time, you would have stratified sediments. You'd have all the shale together making shale layers, all the sandstones making sandstone layers, all the mudstones making mudstone layers, the limestone making limestone layers. You'd have the stratified layers laid down by water had there been a global flood. And those layers stratified out by grain size, weight, and density would be full of billions of things that were drowned and buried so quickly that they didn't even have time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers. And what we find today is the outer crust of the earth, those sedimentary layers are full of billions of dead things that we call fossils that were drowned and buried so quickly, they didn't even have time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers. I was speaking at a church in California a couple of weeks ago, and I started to drive out. I got about four miles from my house, and there was a raccoon that someone had run over right in the middle of the road, dead as a doornail. I came back four days later. Scavengers had already eaten it. It didn't lay there for millions of years waiting for sediments to slowly build up around it so it become, could become a fossil. Things have to be buried immediately to be preserved so they can be fossilized. It's really no wonder Jesus said, if you believe not Moses' writings, how should you believe my words? Well, why would it be important to believe Moses in order to believe Jesus? Well, let's take a look at what I call the humanistic worldview. You could call it the secular worldview as well, or even the atheistic worldview. 
But the humanist worldview is based on those exact same sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water that make up the crust of the earth. You know, Donnie, all the time people ask me, hey, Russ, what evidence do you have that the Bible's true? I always say, well, I have the exact same evidence that atheists use to say it's not true. I mean, think about it. Don't we all live in the exact same world? So don't we all have the exact same evidence? You know, it's, it's never been about who has the evidence. The issue is who gets to interpret the evidence. It's the interpretations of the evidence that uh, can mislead people. Uh, the humanistic worldview, based on the exact same sedimentary layers laid down by water that I think are great proof of the global flood, they just interpret it through their belief system, which is, hey, there was never a global flood. Those layers form slowly over millions and billions of years of time before man evolved on his own. So it's not the evidence, it's the interpretation of the evidence. Now, from a Christian standpoint, the old earth beliefs, though, that say we evolved through millions of years of death and suffering, or even if you believe we were created through millions of years of death and suffering, you've just put death before Adam. Well, see, once you put death before Adam, you can't teach Adam sin brought in death, separating us from God, requiring our redemption. So you've done great harm to people's faith in what eventually leads, in this case, undermines the gospel message. It's an important issue. How did those layers form? Atheists seem to understand this better than most Christians. This from uh, an article in um, American Atheist titled The Meaning of Evolution. And he stated, destroy the original sin by putting death before mankind. And in the rubble, you'll find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, and millions of years of beliefs that put death before man, then Christianity is nothing. And I agree with that statement 100%, which is why it's important to stand firm on the truth and show people why we can trust God's word and how real science, operational-based science, is a believer's true friend. Always has been, always will be. In fact, this world-renowned atheist speaker and, and former Harvard uh, biology professor uh, stated, the revolution against Christianity is what he's talking about, began when it became obvious Earth was ancient rather than having been created 6,000 years ago. He said this finding, old Earth beliefs, were the snowball that started the entire avalanche. The age of the Earth is vital. It's the foundation of the humanist atheist worldview, and it puts death before Adam, which undermines people's faith in the gospel message. So the question really becomes, did Adam's sin bring death into the world, separating us from God, requiring our redemption through Jesus' death on the cross, or did millions of years of death bring man into the world? Well, 1 Thessalonians tells us to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. So let's do that. I've got one of my messages, the top 10 pillars of millions of years beliefs, which I also call the top 10 pillars of death before Adam beliefs. We're going to look at just uh, two or three of those today. Again, back to Second Peter. They'll come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lust, saying, where is the promise of Jesus's return? For since the fathers fell asleep, since they died, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Again, that's uniformity. So they look today historical science, and they see that the stratified layers are forming at roughly one inch per thousand years. Then, in historical science, they take the current rate, thinking the present is the key to the past, look at this, the depth of the stratified layers making up the crust of the earth, and figuring it's always been the same, uniformity, one inch per thousand years, they come up with the ages for those stratified layers. Let me show you what, a, what problems you have with uh, accepting uniformity to guide your thinking of past events. If you've ever changed oil in a car or seen it changed, you pull a little plug out in the bottom of the oil pan and boosh, the oil uh, pours into the pan below. Well, let's say you've never seen that and, and you come along an hour later and you've got a full pan of oil and now it's dropping out of the car at a rate of one drop every hour and a half. 
Well, based on uniformity, you might look at the size of the pan and the amount of oil and say, gee, it took a thousand years to fill that pan with oil. But you'd be absolutely wrong. When you, you base your, your findings of past non-observed events on the belief in uniform processes, your answers can be way, way off, totally erroneous to the actual facts. So in 2 Peter 3, we're told the scoffers are going to be willingly ignorant willingly ignorant that by the word of God, the world that was being overflowed with water perished. In 2 Peter 3, we're told that scoffers in the last days are going to claim uniform processes and deny the global flood. Why would you care about the global flood? Well, the secular humanistic worldview and secular geology today is based on two beliefs. Uniform processes, the present rates are the key to the past, and no global flood, just as the Bible said would happen in the last days. So they look at those strata layers and, and they teach students that the rock layers that make up the majority of the crust of the earth formed at today's rate over millions of years of time. So we call this the geologic time scale today. So the belief in long ages of death provides the foundation today for Darwinism. It's a fruit coming off the old earth trees. It's the foundation for naturalism, humanism, atheism, and Gnosticism, and the compromised positions like theistic evolution, progressive creation, etc. And again, I used to be a, a theistic evolutionist. I'm not attacking any such person. I'm here to help you just as somebody helped me. I had never considered the death before Adam issue and a lot of other issues that we'll discuss um, today. So pillar number one for old earth beliefs is the belief as the Bible foretold that there was never a global flood. Again, they'll come in the last day scoffers willingly ignorant that the world that was being overflowed with water perished. Well, that leads us to pillar number two and where the old earth beliefs, the modern old earth beliefs are really a birth from. And that's the geologic column or geologic time scale. Again, now this was, let me back up, this was invented uh, actually just barely 200 years ago. And they made a drawing of 12 primary layers and they assigned fossils to each of the layers, including index fossils, which supposedly went extinct while that layer was forming. So they wouldn't be found in the layers above because they had gone extinct already. The index fossils are a key to the old earth dating methods. But overall, the column is based on beliefs in uniformity and no global flood. So again, invented in the early 1800s, the 12 primary layers, they assigned names to each layer, gave each of the layers ages based on beliefs in uniformity and the index fossils. In fact, this textbook tells kids on page 306, we date the rock layer by the fossils, the index fossils found in it. Well, okay, fair enough. But where do they get the age for the index fossil? Where well, it says on page 307, we date the index fossils by the rock layer they're in. So they're, they're dating the rock layer by the fossils in it and the fossils in it by the rock layer they're in. It's a total circular argument based on the geologic column. For instance, lobe fin fish were index fossils for rock anywhere from 30 million up to 325 million years old. So a layer found with the lobe fin uh, fish in it were dated up to 325 million years old. A lot of problems with this. Uh, number one, the lobe fin fish has been found alive in several of today's oceans, not extinct up to 325 million years. So you know, I said earlier, there's two ways to look at all the evidence. We all have the same evidence. So I look at that uh, picture of that scuba diver with the fish and I say, hey, that refutes the geologic column as a dating method. But you could look at the exact same picture. Remember, there's two ways to interpret the evidence. And you could say, no, it just proves that, that scuba diver is 325 million years old. Uh, you can choose for yourself which you want to believe. But their index fossils have been showing up alive today by the dozens, and they have become an embarrassment to the geologic column or time scale 
which is the foundation of the old earth dating methods. In fact, they've had to come up with a scientific classification for the living index fossils. They now call them Lazarus Taxon because they have risen from the dead. But they never were dead. They never were extinct. We just had not recognized them yet. And this undermines the geologic column or time scale. But realize it's this column, this time scale, that serves as the foundation for Darwinism, humanism, modern atheism, etc. Now, there's a lot of argument about this, but I'm going to state it plainly because in 20 years, I've never seen anyone overcome this. It's only found in two places in its entirety in the entire world, with all 12 of the layers in the correct order with the corresponding index fossils, which make up the column. And those two places are in school textbooks and museum displays. I know of no single place where the entire column is found. Now, you would think, in fact, even the, the Old Earth Faithful, they only claim it exists in one half of 1% of the Earth's surface. Now, I've looked at several of those places, and they don't have the correct order of fossils, which actually determine if it's the column or not. So I know of nowhere that it actually exists. And if you want to email me someplace where you think it is found, I'd be glad to take a few minutes if you'd send me some links to that and, and check it out. But I know of nowhere that it's ever been found. I've had some secular geologists standing with me at the canyon and, and point at the canyon and say the column's right there. But actually, there's only, not all of the, the main layers are there. The Mesozoic and Cenozoic layers are not there. So at the canyon, they do not have the geologic column. And also be careful when you're talking about the geologic column. It's any time you put two layers on top of each other, you have a geologic column. But the geologic column, the time scale from which the old earth beliefs are birthed, are a different issue altogether. So make sure that they're talking about the geologic column or time scale, not just a couple of random layers on top of one another. Uh, just an example of more of the problems they have. Bacteria were found in, in salt crystals that, according to the geologic column, are 250 million years old, but the bacteria were still alive. That doesn't seem to support the 250 million year time frame. No wonder Jesus said, take heed that no man deceives you. Uh, pillar number, another one of the pillars of old earth beliefs, because I'm not going through these necessarily in the order of my, my top 10 beliefs of old earth uh, dating methods. But uh, another one of the pillars are the radiometric dating techniques. This textbook tells kids that these methods certify the planet Earth is more than 4 billion years old. Let's just take a quick look at carbon dating as an example. It's one of the more popular of the isotope dating methods. And uh, during the process of photosynthesis, so let me back up, uh, cosmic rays enter the atmosphere and carbon-14 is formed in the atmosphere. And that's what's measured in carbon dating. Well, during the process of photosynthesis, plants breathe in CO2 that contain trace amounts of that carbon-14. Animals get carbon-14 in them from eating the plants or from breathing, and we all have trace amounts of carbon-14 in us. Now, there's, there's argument in science over how long the carbon-14 uh, will be there. But I think the majority of opinion is it would be gone in less than 80,000 years in measurable amounts. I've heard as much as 100,000 years. Let's say 100,000 years just to blunt any arguments. But carbon-14 decays away. So once an animal uh, dies, it stops eating and breathing. Or at least, that, well, that's always been my observation. So they're stop, they stop taking in new carbon-14, which is decaying away, and it should be gone in measurable amounts in less than 100,000 years. Now, the less carbon-14 in an item that's found in the ground, the less carbon-14 in it, the older it's going to date because it's decaying away. But you can only carbon date something a few thousand years at best. If they say they carbon dated something over 100,000 years, let's say 500,000 years or 2 million years, and I see this in magazines quite often, you realize that they don't know what they're talking about because the carbon-14 would have been gone. Uh, this from the Anthropological Journal of Canada. The troubles of carbon dating are undeniably deep and serious. There are gross discrepancies and accepted dates are actually selected dates. Selected dates? 
you mean they, they pick a date that they want? Where do they pick a date from? From the man-made geologic column or time scale. The dates have to match the column to be acceptable. Now, personally, I think carbon dating is not particularly accurate. They now try to calibrate it along with tree ring dating, uh, which tells you it's not very accurate to begin with. But I think it at most it's good for about a couple of thousand years. And, and that's mainly because they can calibrate it to known historical events. For instance, if they find a, a cotton shawl and they know that the, uh, the culture that made the shawls existed 18 to 1900 years ago, I guarantee you it's going gonna, it's gonna to carbon date 18 to 1900 years old. They're going to calibrate it to known historical events when they can. This from the American Journal of Science. Radiometric dating would not have been feasible. It wouldn't work if the geologic column had not been there first. Well, what's the man-made geologic column, which doesn't exist, to my knowledge, anywhere in the natural world? Even the old earthers admit it's not there in 99.5% of the Earth's surface. What does that have to do with the radiometric dating techniques? The dating techniques get a range of dates. They want to pick a date that matches the column. For instance, somebody sent me this package of rock salt, and on the label it says, according to the older dating methods, the column, this rock salt is 250 million years old. <laughs> and at the bottom it says it expires in June of this coming year. <laughs> Something's wrong, and I like to point out what that is. So, hey, is there any evidence to support the global flood? Well, we've talked about the stratified layers laid down by water full of uh, billions of uh, dead things that were drowned and buried before they could rot away or get eaten by scavengers. ICR came up with a finding a few years ago on the rate project that they claim that carbon-14, which should be gone in less than 100,000 years, is still found in organic remains throughout the, uh, the layers of the earth, the, the fossil-bearing layers. Well, this would indicate they're less than 100,000 years old. And they also found that the range of amount of carbon-14 was the same from the top layer all the way through to the bottom of the, uh, of the Cambrian layer. Well, this would indicate they were all formed in the same event. Now, I want to tell you what, what I've heard in opposition to that, because I like to you know, give both sides where we can. The other side only gives their uh, side, which really is indoctrination, not education. But the, uh, the opposing argument to that is the carbon-14 has been found because of contamination. They say that the items in the air and the layers were contaminated with the same range of amount of carbon-14. Well, okay, that's, that's fair enough, but that poses a huge problem for the radiometric dating techniques, which are based on several assumptions or wild guesses, if you will, and one of the main assumptions, wild guesses with regarding to all the radioisotope dating methods, is that there was never any contamination. If they're admitting contamination here, then that wipes out all the radiometric dating techniques. Either there was contamination or there was not contamination. The radiometric dating techniques, historic science, are looking at today's rate of uh, decomposition of a uh, isotope, uh, radioisotope element, and they're saying it was the item or the rock being dated was never contaminated by the gain or loss of the item, so that the if so that the uh, the dates they're coming up with based on the based on the gradual decomposition of that element give the date of the formation of the rock that they're dating. If there was contamination, then it ruins all isotope dating methods. So that's a big problem for the old earth side. Also, never has natural gas been found, never has a coal layer been found, never has an oil deposit been found that doesn't still contain carbon-14, which should decay away in measurable amounts in less than 100,000 years. That would indicate all those stratified layers that make up the crust of the earth formed in the last few thousand years. In fact, remains in the various fossil bearing layers, uh, remains are found with amino acids, uh, proteins, red blood cells, 
Um, even DNA, even dinosaur DNA has now been found, soft tissues and dinosaur bones. Most people are aware of those nowadays. Why isn't that front page news? You know, because dinosaurs are used as one of the five pillars of getting kids to believe in millions of years of death existing before mankind. No wonder in 1 Timothy we're told to avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Now, that word science can mean knowledge. Avoid false knowledge, false science being sold as if it were true. Beware of false teachings, basically, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. So how has this and what does this have to do with Grand Canyon and the Grand Staircase? Well, the secular world interprets Grand Canyon again through the two um, belief systems, the two starting points that are uh, prophesied in, in Scripture in 2 Peter 3. Grand Canyon is basically interpreted through the beliefs in uniformity and no global flood. <clears throat> We're taught Grand Canyon formed over millions of years of time, putting death before Adam. So please realize the study of Grand Canyon has never been about the evidence. It's not about the stratified layers that make up the rock walls. It's not about the big hole in the ground itself, because we all have the exact same Grand Canyon to study. The study of Grand Canyon is about the worldview, the philosophical framework through which the evidences get interpreted. We're taught Grand Canyon number one, the stratified layers, the rock layers, and the canyon itself both formed over millions and millions of years of time. That is taught as if it were science, that's historical science based on massive amounts of bias, not on the evidence. So a key question is, how long did the stratified layers take to form? And how did the canyon form? And how long did it take to form? Well, first of all, there are many evidences at Grand Canyon that the strata were laid down quickly. Uh, for instance, there are no time gaps between the layers. In fact, this from Geology Illustrated, there is no evidence of prolonged weathering or erosion at the canyon. Time gaps. All the layers are laid down horizontally, one right on top of the other with nice, nice straight contact points. There are no time gaps like uh, weather from uh, rain erosion or snow melt erosion, etc. cetera. Um, no uh, marks in the layers where water runoff uh, dug small gullies in the layer before the next layer formed and would have filled in those uh, those areas and no acid le leaching from rocks etc no plant growth between them those would all be time gaps the layers at grand canyon were laid down one right on top of the other uh, robert gentry had an interesting discovery on the colorado plateau through which grand canyon cuts Microscopic spheres of polonium-210 form radio halos that last up to two years. Now, let me back up and explain that a little bit better. These are microscopic elements, these polonium halos. Uh, when polonium first forms, it gives off a burst of energy, kind of like a big firework going off in the sky. Well, that burst of energy will stay there for about up to two years, one and a half to two years. And if it's in a a log that petrifies within that two year period of time, it'll catch this ball of energy. When that ball is cut in half, it looks like the picture in front of you right now. You can see the rings of energy. They call those radio halos. So these have been found in three different layers on the Colorado Plateau. The uh, Eocene, Jurassic and Triassic layers have these polonium halos where the polonium formed a ball and then the layer above was laid down and squished the layer. You see that dark uh, um, elongated, looks like a football in the center. That was the round circle it formed and the layer above was laid down and squished it. But after that event took place, it started forming the round uh, circle yet again. And what that shows is that it was squished while still forming. And once that event took place, the layer above had been laid down. It started making the round um, 
radio halos yet again, proving those three layers were not laid down over a 250 million year period of time, like we're taught in secular textbooks, but all three layers had to form in less than two years, like during the year long global flood. Uh, the Coconino sandstone is the third layer down. If you stand on the rim of Grand Canyon, it's that big whitish band that looks like a ring around the bathtub. It goes all the way around the canyon. That arrow is pointing uh, to the Coconino sandstone on the north wall of Grand Canyon. Now, secular geology teaches that this layer formed in dry deserts over, you guessed it, millions and millions of years of time. In fact, this has been for the last hundred years one of the biggest proofs of old earth beliefs uh, promoted through Grand Canyon. But there's a lot of different problems with the Coconino sandstone and old earth beliefs. The Coconino is famous for its cross bedded sand dunes. So the way that this, these cross beds form is sand dunes can form either in dry deserts, be moved along by wind, or underwater and the grains are moved along by water. Well, a cross bedded sandstone forms as a sand dune forms, the sand falls over the edge and forms a cross bedded sandstone. So these angles of inclination are of interest here because the, um, and this is not 100% accurate, but I would say it's in the 80% range accurate. The angle of slope implies whether or not the dunes formed or not uh, underwater or in wind. Generally in dry deserts, the angle of inclination of that cross bed is above 26 degrees if it formed in dry deserts and less than 24 degrees if it formed underwater. The angle of inclination in the cross beds of the Coconino average about 22 degrees, which indicate they formed underwater. Now that all in by itself is not 100% conclusive proof that they formed underwater, but it's very strong proof. But what's even better proof are the uh, angled uh, footprints found in those cross beds. Footprints are found, and these are generally uh, regarded as some sort of an amphibian, um, are found in those cross beds only going uphill. And they're found by the millions. They're either going uphill or at an angle uphill. They're never going downhill, always uphill. Why is that? Well, that would indicate water deposits because the critter got washed over the forming sand dune and deposited at the base of the cross bed. And the only way for that critter to get out of that water was to go uphill. He got to the top, washed away as the sand buried his and preserved his trackways for the fossilized trackways we see today. And the poor little guy kept going up, got washed down, up, going washed down, leaving trackway after trackway till he was eventually carried off and drowned in those flood waters. The grains of sand also indicate water deposition of the Coconino. Uh, grains that form in dry deserts usually tumble along and the grains of sand looked at under a microscope are generally round. When they form underwater, they tend to form a lot quicker and not tumbling around and they're usually very angular. Well, if you look at the, the, ang uh, the grains of sand of the Coconino sandstone under a microscope, you're gonna find that they're very angular again, supporting that they formed underwater, not in dry deserts. Uh, that picture, by the way, you might be able to, if you can see it, I don't know if you can see it well enough, but you've got the, uh, the, the Bright Angel Trail dropping down into Indian Gardens, one of the more popular trails at Grand Canyon. But the trackways go uphill, indicating water deposition. You know, at Grand Canyon, when I take people to the rim, I can point out what I consider to be creation rock at the rim, you can look down into the gorge and you will see the lowest layer with the stratification in them that were laid down by moving water is that cliff, just um, that top arrow, just to the left of the, of the arrow, you see that dark cliff and that is the Tapete Sandstone. Now it's the lowest of the uh, stratified layers at Grand Canyon. Now it sits on non-stratified igneous and metamorphic rocks, mostly schists and granites that form what they call the foundational or the base, basement rock at Grand Canyon. 
Well, those non-stratified rock layers are, in my humble opinion, original creation rock, probably covered by about two miles of sediments prior to the global flood. The flood waters erupted as the fountains of the deep erupted, and over the first 150 days of that global flood, they were eroding those sediments and eroding them and eroding them. Finally, after 150 days, the fountains stopped spewing forth the scalding hot waters, and they started now redepositing these layers that have been rolling around with the waters and being stratified out by grain size, weight, and density. And now they redeposit those sediments stratified so you get all the shale, all the mudstone, all the limestone layers, et cetera. Uh, and at Grand Canyon, you can see where the non-stratified rock meets the stratified layers. And at that point, that's where I contend that creation and judgment are seen in the bottom of Grand Canyon. In fact, where those two layers meet, where the Tapeat Sandstone sits on the non-stratified schists and granites is geologically called the Great Unconformity. Now, this is where the flood layers, I believe, meet the creation rock. But even secular geology claims that they're missing 1.2 billion years of layers that are supposed to exist between those non-stratified layer, uh, excuse me, non-stratified rock and the Tapete sandstone. They're missing 1.2 billion years of layers there. They call it the great unconformity. I call it the great inconsistency. And if you go to Grand Canyon, you can go down one of the trails. When I used to lead raft trips through the canyon, I, there were a couple of places you could do this right along the river where you can actually put your thumb on the non-stratified uh, creation rock and your, your fingers on the first of the judgment layers, literally where creation and judgment physically meet right there in Grand Canyon. And there are some other uh, places around the U.S. that I know of where the great unconformity is, uh, is shown, it's exposed, where creation and judgment rock meet. But Grand Canyon strata testify to God's global flood judgment. And remember, Darwinism, naturalism, and humanism are all based on those beliefs. Those layers form slowly over millions or billions of years of time. So they must deny the global flood because a global flood would explain how they form quickly, wiping out not only the millions of years beliefs that put death before Adam, but it would also destroy Darwinism, naturalism, humanism, modern atheism, agnosticism, etc., and bring people to the one conclusion, which is that God's word is true, word for word, and cover to cover. And that's why we need to share this and get this out with people. Because belief in the age of the earth comes down to how you believe the rock layers formed. And even if you believe in old earth beliefs, and you have never given the formation of the layers a second thought, you're accepting the beliefs of those who believe they form slowly, not quickly, during a global flood. So how did Grand Canyon form? Well, we're told, of course, that it formed over millions of years as the Colorado River carved it out slowly at today's uh, rate of erosion, uniformity. Well, let me ask you a question. I get this question from scoffers and skeptics. I also get it from well-meaning people. I think it's a, a very important question. And that question is this. If rivers carve out huge canyons over millions of years of time, and if the earth is billions of years old, well, why aren't there millions of Grand Canyons everywhere? I mean, every river, gully, stream, and creek should be in its own Grand Canyon by now, if indeed the earth was millions and billions of years old. So why aren't there Grand Canyons everywhere? Well, first of all, Grand Canyon formed due to a series of very unique circumstances. There I am with a group on the edge of Grand Canyon. I've, I've been leading tours to Grand Canyon, oh, for about 19 years now. Uh, before the, the pandemic, I was uh, leading up to 1,000 people a year to the canyon, usually in groups of about 50. And there I am with a school group on the edge of the canyon. Right behind my head there, that butte is some of the most awesome proof of the global flood anywhere in the world. That's called Cedar Mountain or Cedar Butte. I'll explain that here in just a moment. But they both support Cedar Butte and Red Butte give solid support to the global 
flood. Now, these are two sister buttes. Uh, Red Butte is found oh, about seven or eight miles south of Tucson, where the Grand Canyon IMAX is. Most people that go to the South Rim drive right by Red Butte, some of the most awesome proof of the flood in the world, but they don't, don't give it a second thought, and they go to the canyon where they're told the area formed over millions of years of time. Uh, Cedar Butte is over by Desert Viewpoint. It's actually officially called Cedar Mountain, Cedar Mountain, Cedar Butte, and Red Butte. Uh, Tucson, the name translates land of the isolated buttes, referring to these two buttes. They stand 900 feet tall above the rim of the canyon. If you look at the picture on, on the left of Cedar Butte, you see the rim of Grand Canyon. You see Cedar Butte is actually 900 feet, oh, <clears throat> excuse me, above the canyon. It's made of the 600-foot Moenkopi layer, and the 300-foot Chin Lee layer, which both sit on top of the Kaibab limestone, which makes up the rim of Grand Canyon and makes up the top layer of the Colorado Plateau. So the Moenkopi and the Chin Lee, those 900 feet of, of layers, used to exist over the entire region, but has been uh, removed by a massive erosional event. But God, in his divine wisdom, knowing Grand Canyon would be one of the five pillars of Old Earth beliefs, left two remnants at both of the entrance points, the eastern entrance to the south rim and the southern entrance of the south rim. He left two undeniable proofs of flooding that had to be on a global scale right there. So we'd be without excuse. So what in the world? How, what removed 900 feet of layers? Well, actually, if we go back to this uh, slide with Cedar Butte and Red Butte, the 900 feet are just the start. There used to exist almost 10,000 feet of rock layers above where today's rim stands. In other words, there used to be almost two miles of rock layers on top of the Kaibab limestone that makes up the rim of Grand Canyon. Cedar Butte and Red Butte are just remnants of about one-tenth of what is missing. When I stand on the edge of the canyon with people, I tell them, bracket Cedar Butte with your thumb and your, your index finger, and now add nine times that much on top. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's how much rock layer has been removed for tens of thousands of square miles. It used to exist right on top of where we're standing at the edge of the canyon. So what we think happened was continental drift took place toward the end of the flood quickly, not slowly and uniformly at today's rate. Happened fairly quickly. Uh, late flood waters eroded uh, what is now the uh, southwestern United States, removing up to, up to two miles of rock layers from the southwestern region in the Colorado Plateau, leaving behind in southern Utah and northern Arizona what is geologically called the Grand Staircase. So in this depiction from the National uh, uh, Geologic Society, uh, I believe my... I can't see the uh, the uh, reference at the bottom here, but um, I believe that's where it's from. But you've got Grand Canyon depicted on the left. Now, it's not a real good depiction of the canyon, but if you notice it cuts through that uplifted area. That's the Kaibab Upwork. Grand Canyon does not cut a mile deep into the plain. No, the area was uplifted. Grand Canyon cuts through the Upwork. When you're staying on the rim of Grand Canyon, you're on top of the Upwork looking at the canyon that cuts through the uplifted uh, layers. But if you go north of Grand Canyon in these pictures, if you look at that, um, and I don't know if you can see this on your screen or not, but that top layer, the Kaibab limestone depicted there in this uh, drawing of the canyon, if you go north, it's subducted, and you'll see it gets buried by up to almost two miles of other rock layers that used to be above that region but have been removed, God leaving uh, red and cedar of buttes there at the south rim so that we would know of this massive erosional event. But if you go north, and I, I generally, there's the chocolate cliffs um, um, made up of the Moenkopi mudstones that make up the base of red and cedar buttes. Uh, but if you go north about 100, excuse me, about 65 miles, you come to the 2,000 foot tall Vermilion Cliffs. Now, if you climb up on top of those 2,000 foot cliffs and go about 40 miles north, you'll come to um, 
Zion. And if you climb up on top of those 2,500 foot cliffs and go 40 to 45 miles north, you'll come to the 2,500 foot pink cliffs where we find Bryce. So let's take a quick look at this. Again, there I am at, on the rim of Grand Canyon by Desert View talking to some people with Cedar Butte standing behind me. It's at the uh, southeastern edge of the Grand Canyon, and it's 900 feet above where I'm standing right there on the rim of the canyon. Those layers used to be on top of where we are right there. If you've ever been to Grand Canyon, those layers used to be 900 feet above the rim of the canyon. And again, south of Tucson, you get the 900 foot tall Red Butte. Both are made up of the 600 feet of Moenkopi and the 300 feet of the Chin Li layers. Now, if you go 60 miles north of Grand Canyon at Desert View, you'll come to the Vermilion Cliffs. And the Vermilion Cliffs stand 2,000 uh, feet tall. Um, they're sort of a reddish uh, uh, sandstone made of the Moenkopi and the uh, Kayenta formations, if that means anything <laughs> to you. But they're 2,000 feet tall, roughly. Now, if you were to climb up on top of the Vermilion Cliffs, and by the way, that's where the river raft, I'm at Desert, um, excuse me, um, uh, Lee's Ferry there taking that picture. And uh, that's where the river raft trips are launched through the canyon. On our rim and raft trips that come from Page at the bottom of Glen Canyon, 17 miles downriver around Horseshoe Bend, we get out at Lee's Ferry. As I'm using this area to show you the truth of God's word, because you're you're rafting through these this uh, canyon, which is Glen Canyon and Marble Canyon, and all of a sudden, just before you get to Lee's Ferry, you got these 500 to 2,000 foot cliffs on both sides of you. You emerge from those cliffs, and they're cut like a knife and gone all the way to the sea. So if you climb up on top of the Vermilion Cliffs and go about 45 miles north, you'll start running into the 2,500 foot tall uh, white and gray cliffs through which Zion cuts. So on our Grand Staircase tours, we do the South Rim, the North Rim of Grand Canyon. We spend a couple of nights in Zion and we go to Bryce and the river rafting uh, trip I just mentioned as well. Now, if you climb up on top of the 2,500 foot white and gray cliffs and go about another 40 to 45 miles north, you'll come to the 2,500 foot tall pink cliffs where we find Bryce. And just north of Bryce, uh, you can't, you, well, you can see it in that picture. I don't know if you can see it on your screen, it is the Ponsagant Plateau, which basically is the end of the Grand Staircase. But Bryce Canyon, they call it Bryce Canyon. It's actually not a canyon. It's actually at the edge of a plateau where it drops off. It's actually a big sapping structure. Uh, one of the things, in fact, what the secular teachings are at Bryce, you know, these, these neat uh formations they, they see at Bryce, they call them hoodoos. Well, the way that they say the hoodoos form is over, well, you know, millions of years of time, water gets into the cracks and freezes and expands and melts and freezes and expands, and that cracks off the rock, leaving behind the hoodoos. Well, one of the things I point out there at the rim of, Grand, of Bryce, excuse me, and I point this out at Grand Canyon as well, is there's no rock debris on the ground. There's virtually no rock debris. Uh, the way that these actually formed, if it was over long periods of time, you'd have rocks piled up almost as high as the hoodoos by now. But there's hardly any rock debris because this was a sapping structure. The water came up against the side of this butte. And when the water drained, suddenly they left the hoodoos behind, taking the debris with them. Uh, and you'll see that Bryce is a big amphitheater. Like um, the photo on the right is at a Grand Canyon, but you see those big amphitheaters. You ever walk along the edge of a river? A sapping structure, the water gets under the edge, and when it leaves, the, the edge just collapses straight down and makes these little amphitheaters. Well, on a larger scale, you see this at Grand Canyon and certainly uh, at Bryce Canyon. It's a sapping structure. Now, again, if you look down into Bryce, you'll see that the rock debris is pretty well missing. Long ages of crumbling hoodoos would have left piles of rock as almost as high as the hoodoos are today. So what happened? Well, the Bible tells us toward the end of the flood, the waters rushed up by the mountains and into the valleys below. I think these waters slosh back and forth, running up against the mountains, then going back into the lower areas, which are forming today's ocean basins. Textbooks correctly teach you can't bend rock. It would snap if you bend it. 
And yet all around the globe, we find massive geologic compression events where entire mountain ranges, hundreds of feet of finely stratified rock layers laid down by water have been squished together like an accordion with up to 160 deg degree bends in the rock, but the rock's not broken. Now, how do you bend rock 160 degrees without snapping it? Now, the sacral excuse that I've been given is that entire area was subducted several miles below the surface to where they were superheated. And when they were burnt back up to the surface, the molten rock was then folded, came to the surface, and it's cooled. And that's how you bend it without breaking it. Well, there's a problem with that. If you superheat sedimentary rock, it'll metamorphose and would be metamorphic rock today. But there's still sedimentary rock. So the subduction and superheating doesn't fit the evidence. But toward the end of the flood, when the mountains arose and the valley sank down and any geologic or continental drift took place, when they stopped, you would have had folding events where the layers folded without breaking the rock layers. Now, toward the end of the global flood, the mountains arose and the valley sank down and the water Assuaged. It sloshed up by the mountains and went back into the low areas, and they sloshed back and forth for a couple of months, which I'm going to imagine is one of the many reasons Noah and the animals stayed on the ark even for a couple of months after it had landed on the mountains of Ararat. Now, this is a satellite photo of Grand Canyon. Uh, we're looking down at the canyon. The north rim is over 8,500 feet in elevation, but the river enters the canyon at about 2,800 feet elevation. Uh, well over a mile below, um, the rim is well over a mile above where the river enters the canyon. And water doesn't flow uphill. So they've got a problem there. They taught the ancient river theory for about 100 years that the upwork formed at the exact same rate that the water was cutting through it. That's been debunked now for about 60 years. And they finally stopped teaching it, I think, about 30 years ago or so. But most people today still uh, think of the ancient river theory because that's what most people were taught when they were kids. Then they came up with the precocious gully or stream capture theory where near Kanab Creek, uh, there was an event where the, the uh, waters, uh, rain flow and stuff were slowly eroding from the southeast uh, southeastern edge and the Colorado River was carving in from the north and the western edge and then turning off into Kanab Creek. Well, when I used to, to, and eventually they say that the two erosional events met and then the Colorado went on through and where it forms today, leaving behind Grand Canyon. Well, when I used to, to lead raft trips through the canyon there at Kanab Creek, it's a spectacular straight stretch of the river where the rock wall on river left is literally 700 feet straight up for about a three mile stretch. And right in the middle of that, Kanab Creek turns off where they say the Colorado River was, was turning off before the erosional events met. But it immediately goes into these little uh, meandering loops uh, that couldn't have been cutting those 700 foot cliffs on one side raging through there and then turn it into meandering loops. That doesn't make any sense. Also, there's no spot where you can show where the two met. It's just one straight length of, of uh, 700 foot tall wall. The uh, stream capture theory doesn't make any sense uh, in my humble opinion. And uh, secular geologists, like flood geologists, by the way, are both scrambling to try to, to uh, come up with the answers to the various problems they, they have with geology, especially at Grand Canyon. I'll be the first to admit I, I, I put, took, I led a, uh, a nine-day river raft trip through the canyon a few years ago with 11 geologists. And the one thing I came away with after that was that they don't agree on anything. And the reason for that, and it's, it's nothing, no, no knock against them, but it's a historical science. You're trying to take things that you can observe today and then extrapolate those into the past. And it's very difficult to get any one theory to match. So I never try to sell any particular theory because I understand they've all got challenges and people are working hard to try to, to work those out. But this again is a uh, satellite photo of Grand Canyon. The white is snow. It's, it's on the upwarp that was uplifted to around 3,500 feet above the plain. So this, the, the upwarp is covered with snow 
whereas the lower elevations on the plain are not. But as you can see, Grand Canyon cuts through the uplifted area. It doesn't cut necessarily into the plain. It cuts through the upwarp. That's what makes Grand Canyon spectacular. So the area was uplifted. You had the late flood waters removed up to two miles of rock layers, leaving behind and, and scraping it down to the Kaibab limestone. That if you've been to northern Arizona, Flagstaff, Arizona sits on the Kaibab limestone. The rim of the canyon is the Kaibab limestone. But the Kaibab limestone and the Kaibab plateau was uplifted in what's called the Kaibab upwarp, which is a north south trending monocline flexing the plateau up to about 3,500 feet above the plain. The canyon cuts through that upwarp. In fact, if you go into the Grand Canyon, you probably have to do this on a raft trip, you'll find lots of folded sedimentary layers laid down by water, like um, in the upper left is the Carbon Creek Fold. That's the monument fold on the right. I'm at a little bit of uh, Bright Angel Shale at Whitmore Wash that's folded in the lower left corner. But these are folded in 90 degree folds, yet the rock was not broken, indicating they were still muds toward the end of the flood when the mountains arose and the valley sank down following the massive erosional event above it. So what we think happened was toward the end of the flood when the mountains arose, the Rocky Mountains in in Colorado, the Wasash Mountains of, of Utah and the Sierra Madres running through California were uplifted uh, in a north-south trending direction. Now, this diverted late floodwater south, and they went through what is now the scab lands of southern Utah and northern Arizona, including the Grand Canyon region, emptying out toward the Gulf of California. Grand Canyon's formation, well, there are, again, several developing theories, and I try not to set on any one theory. I, I'm not trying to sell any particular theory. I'm standing up for God's word, saying even if we don't know exactly how things took place, just like the secular scientists don't know, we, we have good scientists working on it, but I'm not trying to sell any particular person's theory. I'm just trying to let you know that you can trust God's word, word for word and cover to cover. We theorize that the canyon was formed as late flood waters form a channeling event. Now the uh, two miles of sediments had just been removed. The mountains and the Kaibab upwarp formed quickly. And as these waters started to dissipate, they started to channel and they cut through the Kaibab upwarp, leaving behind Grand Canyon in a matter of days. Marble Canyon channels in from the north whereas the Little Colorado River Canyon channels in from the northeast. Now, these two meet at the base of the Kaibab Upwarp at the start of the official start of Grand Canyon and cut through that upwarp in a matter of days, not slowly, over never seen millions of years of time. And you need to picture this. The raging waters were carrying millions of tons of, of sand grains gravel and rock and boulders up to 200,000 pound boulders ripping through that upwarp at about 120 miles per hour. It was like a giant belt sander ripping through the upwarp and spreading the missing 900 cubic miles of sediments widely so they're difficult to identify today. I've been told by geologists they think some are outside of Phoenix, some are over in San Diego County, but they're spread wide. They're not along the edge of the Colorado River or down in the Gulf because the Colorado River had nothing to do with the formation of the major portions of the canyon. It's only formed the slow meandering loops you see in the bottom of the canyon today over the last 4,000 to 4,500 years since the river entered the canyon. Uh, raging waters lead to a lot of uh, massive problems. I'll just mention one, cavitation bubbles. Cavitation bubbles implode at about almost a half a million pounds per square inch. So at um, Glen Canyon, uh, um, north of, or by Page, Arizona, about 17 miles above Lee's Ferry, where the river rat trips start, back in 1983, they had a, a great snow year and massive runoff. And in the spring, they had lots of rain and all this water was rushing into Lake Powell to where the water came within a few feet of the top of the dam. 
If water would go over the dam, it would cause that dam to collapse catastrophically and it would have wiped out Lake Mead, uh, the, the dams all down river, including Hoover Dam and all of the cities along the Colorado River. So they started opening up all the spillways to let as much water out of the lake as possible. And they, th fortunately this happened during the middle of the day so they could see what was going on. The dam started to shake the engineers went out and peered over the edge of the dam and the spillway on river left was shooting water about 200 yards down river. It was coming out with such pressure, but the water had turned red. A cavitation event had taken place. They shut down the spillway immediately and went inside to see what had happened. This cavitation event, these tiny bubbles imploding at almost a half a million pounds per square inch had eaten through the three foot steel reinforced concrete walls of that spillway and left a hole 40 feet deep, 40 feet wide and 150 feet long in a matter of minutes. If this had taken place at night, they might not have known what had happened and they would have lost that entire dam system and all the cities along the Colorado River in Arizona and Southern California. Geologists now think, and this comes from uh, World News and uh, National Geographic for Kids, they say that geologists now think the Grand Canyon grew in quick spurts from massive flooding over 750,000 years. They've got to hang on to some time. It's the foundation of everything they believe in. But if you go to Grand Canyon, the vertical canyon walls testify of rapid formation, not slow, gradual formation. Also, the lack of rock debris, as I pointed out at Bryce, also exists in the main chasm at Grand Canyon. You see, rock walls collapse over time. And if it had stood there for millions of years, as they claim, it should be almost filled up with rock debris by, by now. But if you go to the canyon and look into the main uh, chasm around the major viewpoints, you'll see there's hardly any rock debris which indicates that not only did it form rapidly, but it formed relatively recently as well. This textbook asks kids, challenge your thinking. Grand Canyon shows wide meandering loops of an old youthful or, or, or of an old mature river, but then it shows straight up and down steep walls of a very fast moving youthful river. How might this conflict be explained? Well, it doesn't fit with the old earth beliefs. The only way I can explain that viably is it took a very special set of circumstances to form Grand Canyon. Toward the end of the flood, the mountains arose, the valley sank down, late floodwaters removed almost two miles of layers from above today's rim of the canyon. As the mountains arose and the valley sank down, the Kaibab upwarp formed, late floodwaters eroded through, channeled through the upwarp, leaving behind Grand Canyon with the straight up and down walls, the Colorado River then entered the already formed canyon and cut the slow meandering loops since its uh, introduction to the canyon about 4,000 or so years ago. Polished River Rock is another thing I used to show people on our, our raft trips. Water running over rocks will polish the rocks. I'm sure you've all seen Polished River Rock before. Now, Grand Canyon, I used to ask some of the, the old earth guides that we had, do you guys really believe the, the river carved this slowly over millions of years of time? And they would say, yes. And I'd say, well, what's that shiny rock over there? And they say, that, that's river rock. The water running over the rock over long periods of time leaves the polished river rock behind. And I would ask them, well, then answer this. How come the polished river rock in the bottom of Grand Canyon only goes up about 15 to 20 feet above the river? And then thousands of feet from there up, it's not polished. If the, if the river had carved out the canyon slowly, it would be polished from the top slowly all the way down to the bottom. No, the canyon formed quickly. The river entered the already formed canyon, leaving polished river rock only in the very lowest stretches above the river. My friends, Grand Canyon and the Grand Staircase are monuments to God's global flood judgment. And honestly, the uh, geologic periods are very important to have a starting point for scientific investigation. But the only real difference in the secular um, geologic time frame and the biblical time frame is what event laid down those layers and how long did it take for those layers to form? 
The biblical time frame, looking at a global flood, fits the evidence like a hand in a glove, fits better than the old earth beliefs do when you look at all of the evidences. There's some of the evidence that really only fit a biblical interpretation. In fact, this Nobel Prize winning scientist stated, the best data we have are exactly what I would have predicted if I had nothing to go on but the five books of Moses. There is no reason not to read God's word and believe God's word, word for word and cover to cover. So why do secularists and humanists continue to promote millions and billions of years of time at the Grand Canyon? Well, because millions of years of time is the foundation of Darwinism, naturalism, humanism, atheism, agnosticism, etc. And if there was a global flood, it would explain how those layers form quickly, destroying not only the old earth beliefs, but all of those beliefs I've just named and many more as well. Millions and billions of years of time are the foundations for these groups. That's why the global flood is the linchpin in the war of worldviews. And they don't de deny the global flood because of a lack of evidence. They deny the global flood because it would destroy their belief system. So the real question is, did death exist before Adam? Or did God judge man's sin with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven? Can we read God's word and believe God's word? I say, yes, we can. From Ephesians, we're told, Be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Come and join us on some of our rim and raft trips. We've got several, uh, usually between May and September. Uh, they're set months in advance. I, I don't do daily tours. So join one of our trips. A lot of them are already sold out this year, but I think there are a couple of rim and raft trips and one grand staircase trip that still have openings. They are awesome and fun Christian tours. My book, Cost, cover, stands for Creation, Original Sin, Separation, and the Cross, Our Need for Redemption. And it covers the top 10 old earth beliefs, the top 10 evil fruit of these beliefs, the top 10 Darwinian teachings, the top 10 proofs of creation in the flood. Study guides go with it. Check that out on our site, which is creationministries.org. And I hope this information will be a blessing uh, to you all. Thank you for your time. Wow, Russ, I got to say that was a fantastic presentation. So Thank much you. great information. An hour and a half really flies by. And I'm not the only one saying this, but I'm going to definitely be rewatching this uh, later just to catch every single uh, great point. Uh, tons of great feedback from the chat. Russ, we've had a great chat, lots of compliments. And thank you so much for that important and, in my opinion, irrefutable uh, presentation. Well, thank you, Donnie. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. We've only got about 10 hours worth of questions, uh, Russ, so I hope you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> taking I'm going to let like George, George is going to handle those for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 concur, I concur with those sentiments uh, there, Donnie. I agree that uh, that was a massive presentation, which, which I'm going to add to, and uh, I'm going to share my screen now. I'm not going to let Russ have all the glory. But, <laughs> Actually, uh, that's I, what I was going to say, George. Russ, you just got done speaking for about an hour and a half straight massive presentation tons of great information so we're going to give you a, a roughly two minute break and we're going to hand it over to george to uh that sounds good to me <laughs> sit back and relax well russ yeah well okay earned. i'm gonna share i'm gonna share my screen sure and can you see that yes okay going on from what uh, russ was saying about um, Eighty-two percent of the modern sciences um, being the result of actual creationists. Th this is a pie chart of um, Nobel prizes for the past hundred years, and you'll see Christians at sixty-five point four and Jewish at twenty-one point one. That that adds up to eighty-six point five percent of all Nobel prizes were awarded to um, to creationists. And you'll see the atheists, agnostics, and free thinkers there are around 10%. And most of those, by the way, were for um, um, prizes on uh, literature, I believe. 
But now, just just to go on to the diamonds issue, uh, Russ mentioned contamination. I'd like to say is how do you contaminate a diamond? We've looked at this uh, issue about contamination, especially diamonds. If uh, people know uh, the carbon structure of the diamonds is so tightly packed that nothing can get into it except light and possibly radiation. So one of the rescue devices that uh, secular scientists have proposed is the carbon-14 in the diamonds was a result of um, uh, radiation from nearby uranium converting the free nitrogen in the diamond into C14. But that's been dispelled because, uh, well, if uranium, for example, has a half-life of uh, 4.5 billion years, while uh, C14 has a half-life of 5,700 years. So if you do the maths, the um, the carbon-14 is decaying probably about 300,000 times faster than, uh, than the actual uranium can make it. So that's a pretty poor rescue device, by the way. But just to um, add to, uh, I think, the radio halos, uh, you know, they talk. They, there's there's a lot being said about the heat problem. I mean, those radio halos. If there was a excessive heat problem, would not exist. Same with the fissures. They would have annealed, and there wouldn't have been any evidence of that at all. So, that's one one area. Not only do, does it prove an accelerated heat decay, but uh, but also that there wasn't much of uh, heat that. Um, would have uh, kept those radio halos alive. Now, um, Russ mentioned about the river deltas. Oh, oh, sorry, the actual erosion at the Grand Canyon. I'll, I'll just cite a, you know, the major rivers in the world, like the Nile and the Amazon, they have very large deltas. And Russ pointed out that uh, in the case of the Grand Canyon, I think there were about 900. I read somewhere that it was a thousand cubic miles of erosion, but there's there's only a, a very small delta. I think it's about one percent of that sediment is contained in the delta. That's another proof that that erosion happened quickly, and you'll probably find a lot of that material is sitting in in the ba in the ocean basin somewhere. Uh, now. Uh, with the um, Grand Canyon, uh, I'm going to add to, to to Russ's arguments here. You'll you'll notice the bottom layer there is the Tapete Sandstone just above the uh, Great Nonconformity, as it's known. Now, um, Dr. Snelling and AIG have done some uh, research on this specifically. Uh, before actually, before I go into that. Russ mentioned about the wind deposited um, layers of uh, the Coconino. That's a recumbent fall there. I keep using this recumbent falls can't form in a wind situation. Sorry, that's that's got to be um, a water event, a watery event with uh, lateral movement. Okay, er erosion. Erosion. Um, Russ also mentioned the sharp edges of the of the um, sides of the canyon. Here's something that I found uh, with regards to lightning. And lightning, if most people aren't aware, is, is a, a huge contributor to erosion and weathering. As you can see there in the um, Grand Canyon, you have 15,000 strikes per, per annum, I think, and they're mostly prevalent along the rim of the canyon. So as Russ mentioned, where's all that loose matter that should be at the base of that canyon if the canyon's 40 to 70 million years old, it doesn't work. So going going back to the Tapete Sandstone and uh, Dr. Snelling from AIG, what they wanted to do was they wanted to collect some samples of rocks, specifically in this region where you see these 90 degree bends in the in the sandstone to see whether there's evidence for um, you know metamorphosis because their their ex their explanation is that occurred deep underground at high pressures and high heat uh, and that's and then it uplifted over time so what um, dr snelling had done was approach the um, grand canyon national committee or something like that though i think they call themselves that to get a permit to do the uh to these to, to these investigations 
And to his surprise, though, though his requests for a permit were knocked back. Uh, I'll cut a long story short. They actually took took the um, committee to court and they finally got their um, their permit. They took their samples and guess what, guys? There is absolutely no evidence of meta of a metamorphic process, like Russ was saying. Uh, heat heat will produce a metamorphic process and will leave some kind of evidence. Sorry, no evidence of that in the case of these these bends in the Tapeed sandstone. Okay, uh, the, if you want to read about it, you can you can find it in the Answers Research General, Journal. Uh, effectively, they say none of the evidence supports the evolutionary idea that the folding occurred 450 million years after the sandstone was cemented. Instead, it is overwhelmingly consistent with the sand layers being deposited rapidly at the beginning of the global flood cataclysm year. The bending of the steel wet soft layers occurred only months later at the end of the flood year when the plateau was uplifted. The sand layers cemented to, sand, to, to sandstone as they dried out at the end of, of and after the flood. Furthermore, no evidence points to any metamorphic changes in the sandstone or its mineral grains, either in the folds or in the sample miles away from the folds. So there's pretty a good uh, refuting evidence there on the um, secular explanation of those folds, guys. And mm -hmm. and uh, just if if you're not aware, uh, John, John Mackay is, is a personal friend of mine. He has a uh, creation conversations every Friday for the Northern Hemisphere guys and uh, early Saturday morning for us Aussie guys. But what he presented uh, in his last... Um, uh, conversation um, to our conversation was some um, flume experiments that he's done uh, over time, and what what he, what he's actually saying here is um, many many of the flume experiments that we see today are done at a constant velocity. Okay, so what John did was he actually varied the velocity. He changed the velocity of of uh, the flows in the flume, and this is this is what. He actually produced these. These are the photo. These are actual photos taken from the side of the flume. That's a perspex um, uh, boundary there, by the way. So you can actually see the layering. And what what he's found, and no surprise to us, is the la the layering that occurs is actually in the direction of 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 the of the flow, or or um, in in a horizontal direction to the flow, and. Um, these are some of the things that he that he found by changing the velocity. You, you're going to start to see these these bent layers at the base as I keep going through these other. And look at look at that. Do you, do you do you see those specific bends in layers purely so it by like changing the, that sandstones? Yeah, purely by changing the velocity of the uh, of the water. And and get a load of this now. Compare that. Now the secular scientists will will or geologists will call that anticlines and synclines, and he, John says these are not due to subsidence of uplift. As you can see there, they can be created in a flume experiment very easily by varying the velocity of the water. And here it is. Here's another picture of it, um, clearly clearly showing those bends, the anticlines and the syn and the synclines, and and have a look at this. That's a close-up, and this last photo, the bottom, the bottom is a geological cross-sectional map of some of these anticlines and synclines. Compare that to the experiment in the flumes mm -hmm. that John had undertaken. Amazingly, mm -hmm. <laughs> amazing evidence that it doesn't take millions of years and deep um, a burial uh, with heat to and lateral compression to create them. Sorry, guys, but that's that's me. And he and he says it only took twenty minutes, not millions of years. His his very short summary is: it's not time that does this, but the process. Mm -hmm. And and looking at his experiments, he's you know this is empirical evidence. He has proven that those folds in the layers can be created through changes 
in the velocity of the water. And as we keep saying, the flood was a catastrophic event. There would have been movement of water backwards and forwards at different different rates, and they would have created that uh, scenario of different velocities and been a perfect, perfectly good explanation for all those different bent layers. So, so if you want to see further further um, evidence of uh, what he's done, you can watch the the actual flume flume experiments yourself. They're only short videos. You can visit uh, the creationresearch.net site and just uh, go to rock layers, and you'll find plenty of material um, that's literature as well as videos that you can watch to to show you that 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 process of lay layering and and bending of layers can be achieved through changes in water velocity and not necessarily uh, heat and pressure as secular scientists um, will have you believe. Mm. So I'll, I'd, I'd like to just say I hope, I hope I've added to your arguments, Russ, and, and that's pretty good evidence to support uh, a global event. Hey, George, that, that was excellent. In fact, what you were showing this man did was operational science. Correct, yeah. Which you can test, study, and observe these things forming quickly. Nobody has ever seen any of those things form slowly. That that was that was excellent, absolutely excellent work he's done. Thanks for thanks for bringing that up. I thought people would like it. Yeah. Well, you guys make a fantastic team. Uh, there is an extensive amount of information in this uh, one single show, so I appreciate it. I love that. Not a, not not time but a process process um and and there's so many things i could say and add to but you know what we're just going to get into a few of these questions and uh, i want to respect your time as well uh, russ miller so we'll get through a couple of these and uh maybe in the future as well if if we uh have you back on we can we can get to more of them so um george there's a ton of questions here in in the side chat did you want to do the honors of picking out the first one um for Russ to engage here what do you think oh there's there's so many I was um especially from God and and gun Klinger uh, I think we'll just pick a few of those because they're just uh some of those are fairly fairly basic and we've covered them so many times um it, it'd be silly to go through them again uh one of the ones he says um Question for us: Does he see all these terminal dry lake beds as flood evidence? Uh, well, not necessarily as global floods. Some of those things could be leftovers from uh, the uh, ice age that was a direct result of the global flood, and as it, those layers melted back, and you had the runoff from the glacier melt. So there's there's different. Uh, uh, things that could leave a lot of these things behind that they're not proof. I don't see them anyway as proof of millions and billions of years of time. And that's the key. I appreciate that, Russ. I'll get one of these uh, questions in here, uh, George. This is a criticism or objection that comes up frequently these days, Russ. I'm curious as to your thoughts. The question is those that reject a global flood have made the argument or claim that the existence of limestone refutes a worldwide flood. Their argument is essentially that limestone cannot accumulate during a flood. Is there any validity to this argument? And what are your overall thoughts on that, Russ? Well, I think, number one, that's an excellent question. And I think it's a question that, that needs to have some light shed on it again. Nobody observed the formation of the uh, the limestone. Um, I will I will say this on our river raft trip on our rim and raft trip we go through the um, from Glen Canyon Dam down to Lee's Ferry it's about 17 miles we go around Horseshoe Bend uh, that rim and raft trip is there to show people that we can trust God's word word for word and cover to cover and as we get past Horseshoe Bend past the halfway point I have them tie the rafts up and as we're floating down this two mile canyon with these towering rock walls on both sides. It's the Navajo sandstone. And of course, the secular interpretation of sandstone is of course it formed over millions of years in dry desert conditions. Well, like all the other uh, issues that I talked about in the Coconino sandstone, they have the same problems with cross-bedded sandstones, angles of inclination, rounded 
uh, as a, or, or angular as opposed to rounded sand uh, grains, uh, amphibian tracks, etc. But God left right, <laughs> right above, about 100 feet above the river, there's about a seven foot thick layer of limestone <laughs> that goes right through this, this, um, this sandstone. So this limestone, which is a marine deposit, is right through the middle of what they're claiming was a dry desert deposit. And it just destroys their, their interpretation. So, but limestone as a whole, how in the world did we come up with all the, with all the limestone formations? And I think it's a great question. It's one of the questions that I think uh, both the secular and the, and the uh, biblical geologists still um, are trying to figure out. I have my own uh, thought on this that I think that the uh, biblical based scientists should take into account and look into. I think that first of all, there is a lot of, of uh, limestone and I've seen it thrown out that there were massive blooms and plumes of limestone formed because of the hot uh, fountains of the deep during the global flood. And I think that that is viable, that there probably was, but I don't think that there was enough, there could have been enough to uh, explain all the limestone formations and layers around the globe, just like the 500 thick foot thick um, red wall limestone uh, found uh, about halfway down the walls of Grand Canyon. I believe that the limestone, a lot of the limestone formed in the pre-flood world, we had almost 1,650 to 1,700 years, according to the Bible's time frame, from creation before the flood. After Adam's fall and death had entered, you had uh, a lot of these warm, shallow oceans and seas with massive lime formation in and, and lime formations in those seas. So when the fountains of the deep erupted, you already had a lot of that future limestone layer already uh, in place. The, the limestone was torn up and, and once again with all the other sediments that were being eroded during the first 150 days of the flood, they were rolling along in the waters being separated by grain size, weight and density, which is why you got all the limestone together to form the red wall limestone, the Torweep limestone or the Kaibab limestone at Grand Canyon. I think most of that material existed in the pre-flood world and were torn up and then uh, separated by grain size, weight and density where they were then laid down in the uh, layers we see toward the latter part of the flood. I think that also somewhat explains why we have all the rock layers. Why did the why did those sedimentary layers all turn into rock, like the sandstone that they formed in dry desert? Why did they form rock? Well, the way we form um, concrete is you put lime into the mix, and when you put water into it and lay it out, it turns to concrete, basically to rock. And I think that bit of lime mixed through all of the different sediments also explain why those layers turned to rock fairly quickly uh, following their deposition during the global flood. But that's my thought on the limestone, as a lot of it was in play prior to the fountains of the deep erupting. So I hope that helps uh, shed some thoughts on the limestone. Can I can I add something to that? Uh, Go this ahead. is this goes back to operational uh, science for us. Um, some Swedish scientists were looking at uh, solving this uh, carbon dioxide issue of the atmosphere to you know, regarding the climate, climate change business. And what they did was they drilled a hole deep into the ground. Uh, I can't remember the depth, but it was considerable depth and pumped the CO2 down into that depth. What they found, to their surprise after a year, a lot of that CO2 turned into limestone. And I'm going to propose, like uh, many other um, geologists, um, that limestone can also be a chemical process. Mm. We, 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 we see it forming during volcanic eruptions and uh, there would have been a lot of volcanic activity during the uh, global uh, flood event. And uh, the, other, the other piece of evidence too is, according to secular science, their, their deposition rates of limestone is about one to two centimetres per thousand years. Now, we find lots of fossils in these limestones that are so thick that it would take thousands upon thousands of years for them to fossilize. That's that's impossible under their scenario, but it's very easily explained under the flood scenario. That's I'm, all I have to add to that. 
Oh, I thought that that's that's some more excellent uh, input, George. I appreciate that. I think all of these issues together explain the limestone without it being a problem. The secular yeah. world seems to think it's a huge problem. I don't think it's, it is a problem. And with what you've just added, it to me becomes even less of an issue. And, and and the and the other uh, the other point too, Russ. I mean, you know about the uh, uh, White Cliffs of Dover in England. I mean, they're eroding. They're eroding. I think from memory about six feet per year or something. I mean, if we're talking about millions of years, we shouldn't be seeing any England at all. It should have all eroded away. So that's the other thing. The erosion issue of the limestone is another uh, sort of like a whack whack over the head for uh, secular geology. Well, gentlemen, well, like I said, you guys make a fantastic team. So I like that because one of their main objections, there is a, an answer, uh, multiple answers ready uh, to go. I appreciate how thorough that was. Uh, Russ, you are an encyclopedia worth of information. Uh, you and George both. So I appreciate it, uh, brothers. So this one comes in from Douglas Boffy. I appreciate it. I put this one up on uh, screen, Russ, uh, in case you wanted to have a look at it with us. But he asks, uh, when I was talking with an evolutionist and held the little Grand Canyon up as an example of the Grand, of, of how the Grand Canyon was created, he replied that the little Grand Canyon um, was straight whereas the Grand Canyon was not. What does Russ have to say about I, I guess yeah. any thoughts well, I guess on that he's, overall? He's, yeah, he's talking I'm, I'm assuming he's talking about the little Grand Canyon up at Mount St. Helens which formed in a matter of uh, hours. Um, in fact, Mount St. Helens showed us a lot of fantastic things. God gave us an actual laboratory where rather than historical science, we could actually see canyons and stratified layers and polystrata fossils and coal layers and things formed very, very quickly, including the Little Colorado River Canyon, which formed as a result of a, a breached dam a couple of years after the volcano had erupted. And it carved out this uh, canyon in a matter of uh, hours, like minutes almost, and it, actually, there, there are some issues with that in comparison to the Grand Canyon, but um, and that being mainly a lot of it was cut through the, uh, the layers that had been laid down very quickly as a result of the uh, volcanic event. Uh, Mount St. Helens showed us three different events that, that form finely stratified layers, each in a matter of minutes, not over never seen millions of years of time. As far as Grand Canyon, uh, on, on the raft trip that we do now with our rim and raft trips, I don't lead trips through the entire canyon anymore. Uh, they turn into kind of raft trips, and I'm really more of a creation evangelist, if you will. So our, we just do that 17-mile trip that goes around Horseshoe Bend. Well, the secularists or the atheists always bring up, well, how could you have had this massive water flow that makes this huge turn around Horseshoe Bend? And I think that that's another fair question, but water always follows the path of least resistance. And if you go around Horseshoe Bend, you'll notice a series of about eight different faults that I believe cut and cut and turn that water where it was eroding. Once it first cut down into the, the layers, breaking out the loose rock from where those faults are, they started to bend around and cut straight down into those layers. And that's the reason that you have uh, some meanders or some turns in, in uh, the main chasms of Grand Canyon. The water is falling fault lines and breakages. Uh, most of the side canyons are um, actually called barb canyons and, and the flow of erosion that would have cut them are the opposite direction. So if the river is going this direction, I don't know if you can see this on the screen here. The bar canyons are coming back the other direction. And I think when the first the canyon first formed, the water went over the upwarp, and as the chasm formed in the center, the waters then started coming back and dropping into the chasm and going on through the canyon. So I think that the meandering loops were probably having to do with some faults and other reasons that the water took the path of least resistance and the barb canyons going the wrong directions on the sides were backflow as the water dumped into the forming canyon. And as they brought rock and debris and then joined 
with the waters flowing down the canyon, they even help carve the canyon even, even quicker and faster and deeper. That's another great uh, answer, uh, Ross. I appreciate it. Uh, George, I apologize. You're going to say something. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I can agree with that. As an engineer, uh, we, we, we've done lots of um, experiments on channelization and uh, you, fi you find uh, based on the, on the material that water will find the path of least resistance. And we, we've done that for numerous ma different materials and we fi find the same thing happening over and over again. You know, you know, George, as an engineer, you know this, but water possesses much more power than, than we oh. realize. Over eight pounds per gallon. And you're talking millions of gallons pouring through. But oh, they definitely. Can, we use water in industry now to cut hardened steel. A stream of water under 50,000 PSI. And the key is to have a little bit of grit in that water and it'll cut right through hardened steel. So this water... Uh, literally hundreds of millions of pounds of water rushing through the canyon, carrying grains of sand up to the size of 200,000 pound boulders at 100 plus miles an hour uh, would have done a lot of damage and ripped through and cut Grand Canyon quickly, including following the fault lines with a few turns in the canyon. It, and, and, there, and there's evidence of that, uh, Russ. I think you probably know about the Orville Dam failure mm -hmm. where where huge amounts of water literally uh, spewed out of the dam, um, eroding concrete as well as the base beneath the concrete, which was basaltic rock, cutting it like um, a hot knife through butter. So there's lots mm -hmm. of observable evidence where water uh, can actually cut even through rock. It's, it's unbelievable that people can deny stuff like that. It's, it's observable evidence. What else can I say? You know, the Bible warns us to beware of science falsely so-called, knowledge false knowledge. And a lot of historical science, and it's not necessarily someone meant to be evil, but when you take today's rate and make determinations of something that happened a thousand years in the past, you can be way off on your answers because the present is not the key to the past. The global flood is to, is the key to the, to the past geological activity we see on the surface of the earth today what what i what i love uh, russ is uh you know so, so many creationists now are doing the operational science to actually prove a lot of these uh facts about the the flood like john mckay and um dr snelling you know with that with that example of the tapete sandstone bent layers uh so so it, it sort of like put, puts a dent in their explanations they can't sort of um, repeat a lot of those rescue devices they've been using for for decades now. I mean, because we've disproven them. And 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 sorry, I forgot to mention, Russ, with the limestone issue. Uh, secular geologists have actually done experiments themselves, and they have found that flocculation can occur in turbulent situations. That was one of their objections. That that. Uh, at, you know, with with the flood and the volume of water and the speed, etc., and the turbulence created, that that limestone could never form because of the turbulence. Well, it's been proven flock, flocculate it can flocculate in in turbulent uh, situations. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think I've seen some studies. It's been a few years. I think they were from Indiana State, and um. There was another, I, I can't remember where they're from now, that showed that uh, these formations can form in, in calm oceans, but also in fast moving water. Yeah. And that, that also went against a lot of the assumptions, the erroneous assumptions made by secular geology. Uh, more and more science, as real science comes to the head, uh, we see that real science is a believer's true friend, always has been and always will be. Yeah. Amen. Exactly. Amen. I, I always say it's 2022 and it's a great time to be a young earth creationist. Just as the Bible says in, in 2 Peter 3, they're willingly ignorant of the creation, the flood, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, and the coming judgment. So I appreciate that uh, yeah. response. Gentlemen, uh, this question here comes in from God and Gunclinger. And he asks, uh, Russ, I've got it up on screen here. He asks, at Standing for Truth, was the ocean level low enough? after the flood for animals to walk from the ark to Australia. Um, Russ, what are your thoughts on that? 
Well, my first thought, I think that's how George got there, if I recall. <laughs> you'd, have to, you'd have to throw that one over to George uh, for the answer that one, but no. Um, uh, yeah. Ru- Ru- Russ, I'm a, I'm a scuba diver. I actually swam under the water. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Well, that ex- I don't know if that would qualify as macro evolution or not, but we won't go there. Uh, yes, actually, I've seen uh, secular textbooks that teach that the ocean waters used to be 400 feet lower than they are today. And then the secular books claim ice masses melted, filled in the oceans to where they are today. So my first thought is don't destroy Western civilization because the ice caps are melting. That's been going on since the end of the global flood, which the ice caps were a direct result of. But regarding the uh, uh, the water and animals uh, spreading out after the flood, when uh, Noah and his family got off of the ark, the ocean waters again were about 400 feet lower than they are today. You could you could get land masses, ice bridges, and continental shelves exposed, so animal animals could move around the globe. It didn't take a great deal of time for animals to spread out around the world. Um, this also has to do with why we have different looking people groups. So if it's okay, I'll, I'll explain that in in the same context. So that, does that work, Donnie? Absolutely. Yep. A lot of, you know, it's an issue today, and, and I oftentimes get asked by uh, well-meaning people, but also uh, Darwinists as well, well, how do you creationists, how do you Bible believers explain why we have different races today? And my answer is this. We don't have different races. We have one race, the human race. That's the only race described in, in the Bible. But we do have different looking people groups. We're not different races. We're all still humans, all made in the image of God. Well, after the flood, people gathered at Babel and God had told them to spread out and they refused to do so. So God came down during the days of Peleg um, and confused languages at the Tower of Babel. The Bible says that the earth was divided in the days of Peleg. His name translates furrowed or divided. Well, the animals had already spread out. The continents had already broken up, uh, continental drift, if you will, during the global flood. Well, people then also could spread out around the globe because, again, the ocean waters were 400 feet lower. Now, people spread out around the globe. And slowly after the flood had ended, and we're talking 500 to 800 years now after the flood, the oceans slowly were cooling and cooling. It's estimated the flood waters might have been as much as 120 degrees Fahrenheit because the erupting fountains were super hot waters. So the oceans were slowly cooling and the ice age came to an end. People had spread out. Now, the ice caps in the lower latitudes melted back quickly, filling in the oceans and people were separated now by languages, nations, islands, and continents. People had to marry within the gene pools captured on a a particular continent, piece of land, island, etc. Slight adaptational changes caused by the sorting or the loss of the starting gene pools coming off of the ark There were four couples on the ark, Noah's three sons and their families. Slight adaptational changes in each of the uh, gene pools led to the different looking people groups we have today. The biggest difference is the color of our skin, how much melanin we have in our skin cells. Myself, I'm melanin challenged. I have some friends that are melanin rich and everybody in between. But that's the biggest difference in people groups. We didn't evolve to different levels like Darwinists teach, a very dangerous teaching. We are all made in the image of God. And that's the reason we can we can still do blood transfusions and kidney transplants from people all around the globe, because we didn't evolve to different levels. We were all made in the image of God. But now as the ice caps melted, the oceans were filled in and we can't uh, walk all over the globe today. Yeah, uh, Russ, uh, one, another important fact, um, Dr. Jensen and AIG have done a lot of study into the uh, Y chromosome haplogroups, and uh, they pretty much confirm uh, the biblical history as well as written history with regards to the migration of um, a lot of these people through through various parts of the world. So that's another uh, I guess, uh, operational science that sort of confirms what the Bible uh, is, is actually saying about uh, the way, the, way uh, the nations were divided and ended up where they are. 
You know, absolutely. In fact, National Geographic, which is no friend to the biblical accounts, they did a study on the human genome and came to the conclusion all humans come from one of four distinct gene pools. There were four gene pools on the ark. Noah, his three sons, and their wives. And we also have the Y chromosome atom, where studies have shown that all men from around the world have descended from one man known as the Y chromosome atom, and that we've all descended from one woman known as the African Eve or the mitochondrial Eve. And in fact, Science News did a, did a posting on this and said that uh, D- studies on DNA mutation rates indicate Eve may have lived just 6,000 years ago. So it, real science doesn't go against the Bible. When, when science appears to go against the Bible, it's generally historical science, which is really somebody's inter- biased interpretation. Biased interpretations may go against what the Bible says, but operational science is a believer's true friend. And like I said, always has been, always will be. Yeah, well, one of the interesting, I was, I was reading an article just recently about a bone that was found in the Middle East that placed, it was a hominid bone, by the way, it placed at 120,000 years before the uh, so-called African um, exodus. And now what they're proposing is, their, their rescue advice now is, well, the African exodus must have occurred a lot earlier than we thought. Hmm. That's how they solved that issue about, because we always say that the Middle East was the centre of civilization, and, and it actually exploded out in outwards from there rather than the secular explanation which says mm-hmm. africa everything occurred in africa and then mm-hmm. they migrated north yeah. well one thing i could certainly add to that too and again uh russ another very thorough answer i, I love that i appreciate it i believe the migration patterns as well after babel that you're talking about i believe that they could explain a lot of the so-called transitional forms or examples of ape to man evolution, the evolutionists point to, such as Neanderthals, Arachnids, Nelidae, uh, the hobbits that they'll oftentimes point to. Because as you have these subpopulations migrating, they become isolated. What results is inbreeding. And then those recessive mutations that are not yet manifested, they're in hidden form, they're revealed. And that leads to rapid genetic degeneration. And after just a few generations, you can have these anomalous features pop up, mm-hmm. become fixed, and then the evolutionists pick up those bones and they say, look, transitional or primitive, when mm-hmm. in fact, a lot of it is due to degeneration from isolation and inbreeding. Hmm. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good point. And one of my messages is the top 10 uh, Darwinian frauds in the textbooks. And I, I cover a lot of the hominids. And you know, basically all the hominids, and you've just really uh, just uh, more or less uh, discussed this, but all of their supposed hominids, the supposed closest link between ape and man, have turned out to be either 100% ape, 100% human, or 100% frauds, or you could say mistakes. Right. When you, when you make a mistake, we all make a mistake. When you find this mistake, you move on. But when you continue to teach it, now that becomes a fraud. And the history books are full of fraudulent hominids from uh, Piltdown Man to Nebraska Man to, you know, on and on it goes. And uh, I think we need to, there comes a point in time when you just realize you can't believe what what you're being told when it goes against God's word. You need to be able to stand on your own and say, you know, this goes against God's word. I, your history shows you're always, you're always wrong on these things. I think I'm going to look for reasons to believe the word of God. And there are a lot of good uh, creation scientists and, and speakers that uh, can can get information to you. I would suggest put your trust in, in the word of God and contact uh, and get some help from some people who have studied it. And they can answer those questions for you. There are just so many misleading frauds in the textbooks. And what the bottom line with biology is there are two there are two real bottom lines. One, they can't get life started. The origin of life is a is a tremendous stumbling block for Darwinists to the point they will claim, of course, evolution has nothing to do with so with the start of life. So you know, basically they're saying the origin of species has nothing to do with the well origin of the species. And the other bit the even bigger problem they have is that um Changes, adaptations, um, Donnie, as you were discussing, 
are caused by the sorting or the loss of their already existing gene pool, right. not by the gain of the new and beneficial uh, gene pool. It's how I, I show people how to scientifically destroy Darwinism in, in four seconds flat, and that is that gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism impossible. The changes are caused adaptations. You may call those microevolution, microadaptations, microtransitions, all the same thing. These microadaptations are caused by the sorting or loss of information. Gene pools get weaker and weaker and weaker. If and natural selection, which there's no selector standing there, we just we named it natural selection. I call it actually God's quality assurance program. <laughs> You know, gene pools are losing information, and if they went unchecked, everything would go extinct in about 1,500 years. But things lose too much information, gene depletion, natural selection removes them. God's quality assurance program removes them so they don't corrupt the gene pools. So gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism a scientific impossibility, which is why they can't find any viable examples of Darwinian or, Darwinian or macro evolution. They show lots of examples of biblically correct micro evolution, micro adaptations. And keep in mind, we're told 10 times in Genesis that plants or animals will bring forth after their kind. That's all that real science finds is that kinds will only bring forth after their kind with micro changes within the kind caused by the sorting or loss of the starting genetic information. Amen. Uh, Amen. Russ, Very well said, Russ. Um, I find it funny. One thing I'll say, George, and then and then yeah. I'll let you go uh, real quick. And we'll start winding it down as well. I just looked at the time and wow, Russ, thank you so much for <laughs> giving us your time tonight. Time flies by. We are already uh, over the two hour mark. Uh, but I just find it funny because evolutionists, as you're pointing out, they'll look to natural selection, mutations, natural selection doesn't make anything new. It's a fine tuning process, as you um, pointed out, keeps the species as strong as they can be. Mutations that they'll point to as the source for novel variation, genetic variation that selection can apparently act upon for uh, you know the additions of, of true novelties in terms of evolution are damaging. They cause disease, they accumulate. It's a downhill process rather than an uphill process, which uh, fish to fisherman evolution would would require. So those are some great points. Uh, you know, a loss of genetic uh, variation and information is not going to uh, explain novel body plans, so on and so forth. So I appreciate that, Russ and George. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I, I was just going to add a, a little bit more to what uh, Russ had said about um, all the frauds and whatever. Um, they're very protective of um, contradictory evidence, if I can call it that. Uh, they won't tell the students about uh, the biogenesis problem, but they will talk to the nth degree about um, the Miller-Urey experiment as if that solves the biogenesis issue. But uh, it was, there was an interesting example, Russ, where I was at my daughter's birthday and obviously her friends are involved in um, scientific research themselves. So I, I posed the questions to them and I said, hey, how do you explain uh, soft tissue bones in 70 million year old um, dinosaur fossils? They go, that's impossible. I said, you, you've never read the scientific research? She goes, no, I don't believe there is any. So even though these people have gone to university for probably four to five years, they were, they were never told about this fact that they actually are finding soft tissues uh, in all sorts of fossils now, not just, uh, you know, dinosaur bones, but a lot of other things. And, um, yeah. Uh, something that just came to my mind about C14, Russ, I forgot to mention it. Dr. Brian Thomas, and I forget the other scientist's name at ICR, looked at bones with purely, purely uh, trying to explain this contamination issue. And what they did was they measured the, the amount of C14 inside the bone and compared the C14 to the outside of the bone. And what they found was there was more C14 inside the bone than outside the bone. So if it was contamination, you'd expect it to be the other way around. Mm -hmm. But the other important fact that they found was the ratio of C14 outside to inside 
was almost identical in all samples. They even went as far as to say, if you took a sample of your own bone and did that particular experiment, you would find the same ratio in your bone to those fossils. Hmm. So I found that I found that that very very revealing. Hmm. So I, I can't see I can't see how they can keep going on this C14 contamination business. Well, the same way they go on about the dinosaur, they just don't tell anybody about that. We see a lot of that, <laughs> not getting another subject in the news today, but if there's something that the, the groups that control the information don't want people to, to know about, they just don't tell them. And, and yeah. you know, the, the dinosaur information should be front page news, but dinosaurs are one of the five pillars of old earth beliefs, which are the foundation for Darwinism, naturalism, humanism, et cetera, if they lose those pillars, they lose everything. So yeah. they just have to keep the information from people. It's up to folks like you and I, uh, we need to get the information out there. And I really appreciate uh, your guys' program and what you do to reach people with this information. Well, I Thanks. appreciate Tony, that. Tony, can, I, can I ask the last question? Because we're up to two hours and 12 minutes now. Yeah, the, I was just the, gonna. The, I was just gonna wrap it up there. But Georgia, if you had like a really quick final question, yeah, the, the, this co this comes from a recent debate uh, that Jackson had with, um, I think it was Professor McQueen on the Cambrian explosion. His his question was effectively, uh, how come we don't find animals such as sharks and marine mammals in the Cambrian layers? Specifically, he was talking about sharks' teeth, hmm. because his argument was shark shark uh, uh, shed so many teeth in their lifetime and there would have been some kind of remnant uh, fossil of a shark tooth in the Cambrian. And uh, my, my explanation to that was uh, the absence of evidence is an evidence. I mean, there's so many examples of that kind of argument. That's a logical fallacy, but I, I'd like to hear what you might have to say about it. Well, I was thinking pretty much what you said about it, the lack of evidence is not evidence that something was or wasn't there. The, the, the layers, the lower layers were most likely formed. Uh, the first things to have been buried would have been the, the low, the shallow seas and such. And I think that's where you, you wouldn't have found sharks necessarily um, in those lowest uh, layers. Some of the, the lower swamp areas is what I'm talking about. So um, I think that the layers starting out in where you find the Cambrian explosion, et cetera, are probably some of those low, shallow uh, inlets and such, and probably freshwater uh, creatures. And lack of uh, shark's teeth there is no more of a problem from a from a flood standpoint than it is finding you know shark's teeth at uh, twelve thousand feet above sea level today, which we do find in. Uh, tall mountain ranges and such. So lack of evidence is a logical fallacy. And it's just, um, I don't really see a point in really the question, to be honest with you. Yeah. Es especially because according to their own logic, Ross, we have tons of examples of so-called living fossils or an example like the coelacanth, where it was, from my understanding, even used as an index fossil, apparently mm -hmm. went extinct. And according to their own geologic time frame and model, we have millions of years with no evidence of the existence of the coelacanth. And all of a sudden we find them swimming around today on the earth in present time. So apparently, according to that logic, the coelacanths didn't exist for millions of years. And yet, obviously, they did. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, no, I, th I think that's a great explanation, uh, gentlemen, to that uh, question. And again, thank you so much, uh, Russ. This has been awesome. This has been fantastic. Uh, lots of compliments, lots of great feedback. Everybody in the chat, please share this around as uh, the truth is important. And we want to get this information out to as many people as possible. Uh, Russ, you've given us over two hours of your time. Uh, time has flown by. I want to hand it over to you for some final words, some final thoughts before we close it down for the day. Well, thank you, Donnie. And thank you, George. I enjoyed chatting with both of you and enjoyed your input. Um, <clears throat> you know, my, my message would, would simply be that real science is a believer's best friend. It's a true friend of, of, of Christianity. Historical science is another issue. So when we 
when we look at the world around us, realize we all have the same evidence. The evidence has to be interpreted because someone sells you or provides you with only a negative interpretation that goes against the Bible. Remember, it's their worldview that goes against scripture that they're coming from. You can, there are lots of good sources to find uh, interpretations that fit the, the word of God. And most of these interpretations fit much, much better than do the secular misinterpretations of the evidence. So real science is on our side. We can trust God's word, word for word and cover to cover, as I like to say, put your trust in the word of God and uh, we're gonna enjoy eternity together with him in, in an awesome place. Thank you very much. And and Russ, Russ, to, pro to prove your point, I put operational science uh, into effect myself I was told to use alcohol to clean the bathroom. It really works, apparently. The more I drink, the cleaner it looks. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, maybe uh, as your wife was telling you, you know, look at that a little closer. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, uh, George. <laughs> uh, you've been fantastic, Russ. Oh, I've, I've, got a clo I've got a closing message too, Donnie, my usual message. So... Uh, I'd like I'd like to say uh, this pretty much. Um, I think I've said it on, on almost all our streams. Uh, may the Spirit of God open your eyes to the light, your ears to the truth, and your heart to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. encourage you take a visit to Durham sometime read the town signboard on the website and you'll find they are very proud of one thing their bishop in the 1200s he, he had a problem to solve theologians p-h-e-o-l meaning god logons uh, as in logic or logos the people who had a word about god theo logos a god word well he, he knew all about theology but you see, he lived in an area where we dug up rocks eventually, where we used the coal. We need a new word, he said, the study of the rocks. God has told us about the study of himself. Now, what do we call the study of rocks? So he invented the concept, and there it is, proudly boasted about on the town website. Go to their web, check it out yourself. He's the inventor of the concept of geology, and it was a Christian bishop. Now, you wouldn't think that if you read through your geological books on the millions of years of layers, etc. I mean, let me start. Here's my last sample for this morning. Can you see this? Can you see the layers in it? Now, you and I call those strata. This is supposed to be nearly a thousand million years old. And can you see the fossil in the top? Now, that's a fossil stromatolite. The funny thing is stromatolite simply means layered thing. And it's in a rock full of layer, but we use the, the Greek and Latin words, in, in, it means the same. Uh, we call the other one strata, strata, stroma, uh, layered things. And they use millions of years these days and no relationship to God at all. So in our subject, as we go through today, dealing with the history of things, as we look at me on how do layers form anyway, as we go to tomorrow and deal with the geologic column in depth, beginning, end, does it even have such a thing? Remember the rock I showed you first, the one with the stromatolite in it, right? Now, yeah. this is limestone. Now, the interesting thing about stromatolites is they're self-rocks. Uh, they form rocks anyway, and the stromatolites are still here, and they actually exude a limey glue. Um, when we've made stalactites and stalagmites, we've discovered that you get leaves that will stick on the stalactite and even bats and insects and flies, they'll land on and they'll get stuck because the organic lime plus bacteria actually makes a natural glue. So when you look at the layers in this one, the funny contradiction, of course, is the name of this means layered thing, but it's sitting in rock here, which is most likely simply made 
by the organism itself. So there's a question here. It's limestone, and it says, um, uh, could we get another answer to the still repeated limestone argument that people argue it does not form in flood deposits? Now, I've seen limestone form um, just in our strata machine. I've seen limestone form in our fossil tank deposit where we actually show you the trees standing upright and the calcium carbonate will fall out of solution. And you can see crystals of calcium carbonate forming on the spot. Uh, Vance Nelson, one of our colleagues in Canada, sent me the other day a, a, a metal cast, a, a pipe that comes from a hot water spring and it's full of calcite crystals. It takes a maximum of six weeks for this pipe to clog up. It does not take a vast amount of time for limestone. The, the flow is following, following very, it's a, a, a catastrophic deposit, and yet the crystals are actually forming. So, Joe, you have lots of interesting limestone on the east coast there, and you and I have climbed all up and down the Cretaceous, uh, you know, the White Cliffs of Dover, et cetera. I've seen them all along the, the boundaries of the Mediterranean, right across to Turkey. Uh, photos of all of them there. So you're more experienced with some rather interesting limestone on the east coast of England. Indeed. I spent most of my uh, I've spent most of my life sitting on top of a thousand feet of limestone. We have some of the some of the deepest chalk and limestone deposits uh, in the world. And we have a huge abundance of limestone and chalk here in the UK as well. So I'm very, very familiar with it. Um, we, uh, we've dealt with limestone many times before. Let me just give you a few uh, interesting points. Um, number one, you've got to make sure you have a distinction. A common uh, misnomer is that all limestone is made up of marine sea creatures. And the argument is you require a warm, shallow kind of marine environment, water environment, lagoon-like environment, where you get the planktonic blooms and the sea shells and the creatures which slowly settle down and over hundreds of thousands or millions of years you build it up into a calcareous ooze which over hundreds of thousands of millions more years it compresses into chalk right number one the vast majority of chalk and limestone deposits in the uk are very very pure uh, particularly the case of the white cliffs of dover right they're called that for a reason so you don't have any indication there of vast ages of slow accumulation because they're they're really pure they're up to 98 to 99 percent pure calcite right no grit no muck no ooze now you do get some gray chalk formations where there's certainly uh muck and ooze and stuff that's kind of got caught up in it is that an indication of slow, gradual deposition? In fact, a lot of limestones are grey uh, because of the contamination. Is that uh, evidence of slow, gradual formation? Well, at that point, you then need to turn to the, to the fossils, right? But the first thing to say is not all limestone is made up of marine fossils. You can get chemical limestone as well. In fact, calcium carbonate, you know, the formation, it's a chemical equation. So you get uh, quite a lot of limestone, which has got no fossils in it whatsoever, it's purely a chemical solution, and you have examples of that forming very, very quickly today. In fact, the one argument is that it has to form quickly if it's purely a chemical solution, uh, and it has to form um, under flight. All right, for the ones that are fossiliferous, you can look at the fossils. What do the fossils indicate? I mean, the very presence of macro fossils. I mean, the vast majority of the chalk and limestone is made up of coccolithophores or uh, foraminifera, which are tiny little sort of uh, microscopic plankton, right? But you do get very, very large fossils buried in this chalk and limestone as well. Now, the very presence of the um, large macro fossils in the chalk and limestone is evidence that it was buried very quickly. Because if you take hundreds of thousands or even millions of years, you'd never get a fossil, right? Time will destroy your creature long before it has time to turn into a fossil. Then you can look at the evidence of transportation. Transportation, have these creatures lived and died and settled in the one area and slowly been built up, or is there indication that they have been swept into position? So you can go and do research projects. I did a three-month research project for university. My first paper published was on the evidence of transportation and rapid burial in the fossils of Hans Stanton. Uh, we did other uh, reports and research projects on the Bellum Knights of Whitby. Right, Bellum Knights are a squid-like creature. They're elongated. First year of geology, I was taught elongated things like trees or bellum nights or shells, if they're pointing in the 
same way, you've got evidence of transportation. Water has flown through and swept these into position and has made them point in the right same direction. You can run this experiment yourself. It's well established in geology. You can see it in the log jams of Jurassic Arc and everything else in between. One thing that we consistently found, and it's not just in the limestone deposits of the UK, it's around the world as well as we've traveled, is that um, up to 97 percent of all fossils showed evidence of transportation. That means that they were buried in flowing water. So therefore, this calcareous ooze that they're buried in before it got sort of chemically altered into what we would now refer to as limestone, it was buried in a great big slurry flowing in one direction, sweeping the fossils along and burying it down as well. And by the way, yes, the dominant view in geology is that this is a slow, gradual process, but it's certainly not the only view. There are multiple uh, publications now starting to come out in the scientific literature, which talks about limestone being buried under flowing water. To give you one example, we've got a, a paper up in front of me from the Journal of Sedimentary Research, very prestigious paper published in 2013. Uh, the observation we report, they say, suggest that published interpretations of ancient lime muds and derived paleo-ocean geographic conditions will need to be re-evaluated, rethought. Why? Because observations from modern carbonate environments, that's limestone production, and from the rock record itself, that's looking at the rocks and the fossils, suggest that deposition of carbonate muds, that's your calcareous ooze, calcium carbonate is your limestone, by currents is likely common throughout geological history. Ah, that's not what you read when you go to your beach and you look at your signpost or you pick up your, you know, university textbook or high school textbook. But this is what's in the scientific literature. Similarly, conventional wisdom, by the way, conventional wisdom is Linnaean, uh, not Linnaean, sorry, uh, Lyell and his principle of uh, present is the key to the past, right? Uniformitarianism based off of Steno's superposition. Conventional wisdom about low energy requirements for shale and limestone deposition discouraged geologists from entertaining high energy alternatives for many years. It's therefore very possible that more carbonate muds will be interpreted as high energy deposits once the science behind the concept becomes established. In other words, calcium carbonate, limestone, chalk, whatever you want to call it, it has nothing to do with time. It has everything to do with the process. It can be a chemical process. It can be a water-based process mixed with a chemical process. But either way, no issue with fitting it into a large global flood with flowing waters and currents, particularly in light of the strata experiments that we've briefly talked about tonight. We go into the specifics and the flood geology tomorrow. So join us there. All right, looks like we are live. Everybody, welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie. And I am your co-host, Matt Moon. It is a privilege to have Dr. Dan Biddle from Genesis Apologetics back here with us for an important presentation and discussion on the Genesis flood. Now, we've had Dr. Biddle here with us last year for an important show focusing on human evolution. So if you have not yet seen that, please make sure to check the description box of this video to check it out. Now, Matt, I'm going to hand it over to you, uh, brother, for a brief introduction into our guest for today. Awesome. Yeah, we have with us Dr. Biddle. He is a behavioral scientist and HR consultant with a doctorate in industrial organizational psychology. If that's not a tongue twister, I don't know what is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's also president of Genesis Apologetics, who have an app, by the way, that I like to remind people of. Hopefully you can see it right here. And he is president of Genesis Apologetics. He basically spends his time equipping pastors, parents and students with biblical answers to evolutionary teachings. Daniel has trained thousands of students and biblical creationists with uh, to how to fight against the craziness of evolution theory and at different uh, issues that might arise. He's also author of several creation related publications. And if uh, I'm going to remind you guys, when you go to this uh, to download the app at the App Store, that you will be able to rate it as well. So help boost the algorithm and go check out that app because it's really good, really easy to use. And if you don't have answers, remember the answers do exist and you can find them on there. So Great. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, Dan, your ministry has been a huge help and a huge blessing to us. 
So thank you for all that you do. And thank you for uh, giving us your time again for this important show. Yes, you're welcome. It's, it's always a privilege to be on your show. And I love the work that you guys are doing. It's a great job. I appreciate that, uh, Dr. Biddle. Well, you know what? Let's let's kind of get right into it, and I'll hand you the floor, and we'll get right into your your presentation and talk for the day. Okay, terrific. You know, um, I, I was just thinking, I always like to start out with something a little bit new and different, and I have a good zinger for you guys here. So before we get into the flood talk, I want you to consider this, that I, I've spent about seven or eight years doing this type of work uh sometimes you know a lot of times sometimes uh, not so much time and we've we've fielded thousands of, of questions dealing with apologetics and we've heard great questions and great answers but just about three months ago i heard the single best strategy for uh addressing atheists that i think i've ever heard and i wanted to share with you guys in your audience so it, it goes like this. So if you're going to get into a dialogue with a self-proclaimed atheist or an agnostic or, or whatever, and they're going to they're going to want to jab you about questions about the fossil record or what about vertical evolution or what about homological structures or what about human and chimp DNA. And the most effective strategy I recently learned is simply ask them, I'm going to ask, turn the tables and ask them, I'm going to ask you one question. And if you can answer my question with evidence, with scientific evidence, then you can ask me questions about my faith and Christianity and the Bible and Genesis and creation. And of course, many atheists will bite on that and say, oh my gosh, I would love to, to just tackle your one question. And the one question is simply this, ask them, how did non-living matter become alive? Mm. And if they can answer that one question with the with a theory that has evidence to it, where it's been scientifically verified, then they can have permission to ask you about anything they want. Vertical evolution, homological structures, whatever it is. And if you're an honest scientist or an honest researcher, you'll find there is no answer to that question. They don't have one. And if so, my, my response to the atheist will, will be to then, then to say, well, if you can't get the car started, you can't drive it down the street. If you can't explain to me with evidence how non-living matter became alive through the Miller-Urey experiment or anything like it, or maybe some bacteria they supposedly found on Mars, if you can't replicate a model scientifically to show me how biogenesis got started, we can't even have a conversation because you're operating with just as much faith as I am. So anyhow, I thought that would be a good strategy to share with your with your viewers. And of course, it's not to really open the door necessarily to having a, a debate or a battle because a lot of times uh, atheists don't convert because it's a it's a heart problem and not a head problem. Um, but 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 anyhow, anyhow, I thought that was a real meaningful way to, to go about it. And then the other thing to consider is that when you're having such a conversation, say, look, if I were able to convince you, would you change your mind? And of course, many uh, honest atheists are going to say no because i'm stuck with my beliefs because it justifies and supports my lifestyle so anyhow i thought that was something that was very useful to share uh, pat roy came up with that and i thought that was a really useful technique he's been working on it with people that write in he's, he's actually able to turn from that and show how people are really having just as much faith in their worldview system as he is as, as a creationist so if you can get them there, it really opens the, the, the pathway for a more meaningful dialogue. Amen. All right. So, so uh, thanks for letting me share that little bonus there on the, on the front that. side of our talk it. here. And we're probably going to go over on time because we've got a lot of stuff to cover. But if anyone has questions, um, there is my email address, just dan at genesisapologetics.com. And are my slides advancing okay on your guys' side? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay, great. So just a little bit about our ministry first. We have a series of movies that, that we've uh, done. They're all free. They're all on the uh, on the internet. We've got uh, Genesis Impact, Debunk Evolution, Seven Myths, Foundations, and then our new one that's going to be coming out in the theaters in about a year and a half. It's called The Ark and the Darkness, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that later. Uh, we have a YouTube channel with, I think, about 114,000 subscribers now, about 10.7 million views. We do speak a lot at local Christian schools. Our, our vice president is actually going out to Texas to do some speaking, and then uh, and then the LA, Southern California area after that. We give a lot of uh, local church presentations on the weekend, and we have an annual conference, and you can see the replays for that conference on g1conference.com. 
Uh, our main offerings are, are these, and I'm, I'm not trying to sell anything. They're all free. If you have a fifth to 10th grader and they're taking a life science class or a biology class where they're getting the download of evolution teaching, which is uh, taught in public school along 10 different pillars that they teach, uh, you can go to debunkevolution.com and we have a free training program there that you can use. Or for high schoolers or college age folks, you can go to sevenmyths.com and you can get your student uh, bootstrapped with some good, good roots and, and uh, solid faith foundation before they go off to college. Uh, one of our, our most popular books is called The Answers Books, uh, Answers to the Top 50 Questions About Genesis Creation and Noah's Flood. Uh, we get thousands of questions every year from people through social media and our email. And uh, we developed a list of the top 50 questions we always get asked and develop some, uh, some strong answers for those. In fact, most of those questions also relate back to videos that can be accessed through the book or on our website. And I think, Matt, uh, you mentioned we have our mobile app. We have over 100,000 installs right now. It's a free mobile app. And this actually plums right into our YouTube videos. So whatever we have on YouTube is also going to be put into our mobile app there. And we cover all kinds of topics like human evolution and evolution theory and fossils and transitional forms. It's a free app. And a lot of people have, uh, have said that they, they enjoy this app going, while going through high school and college. And here's our movie that's coming out in theaters in uh, 2023. It's called The Ark and the Darkness, uh, Unearthing the Mysteries of Noah's Flood. Uh, we're working with Sevenfold Films and Ralph Streen, uh, the director of the Genesis Paradise Lost movie, uh, to come out with this one. And it's going to focus on the evidence uh, that, that shows that Noah's Flood really happened and that Earth is, was recently flooded by a worldwide catastrophe. And, uh, and that will be coming out uh, probably July 2023. And this presentation is actually kind of a sneak preview into a lot of the evidences that we're going to be covering in that movie. Uh, we've already done the filming part of the movie. We're over at Answers in Genesis Ark Encounter. Uh, the, their big full-size replica of Noah's Ark over there and interviewed four leading experts from Answers in Genesis. Uh, then we carried over to Liberty University in Virginia and continued with seven more PhD experts on archaeology and the flood, geology, things like that. So uh, we're really excited for that movie to come out. And we have a book that goes along with the movie that you can order through our website or on Amazon. This carries uh, the same name. So this uh, presentation is also going to cover a lot of the more in-depth evidence that is in our YouTube video called Noah's Flood and Catastrophic Plate Tectonics. That video is up to uh, about 2.7 million views now, which as far as we know, it's, it's the most watched uh, video uh, on, on YouTube about Noah's Flood. So we're really excited that that's getting some traction. It's only 23 minute, minutes long and it's got a lot of really great condensed evidence on Noah's Flood. And here's a, a question uh, that I like to pose to people. So the Bible makes the, the biggest claim about a worldwide cataclysm of any religious text in history. So if the Bible makes this claim, we would hope that it's true. And we would also hope that it's if it talks about making a claim of a worldwide calamity, worldwide catastrophe, that it sh we should have evidence for it all over the place. And that's why I think that m more ink has been spilled over the Genesis flood than any other event in the Bible. Genesis chapter six through nine describe the longest account for any single event in the entire entirety of scripture. So the, the credibility of the whole Bible really depends on the flood being true or not. I mean, you've got Moses talking about it and several of the books talk about it. You've got Peter and Paul talk about the flood in the New Testament. Jesus himself referenced the flood as a real historical event that was worldwide in nature. that took everybody out in Matthew 24. So I would say that the, the historicity and the credibility of this event happening really underpins the entirety of scripture. So when did the flood happen? Well, there's there's two different camps. Most people lean what's called the, on the, the Masoretic textual tradition, holding that the flood was about 2348 BC. Uh, there's another camp that holds to what's called the Septuagint tradition. We don't have too much time to get into these two different traditions now, but, but if you hold to the Septuagint, the furthest back that you could place the flood, at least biblically, would be about 3168. So there we have the, the bracketing range biblically of when we can put Noah's flood. 
It lasted for one year. Uh, many people think it was only for 40 days, but that was just the torrential rain part of the flood. The Bible is very clear that the water uh, actually rose up for 150 days until the flood zenith or peaked at about 150 days. The waters began to decrease for the next 150 days, and then earth dried out for about 70 days. So we have a, a one-year-long process, and we have a very, very sturdy arc to withstand that process. You see here the, the diagram talks about the length was at least 450 uh, feet long. Uh, some people, by the way, you you interpret a cubit, uh, which is the your elbow to the very tip of your middle finger, can be between about 18 and 22 inches. Could make the arc a little bit longer than that, uh, but the Bible says it was 300 cubits by 50 cubits by 30 cubits, which interestingly is about the same dimensional proportion that today's ocean barges have. So it's a very, very sturdy, sturdy vessel. Didn't have to sail anywhere. All it had to do was stay afloat for the 371 day process. And there's actually been studies that have looked at the seaworthiness of the ark by simulating uh, waves of certain heights and throwing things what's called like the Beaufort storm scale at an ARC model. And this, this Chriso study that was done in 1993 at the Korean Naval Center basically proved that the biblical dimensions that came straight from God to Noah on building the ARC represented the most stable, comfortable, balanced ARC of all the different models that they tried. They tried, tried 12 different models and the biblical one was the most stable and the most seaworthy. So great evidence that uh, God, of course, knew what he was doing. The next thing I want to cover is, is the fact that if you look into the fossil record, it's very, very clear from an evidence standpoint that there used to be a world that was different uh, with respect to flora and fauna than the world that we have today. And scripture bears that out very clearly by saying in 2 Peter 3, 6, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So we're in world version number two right now. So what did world version number one look like? Well, it looked much different. In world vision, version number one, we probably had higher or different oxygen levels. The barometric pressures might have been different. There's even secularists like uh, Peter Ward who have published this book called Out of Thin Air. They're now establishing based upon some samples that they're taking that there really might have been higher oxygen levels back before in the past. And that's the only way that these huge creatures could fly and get around uh, is in a world that's not like ours today. We have these huge sauropods and huge flying reptiles. We've got dragonflies in the fossil record that have a two and a half foot wingspan, would not fly very well today in, or in today's Earth's climate. We even have these huge giant fungi that can grow to 20 feet tall, gigantic mushrooms. Here's an artist's rendition of what those things might have looked like. Just a different tropical lush paradise. And you wonder, you know, where did all the coal and oil came from? Well, we drill down nowadays under hundreds of feet of sediment to get access to this world that was washed over with cycling tsunamis. So this world that then was is buried and now is forming the coal and oil layers that are hundreds of feet under current sediment. You also have things like this huge eight foot long centipede could not probably operate too well in today's earth environment, uh, but the fossil record bears these things out. There were these huge creatures that could not live uh, very well today. Of course, I think the best example is a sauropod dinosaur, which were really better suited for the past world, the world that then was, because if you look at their little tiny nostrils, which are about the size of a modern day horse, you'd have a really hard time getting enough oxygen into that creature for it to live today. Um, some sauropod dinosaurs called Patagotitans uh, are enormous, or Argentinosaurus, there's a number of them that have been discovered. Some of them push 130 feet long and weigh over 77 tons. Just how in the world in today's Earth environment with our pressures and our oxygen levels are you gonna get enough O2 in that animal to live? And the answer is you probably couldn't. It lived in a much different, lush, tropical, high oxygen environment. Same thing with these huge flying uh, reptiles like Quetzalcoatlus, which is the largest flying reptile ever found. 53 foot wings, wingspan weighed at least 600 pounds. 
In today's Earth environment, the flight physics just don't work on a creature like this. Um, some people have tried to estimate it and say, well, you know, just to get its little toes up off the ground, you have to hit its wings with at least 16 miles an hour of wind. So maybe it could spend its time, you know, crawling all the way up to a clip and jumping off and hang gliding and doing that for an hour or two at the side at a time and riding the thermals, but then it'd have to walk all the way back up and, and do it again. But maybe in the, the pre-flood world, it could just flap its wings and take off. And we know that these things thrive because they're in all three major layers of the Mesozoic. So, uh, so these creatures uh, did live before the flood. So next, I, I wanna look at a little bit of a technical issue uh, dealing with the Genesis lifespans. Uh, so it's gonna, it's gonna get into some, st uh, to some statistics and some mathematical concepts, but please stay with me here. I, this stuff is fun to me. I spent about 20 years uh, testifying as an expert on statistics and research uh, in state and federal court cases, worked on over 100 court cases. And so I really enjoy statistics. And when you apply the tools of the secular statistical field onto the Genesis lifespans, we're going to discover some really amazing findings that emerge. So here's the data. That This is the lifespans of all of the patriarchs who lived before the flood and after the flood. There's 20 some of them. So you see on the, the far left side of your screen there, the average lifespan of like Adam and his son Seth and his son Enoch all the way down the line, they averaged a lifespan of about 912 years when you take out Enoch because he was uh, transposed or, or actually one of the guys, I think we see Enoch still in there. But uh, yeah, it was Enoch who was taken out when he was 375 years old. But if you, you add up all those guys and average them, you got about 912 years. But then something suddenly happens after the flood. The lifespans begin decreasing slowly, gradually, and exponentially. They don't fall off of a cliff. They start gradually going down. So what on earth is going on there? And why do they start living shorter and shorter lifespans? Well, in comes geneticist Dr. John Sanford from Cornell University. He's a geneticist. Uh, his gene gun, uh, called the Biolistic Particle Gun, is even in the Smithsonian Museum. Amazing guy. He studied this and, and, and learned that the reason why they're having declining lifespans is called genetic entropy. And that happens when you have an original population before the flood of millions of people with all of their genetic variety. Then you have a bottleneck event like the flood where eight of them get onto a ship for a year and everybody outside the, the ark dies. So you have a population of eight surviving individuals. You have Noah and his wife and Shem, Ham and Japheth and their wives. And they get off and start breeding and breeding and breeding into a new population. Well, when you do that, you compress the gene pool into just eight people and you begin inbreeding with that remnant of eight, you begin exponentially increasing the mutation load in our gene pool. And the resulting effect would be people starting to live less and less uh, lifespans. So, so, you know, their lifespans are going to be shortened. And that's exactly what we see in the data when we plot it out. When we plot it out statistically and throw a curve on it, we see it has an R square value of 95, which is off the charts. The statistical probability for this is less than one chance in a quadrillion. So there's something going on with this data that cannot be invented by a human, the, the writer of, of, of this information, because it covers 2,900 years, and there are multiple writers involved, either passing down this information or producing this information. So it falls along what's called an exponential power law curve. And it's so strong that it's statistically significant. So when I would testify in court, in order for something to be admissible in a state or federal court, I would have to say, Your Honor, my findings are so strong on this court case that it's likely to, to occur by chance and less than with a less than 5% likelihood. So I'm 95% sure that what we're saying here is, is, a, is a phenomenon that's in the data. It's a trend that's statistically significant, and it's not happenstance. All I'd have to do to get it in a federal court as admissible is hit that 5% level of chance. Well, what's the result of this analysis here? When you look at the declining lifespans and plot them out, well, here's our 5% probability 
it's way, way, way off the charts. It goes down to 0 0.0001 and you keep adding zeros for a long, long, long time. Whatever is going on with this data is not a man-made phenomenon unless the writer knew advanced logarithmic math in order to somehow plot this out along a perfectly sloping declining curve, which is just pretty much impossible. There's something else going on with the data itself that is driving this phenomenon. So it's in fact, it's so strong, we can take this data and we can plot out and make predictions. So as a statistician, all you'd have to do is tell me how many generations away from Noah an individual is in the Bible, and I can predict and bracket for you with, with a great level of certainty how long they're going to live. So that's how this model is so profound and so strong because it plots along that curve and the statistical mapping jumps right on top of it and says, look at that, there's something going on here and the statistical model can grab it and connect to it in a way that's so strong you can make predictions with it. So how in the world is some ancient sheep herder who is supposedly writing the book of Genesis down on animal skins coming up with writing over 20 or 30 people's lifespans out on parchment paper in a way that's so systematically declining that it fits along a power law curve. It's impossible. There's no one back in those times who could have dreamt that level of math up. So you're forced with really two options. Either these lifespans are real and they're really how long the people were living and they fit a biological decay curve, or you've got some writers over 2,900 years, multiple writers conspiring together in a multi-generational lie who knew polynomial advanced math to plot something along a power law curve. It's impossible. It represents true, real data. So here's the 2,900 years of biblical history. Here's all the authors that would have either contributed to this, to this account or written the account or passed the account on. How in the world are these guys in ancient times over nearly three millennia going to pass down the data and uh, that that's fictitious, that's a lie, that also fits along a power curve so well that they knew exponential math? It's just, just not going to happen. So what are the implications of this? Well, the Bible in Luke chapter 3 takes these 70 plus genealogies and goes from Christ all the way through King David, all the way through Abraham, back to Noah, and then goes into the pre-flood patriarchs. So we have now a composite situation where we've got the New Testament and the Old Testament validated together in authoritative, inerrant, inspired scripture in Luke chapter 3 that strings these 70 patriarchs together. And right there in the middle of your screen, you see where, where, the, where the lifespans begin shortening with, with, with these guys that are uh, going up to Noah and right afterwards. So it really solidifies the whole of Scripture because the whole of Scripture is talking about these guys. So there's no gaps. There's no, uh, you know, there's no fake data being inserted. These are real lifespans for real individuals. So it really validates uh, Scripture when you step back and look at it that way. So what are, what are the implications of this curve? So when you look at the statistical curve and you plot it out over 2,900 years, here's what it does for us as researchers. First, it takes the pre-flood population reduction or the bottleneck event and validates that. It also validates the fact that we all came from the same family because we had an increase in our mutational gene load. It also validates that people lived longer in a different world than our current world. It validates that people lived decreasingly shorter lives after the flood. And it validates the pre-flood, post-flood world distinctions, that there used to be a world like there was back then, and we're in a different world now, and the flood was a severing line, the demarcation between world version one and world version number two. And of course, it validates the genealogies of our Savior, that they're real people with real lifespans, and the Bible's history can be counted on and trusted. So I would say it really validates the whole of Scripture based upon what we just reviewed over the last five or ten minutes. Okay, so now let's get into some more practical questions about things like we get this all the time. How did all the animals fit? Or people 
Uh, an objection we hear frequently is like, oh, Dr. Biddle, there's 1.5 million species on alive on Earth today. How in the world could they all fit? Well, well, the answer is they could fit very, very easily because we don't have to take them at the species level. For example, if you look at the wolf there, Canis lupus familiaris, um, there are 339 breeds of dogs that all go back to a wolf. Same thing with horses. You can take the smallest horse and the largest horse today, over 336 breeds, and they're all still interfertile. If you look at the Ursidae family with bears, all Noah had to do is take two of the bear kind, a, a male and a female, because of if you even look at the family level with bears, five of the eight species in the bear family are still interfertile. Same thing with chickens. You, all you have to do is take a set of chickens because there are 68 breeds of chickens and they're all interfertile as well. So most experts nowadays say you just need a few thousand different kinds of animals on board the ark to reproduce all the different varieties and species that we see alive today. So here's what it looks like from a, from a, a grid work here, from, a, from another example. If you look at the, the, the bush example on your left here, that's the secular idea that we went from goo to creatures like the zoo all the way to me and you, you know, through the, the tree or the evolution of life. But we don't believe that, that that's true. We think what, what the data fits better is that God created after their own kind, which he says 10 times in Genesis 1 that he created after their kinds. And then there was some speciation and some variation of those kinds for about 1,700 years before the, the, the flood. And then the flood event happened, and then these pairs of animals get off of the ark, and then they start speciating and reproducing and changing and adapting, fulfilling their command as animals to multiply and fill all of the earth, just like God commanded. So next, let's look at one of my, my favorite topics, which is the mechanics of the flood. And uh, we'll look at some key flood verses here. Uh, one of the biggest clues, I think, in scripture uh, is Genesis 7, 11, that says in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day, were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. So that's really the key. All of the fountains of the great deep were broken up. So something started on the ocean floor and it wasn't just one, it was the fountains of the great deep. It was all of them on the same day began breaking open. The, the Bible also talks about the zenith of the flood, about a day 150, where the water prevailed about 15 cubits, which is about 22 feet over the highest mountains on the earth. And then it dried out. Then the water receded for about 150 days, and then earth dried out for about 70. In come the, the, the crew that framed the theory of catastrophic plate tectonics. It was these this panel of six individuals. Uh, that came up with the theory in the, in the early 90s about uh, Noah's flood called catastrophic plate tectonics, an amazing group of scientists. All of them have PhDs in their respective fields. And here's what they came up with, where the fountains of the great deep burst open. It started on the ocean floor, came up on top of the ocean. We have linear steam jets coming up, bursting open, coming back down as torrential rain. We had normal rain coming down as well but it started on the ocean floor. And it's quite obvious that this happened because if we look at Earth today, we have a linear rift system that encompasses Earth 1.9 times, and it's a circuit of 40,000 miles worth of rift systems. And this is where we get subduction zones. This is where we get a lot of the volcanism that happens on these splits that are, that are going on. Earth is cracked like an egg to, with a circuit of 40,000 miles of these linear rifts that go all over the place. Here's a, an animation that Dr. John Baumgartner came up with. He was a scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratories, and he's been modeling this for over 40 years, and he's proven now that Pangaea broke up. He's got the directions, the coordinates, the speed, everything else. When these continents split, when the fountains of the Great Deep broke open, the continents began moving apart from a Pangaea-like formation at walking speed or jogging speed, about five miles an hour. They began being catastrophically pushed apart. So we don't have continental drift. We have continental sprint that was going on during the flood. 
It's quite obvious that this happened when you look at the largest uh, linear rift. It's called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Uh, it's a 10,000 mile tear that goes down. We're splitting continents apart. And when you look at the map on the right there, you can see from this bathymetric map, a map with all the water removed, that there's actually big hills coming down perpendicular to all of the, to the, to the split there. And you can see how the continents perfectly fit back together when they were once together, but they were catastrophically torn apart. It's a very obvious, uh, like a baseball seam scar that's uh, ripped down the earth for 10,000 miles. So when that happened, we had a lot of seafloor spreading that was going on. So as the fountains of the Great Deep broke open, we have magma coming up from, from underneath, cresting on in the, uh, underneath the ocean on the ocean floor, forming new seafloor, and then spreading to the left and right from each spreading zone. And here's an animation showing that what that must have looked like. So there we have the seafloor spreading, and it went all over the Earth. There, there again is a mid-Atlantic ridge that we can take a look at there. And when this is going on, we can see it also caused the tsunamis that are responsible for burying billions of dead things in the mud layers that we find them in today. So as we have that seafloor spreading, we have the subducting seafloor spray going uh, plate going underneath the landmass. So it's being pushed and pushed and pushed. Then convection happened and the plate begins getting pulled underneath the landmass. And as it's spreading at about five miles an hour, it hits that landmass and binds and begins building up tension. This is how the earthquake happened in Japan and Haiti and a lot of bigger other earthquakes happen in our time. And when that breaks and releases, it causes a tsunami that goes two directions, one back out to sea and the other one comes up on land. And if you have that process going on rapidly during the flood, you're going to have cycles of tsunami, of tsunamis coming up on the land masses, bearing the dinosaur creatures and the rest of the fossil record in layers, which is exactly how we see them buried. We've got 14 states and three countries, a million square miles of these dead dinosaurs. So every circle you see there is a mass burial of dinosaurs that were buried catastrophically during the flood. That's a huge kill zone. It's 1,800 miles long by 1,000 miles wide, and it's 1 million square miles. And it's right here in the middle of America. So I would say the evidence for the flood is obvious, but it's been obfuscated by the world. It's been hidden. It's been tucked away and covered with theories and philosophies of evolution. But there we have it right there. The most obvious thing you can see about the flood, how do you bury a million square miles worth of animals? There is a picture showing a helicopter, and we've, we've got a T-Rex dinosaur there, one of the biggest ones found, buried under 100 feet of mud in the middle of Montana. How do you do that? How would an asteroid do that? How is an asteroid going to bury a T-Rex under 100 feet of layered mud? It makes a lot more sense that tsunamis are coming in from the coast in succession, in rapid succession, layering and building up these creatures and build, burying them under sediment. There is a site in North Dakota called the Tanis site. Again, we have multiple layers. You zoom out from that, from that, we have that whole area there is a dinosaur swampland where lots and lots of dinosaurs were buried. But we see these features uh, all over the middle of, uh, of uh, North America. Well, we know that this subduction happened because the Farallon plate that came in under California and subducted from seafloor spreading is still there. This is an underground radar. They can see that the temperature zone of, the, of this thing, it's still there. It's right underneath North America. So that plate came in, hit uh, the left coast of America and began diving underneath. And there's where it resides today with a heat zone map. So it definitely happened. It's along these fault lines where 90% of the earthquakes happen today on these subduction faults. It's called a ring of fire. So the plates are still subducting today, only much more slowly than they were during the flood, but they're still responsible for causing over 90% of today's earthquakes. The next uh, evidence we can take a quick look at is called fossil correlation. And that shows basically that we can prove that the continents 
were put together in a Pangaea-like formation because we have the same types of plants and animals that were living on each side of these continents before the continents were catastrophically pushed apart. Here's some good evidence for that. So each one of these green or yellow dots is a massive dinosaur fossil grave. So every little circle that you see there represents thousands or hundreds of thousands or in some case millions of dead dinosaurs. So if we fit these continents back together, here we have the pre-flood atmosphere. Do you notice how these circles are all pushed together with the same types of creatures? And in fact, if you do the counts on the types of creatures, we have one congruent ecosystem where these same types of creatures were living together and then they were split apart and they're now over 3,000 miles separate. But think about this for a minute. They weren't killed and then buried. They, they were buried and then killed. There, you can go to these fossil sites today on the edge and the, on the margins of these continents and you can find the animals buried in the very mud that killed them. That's the key to understanding this. They were killed by the mud that you find them in today. So we can split it back apart and we can see how they fit perfectly, put them back together, same ecosystem. They all got wiped out as it was split apart. They were buried by cycling tsunamis. Okay, then we have folded rock layers that are all over the world. You cannot fold uh, rock layers when they're, when they're hardened. You can't do that over millions of years. They have to be laid down wet and pliable and then like wet cement and then eventually folded. And we have examples of these folds all over the world. Here's one on the left that's called a recumbent fold that actually buckled back onto itself uh, going back 180 degrees. Uh, there's another one here that's right in California. We see all these bends. Those bends and folds happened while the layers were laid down wet and they were folded while they were still wet, not before they had, uh, not after they had lith lithified. These folds and bends are all over the place. In fact, this one, you can see the size of trees there on the bottom. So, uh, so it's a huge example of bends and folds that were happening as these layers were laid down in succession. They're, uh, they're just all over the world. Just more, some couple more examples there. Here's a fun one that uh, Dr. Uh, Snelling from Answers in Genesis went there. This is in the Grand Canyon. You can see people there for scale along this huge massive bend and fold here. Dr. Snelling went there and took 30 or 40 samples, fist-sized samples of those rocks before the, the, the fold in the middle of the fold at, at the, the part where the fold was most extreme and then after it. Took him in for chemical analysis and sure enough, what did he find? The chemical signature of the, the rock content at the, at, the, at the peak of the fold is the same as the fold before or as the rocks before it and afterwards. In other words, there was no chemical differences. The temperatures of the rocks that were at those three different marker points before and at the peak and then after the fold there are at the, they're basically the same, showing it happened when the temperature was about the same when these rocks were laid down and was buckled and folded, not over heat and pressure over time, but it happened when they were laid down wet at the same time. He just came out with those results uh, a couple of years ago. Here's what it looks like on an animation with some of these subduction things happen, and that's how you can get the ocean floor and push it up 30,000 feet like Mount Everest, which is where we find a lot of marine life way, way high up on mountains. Those clams didn't walk and crawl all the way 30,000 feet high up to Mount Everest. They were pushed up catastrophically during the flood, and that's why we find clams and seashells at every mountaintop, most major mountain ranges around the world, including Mount Everest, in the, in, the, in the marine limestone there, you find all kinds of sea-dwelling creatures that were on the ocean floor that were pushed up catastrophically during the flood, and they now reside at 29,000 feet. What could do that? It had to be a catastrophic flood. So that's what's, what's going to be explaining that massive fossil kill zone that we see. You know, it's, remember, it's a million square miles, 14 states, three countries, a huge, huge kill zone. It had to be something like a flood that could pull that off. So next, let's look at the dinosaur taphonomy, which is the 
the, the, a study of how animals are buried and killed and, and what type of matrix that they're found in and everything. Well, if we start uncovering dinosaurs today in America, we find that they're buried in a composite of three different types of substances, mud, sand, and ash. So however they got there in the middle of America, a million square miles of them had to be some event that was worldwide that would produce enough mud, sand, and ash to bury these dinosaurs under 50, 100, 150 feet of mud in some places. So what on earth could do that? What type of mechanism, a worldwide event, is going to bury a million square miles of dinosaurs in those three substances? Well, nothing but a flood. You've got catastrophic plate tectonics, which explains how the subducting plate is going to create tsunamis in succession that are going to bring mud and sand up onto the, the earth, up onto the middle of North America, for example. And we've got massive volcanism that's going to explain through sub subduction how that type of ash is also going to be produced in, in mass. And it's going to be uh, contributing to burying the dinosaurs. In fact, in Southern California, there's a, a volcanic system there called the Independence Dyke Swarm. It's almost 400 miles long. It's a linear rift that happened during the flood that produced 4,000 cubic miles of ash. Mount St. Helens, when it blew up even recently, was just a small fraction of that. But this, the Independence Dyke Swarm, you know, secular experts say it produced 4,000 cubic miles of ash, which was basically enough to bury half of America in ash. And that's why we find dinosaurs today buried in those three things. What could do that? What can explain it? Only a worldwide flood. Uh, next, we have the uh, worldwide coal deposits. Again, we have this lush pre-flood world. Uh, many uh, dinosaur habitats were forested, some were jungled. And then you've got all these things, be all these areas being buried by catastrophic subduction and the tsunamis that are com coming up. So we've got these huge coal seams. Some of them are up to nine, 90 feet thick. Uh, this one, the Powder River uh, Basin is huge. You can see for scale, these trucks there. Take a look at these guys here in a, in a van. You've got, you know, it's nearly 100 feet high. Where did all that coal come from? Well, it had to be from a huge world filled with plant life, like a jungle or forest that was buried catastrophically under sediment. So we have these coal deposits all over the world. So it also had to be a worldwide event. Uh, same thing, you know, stuff like, like this is not going on today. You have to ask yourself that question. What happened in the past to produce these coal deposits all over the world that's not going on today? No one's ever seen something like this on a worldwide basis bury coal. It had to be a huge catastrophic flood. So we're going to wrap up pretty quick here with a quick tour of the flood and the dinosaur extinction. So the, the world says if you go to every leading natural history museum, you're going to say, well, we know how the dinosaurs uh, went extinct. It was the Chicxulub asteroid that came down and nailed the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. So there you can see here on my screen in the, the very bottom center, that's where they say it hit. Well, if it hit there and generated, even if it was a major asteroid that hit there and generated tsunamis that came up and buried parts of, of Texas, how in the world did it miss a million square miles of dinosaurs in the middle of America that are buried under 100 feet of mud? How did that happen? Uh, it had to be a worldwide flood. There's where the dinosaurs are buried in the middle of Montana under 100 feet of mud. Here's where the Chicxulub asteroid hit. It's 2,000 miles away from that kill zone. So it completely missed that entire area. Here's a simulation. You've got the asteroid. It hits, creates some tsunamis that come up to the southern parts of North America. Maybe it buries Florida, a few other places. It didn't hit the middle of America where we've got the largest dinosaur barrier burial in the entire world. Definitely does not fit. And here's the one in North Dakota of all places buried under 100 feet of mud, the Tanis location. Look how far away that is from the Chicxulub asteroid. What makes more sense is here we see the tsunami simulation coming up over California there, coming up way over onto the land in succession as the Farallon plate is abducting. It's going to be bringing up mud and sand all the way over to the middle of America, burying these creatures catastrophically. Okay, so uh, we're going to take a very quick tour through the 10 lines of evidence 
for dinosaur extinction by the flood. So we believe that the dinosaurs are everywhere. That's just a that's a that's a good factor that we have a vast extent of dinosaurs. They were furiously and rapidly buried because we find them disarticulated or torn apart. They were quickly buried in mud and in ash. They were by, buried simultaneously in groups in many places. Uh, they're mixed with marine life. Isn't that interesting that we find the dinosaurs mixed with marine life? Sometimes they're found buried without juveniles, which is very interesting. We'll take a look at that. Uh, they're buried uh, with their bones still intact. And when we take those bones now in, in today's environment, 4,400 years after these creatures were buried, and we take their bones into a laboratory, we're now up, according to secular science alone, not creationist publications, secular science has established that dinosaur bones today have 16 different types of bioorganic materials still existent in their bones. They're not petrified rocks. They're not bones that have been replaced by, by the, the minerals in the groundwater. They're not, they're not just fossilized rocks. They're still organic bones, and then we can show that by learning that there's 16 different types of bioorganics found in dinosaur bones, things like proteins and collagen and red blood cells and blood vessels. We also find carbon-14 in dinosaur bones, and we find dinosaurs mummified. So the biblical flood is going to be able, be able to explain that, and evolution over millions of years definitely cannot. Those 10 factors form what's called an evidence mosaic, where multiple different lines of evidence all point to the same conclusion. So for example, here we have all the Allosaurus creatures buried in the Jurassic layers. Now take a look at the circles here in the middle of America where all the Allosaurus are, and keep your eyes on those circles as I fly in the sauropods. Look at that, they're buried in the same places. Same with Stegosaurus, buried a lot in the same places. When we fly them all in at the same time, why did these creatures die in the same areas? You know, if it was gradually over millions of years, we would expect that they would have distributed around and roamed around and maybe all the stegosaurus would have been over here, sauropods over in that region. No, something hit these creatures simultaneously, rolled them up catastrophically and buried them in the same regions. What could explain that? Nothing but a worldwide flood. These bones are scrambled when we find them. Only 97% uh, of the bones in America, uh, representing uh, you know thousands of creatures, are scrambled. Only 3% of dinosaur bones are found complete where we still find the animal intact. So they were buried furiously. Uh, Dr. Carl Werner's book talks a lot about that, that evidence. And we find dinosaurs all over in museums today in this famous death pose. Look at their necks arched back as they're dying in suffocation. They're choking for mud, trying to breathe. They've actually replicated this by burying chickens uh, alive. Unfortunately, they did that, but people have proven scientifically that as they're asphyxiating and dying, being buried in mud, their heads and their necks will arch backwards. And that's exactly what we see these theropods in, in museums around America buried in this death pose because they were dying choking on mud. Here's even a huge massive T-Rex with its neck being arched back dying while it was being encased in mud. Here's a place called the Dinosaur Provincial Park in Canada. You can look over 14 miles in this region and you can see thousands of specimens representing multiple genera, 12 different families of dinosaurs and they're buried with fish and turtles and amphibians and all kinds of other creatures, what could do that? What could take an area as far as the eye can see, a 14 mile stretch, and bury dinosaurs with fish and turtles? It had to be a worldwide catastrophe. Here's some signs in the middle of America when you just take a tour through that dinosaur kill zone and take pictures of secular museum signs. Look at what they say. Dinosaurs, fish, and clams buried in a 100 yard wide flood deposit, or 10,000 dinosaurs buried by a catastrophic inundation, or hundreds of dinosaurs buried together with shark teeth, or a large ancient flood washed over the starfish all at once, entombing them. It's quite obvious that they're talking about a worldwide flood that's responsible for burying these creatures. This is one of my favorite pieces of evidence here. This is Dr. John Horner. He's a secular paleontologist. Look at the, the title of his book here that's called Digging Dinosaurs, 
the search that unraveled the mystery of baby dinosaurs. So why did someone write a book about a mystery dealing with baby dinosaurs? Well, what he found was a kill zone that was over one and a quarter miles long directional notice. It was from east to west. They found up to 30 million fossil fragments there, a tomb of 10,000 adult myosauras. Not a single youth was found among them. So how do you take 10,000 dinosaurs, huge dinosaurs, and bury them together over a one mile long strip of land that's laid down directionally and every single creature there was between nine and 23 feet. Where did the young go? Where's the babies? Where's the eggs? They were all ditched when these adults sensed something so dramatic and so climatic coming up that they bolted. They ran leaving, leaving Junior Fido behind and they're booking for it trying to survive and there they go. The, only the adults are buried together. They ditched all the, lung as all the young as they're fleeing for their lives. But I think the most convincing evidence is this. The, the over 50 peer-reviewed scientific journals nowadays have established that there's 16 different types of bioorganics in dinosaur bones found today. Things like FEX and histones and proteins and skin pigments and keratin and unfossilized bone red blood cells, blood vessels. You guys, we have to wake up. What is this stuff doing in dinosaur bones now? If it's 65 million years old, it would all be gone. You don't. You hardly even need to run a scientific analysis that doesn't pass the smell test. In fact, uh, looking at the smell test, some of the experts that are digging up these bones in the Hell Creek Formation say that the, the ground in which they're excavating these dinosaur bones from still has the stench of death to it. And then they're rushing some of these bones into refrigerated trucks as soon as they find them, trying desperately to recapture dinosaur DNA because people know uh, internally uh, that these bones are not that old. Here's what it looks like when you take a triceratops horn and demineralize it and stretch it under a microscope. It's still soft and flexible because you take away the hard bone mineral and you still have tissue that's left over inside of these dinosaur bones. How does that look for an 80 million year old bone? It's not 80 million years old. It's only 4,400 years old buried by a flood. It would not be soft and stretchable if it was you know, 80 million years old. It would just be turned into a rock. There we have a blood vessel. Uh, with with uh, lined up like a train and uh, with all, all of these blood cells inside of the, of the of the blood vessel just going right through captured in a and locked up in time there uh, even the director of the royal trail museum the largest dinosaur museum in the world has admitted yep usually most of the original bone is still present in a dinosaur fossil so he admits that these dinosaur bones are not petrified rocks they are still organic bones. Here's what collagen looks like uh, under a microscope. And, and bones are made of an infusion of collagen, which provides a soft, flexible matrix, as well as a hydroxyapatite, which is a hardened bone mineral. And these two things together make, make bones both rigid and flexible at the same time. So collagen, being a soft tissue, should decay really fast. Well, some scientists have estimated this and say, you know, some studies say collagen and bone should decay between 10 and 30,000 years. Some scientists say only 100,000 years. And the latest studies that have come out, scientists have admitted, well, we think that the longest that collagen can last in, in bones is between 300,000 years and 900,000 years. So if this is a dinosaur bone and we're looking at collagen in it, and it's still got color that we can see here, what is collagen doing in a dinosaur bone that's supposedly 65 million years old? It should all be gone by now. So if dinosaurs supposedly died out, you know, millions and millions of years ago, why do we have this collagen? So it should all be gone within less than a million years. But here we have 65 million years to so supposedly when the dinosaurs went extinct and collagen outlasted the scientific projection by a factor of at least 65 times just does not make sense for an evolution worldview, uh, but it does for, for ours. So in conclusion about, about that piece, at least, um, are dinosaur bones 65 million years old or are they just 4,400 years old? 
you can see on my screen there that the last two bioorganics that they just found are cartilage and actual nerve cells. Right there at the, at the bottom of the screen, you can see those. Uh, we're, we're just about ready to wrap up here. Here's a, a mummified dinosaur called Leonardo. A scientists have found intact skin and ligaments and tendons, and they cut open its gullet and found magnolia ferns still inside of its stomach and gullet. So they still found what this creature was eating and an Edmontosaurus that's supposedly at least 65 million years old. How do you preserve those things for millions and millions of years? Here's another one that was discovered over 100 years ago. There's still encased skin impressions, large parts of the body. It's a mummified dinosaur. Here's Skippy. Uh, Skippy's supposedly 113 million years old, but you can still see intestines and colon, liver, muscles, and a windpipe that's still intact. It was rapidly sealed in a low oxygen environment right after, uh, right after the flood. Here's one that they just recently found, and they learned that this dinosaur mummy has 2,500 pounds of its original 3,000 pounds still there, and it still has intestines intact. There's no way that's millions and millions of years old. It died recently uh, during the flood. So when we look at this evidence mosaic, we have multiple different lines of evidences that are all pointing to the same thing. We have a huge extent of a fossil record, furious burial in mud and ash, dinosaurs buried in groups, mixed up with marine fossils, buried in many cases without young, we have lots and lots of fresh bioorganic materials. We still have carbon-14 found in dinosaur bones and dinosaur mummies. What does all this evidence lead to? I think it leads to a rapid, uh, recent catastrophic flood. So I think we will, we will end there, and we'll see if I can take uh, any questions. I'll go ahead and stop sharing, and I'll go back to see if I can uh, have you guys read me some, uh, some of the questions. Absolutely. Uh, all I can say, Dr. Biddle, is wow. <laughs> that is an amazing presentation. I know. We, we covered a lot of stuff and it was pretty quick, but, but hopefully it was okay. So No, it was awesome. It was awesome. Tons of great feedback. We've got nearly 100 people in the chat and the uh, chat is very lively. Lots of great feedback. And I just want to encourage people to <clears throat> make sure to share around this content, share around this presentation as the truth is so important. And that's what we're here to do, is defend the truth of biblical creation. Uh, that's Dr. great. So if, so if you want to choose a few of those questions yourself and and maybe pick out your favorites, because it looks like we got quite a few of them and, and ask the questions, that that would be be great. But you, you guys pick them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you leave it up to us. We'll get yeah. through a few questions, because like last time, we'll try and wrap this up around the hour and 20 minute mark, hour and a half mark. Uh, one thing I'll say, Dr. Biddle, because a lot of kind of questions and objections came in that are kind of the same. It has to do with, uh, you know, what the critics would call the heat problem. But one thing that I noticed you pointed out uh, so beautifully in your presentation, Dan, is that we have this lush pre-flood world. And you, you had images and, and pointed out these massive coal seams that exist, right? Which the critics on one hand will say we can't explain all the coal which I find funny because then they'll say, well, the flood would have produced too much heat. But wait a minute. Heat is a feature, not a bug of the flood, because the heat would be connected to a physical and chemical process that leads to the rapid production of this huge amount of coal and oil that we see on the uh, globe today that they say we can't explain. So in other words, the pre-flood world would be the perfect battery to absorb a lot of this heat uh, generated at the flood to produce things like coal, oil, and natural gas. Um, I, I guess, what are your thoughts on that, uh, Dr. Biddle? Yes, I, I, I agree. In fact, there, there is actually some indications in some parts of the fossil record that could indicate that heat or boiling was part of the, the flood burial process that was happening to these creatures. And if you get with the, with the gray hair guys in the creation circles, the people with PhDs with dust on them that have been studying this stuff for <laughs> decades, they are collectively convinced on a phenomenon known as accelerated nuclear decay during the flood. They're all pretty much as a panel. If you get the conservative guys that really know what they're talking about, they're all at this time very, very convinced, well, at least the ones that, that I know, 
on accelerated nuclear decay, which could explain some of the curvilinear spikes that we have in carbon-14 dating. It could explain a lot of the, the date layering that, that, that we see. So, because, because creationists are not afraid of relative dating, there's no problem with that. It's when you take the relative dating and convert it into calendar years that you make a whole host of assumptions. So I, I have no problem uh, believing that accelerated nuclear decay along with heat uh, was likely produced during the flood event. Well said, Dan. Well said. Um, so let me put this uh, this question up on screen then. This is a common one, uh, Dan. And I know that you've also answered it on your website too. So for more detailed and thorough answers, I definitely recommend people check out your website, which has been a great help. So here's the question up on screen, Dan. How did people, animals, and vegetation disperse around the world after the flood? Uh the, the simplest way to, most condensed way to answer that is to say two things, uh, land bridges and ice bridges. So you got to remember about within a hundred years after the flood, the ice age was probably in full peak. We don't, we don't know for sure, but we know that the, the mechanism for the ice age was the flood because you have a, a lot of heat, you have a evaporation from the water, you have aerosols being pushed up from volcanoes blocking the sun. We know that the ice age happened after the flood and the result of that was pulling up a lot of the ocean water and locking it up into ice. In fact, I believe it was 90 meters different was the the, 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 the sea used to be you know, 90 meters lower than what it is now because the ice age, you got all these things locked up in ice and it's gonna create exposed land bridges that were present then that are not present now. And if people could make it across things like the Siberian Strait, you can walk across those ice bridges. Uh, but basically, the elevation of the, of the ocean was much different uh, than it is today, providing a lot, of, a lot of places and a lot of stretches of land for animals and people to go to places like Australia, the animals to disperse. And of course, when you look at the animals, what do they do? They eat food. They walk 10 miles and then they excrete it and then the, the seed is coming out. So it's God's natural repopulation technique. It's just amazing what happens with that. So it, it would be a very, very rapid process, just taking hundreds of years for the animals and, and, uh, and the, the plant uh, vegetation to go around and spread. But I think the big mechanism for it would be the ice age and how it changed the ocean levels and what land bridges it would have made that were, were uh, icy in nature. That's a great answer, uh, Dr. Biddle. I appreciate that. And uh, Matt, um, was there a question that you wanted to uh, ask next? Yeah. The question is, how did the Ark survive the cracking of the planet when the fountains of the Great Deep were broken open? Great question. Um, and here's where it gets a little bit interesting, where you have to interject a little bit of faith. And I have no problem doing that. Just the, the very fact that the Bible says uh, two clues in the Genesis account. It says, first of all, on the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken open. That was a divine act. Uh, in fact, some experts have said it could have even been a change to the sun that created a corresponding change to the earth's mantle that resulted in all the fountains of the great deep bursting open on the same day. So that was a divine act. The second thing that's very interesting in the Genesis account is that the Bible says that when Noah had loaded up on the animals, the Lord himself shut them in. So someone closed the door. Okay, so God came in, intervened, uh, and slammed the, slammed the door shut. I, I believe that's what the text is, is actually s s stating. So if the, the, the founds of the Great Deep are cracking open like that, there would be some parts of the world that would be very torrential with huge swells, huge tsunamis coming up. Well, at the same time, the reciprocal effect of that would be some areas or some pockets of the ocean not having a lot of turbulence. I don't personally think that the ancient building of the ark that was only plastered with an epoxy-like resin, you know, pine resin or, or tree resin on the inside and the outside with planks and everything, was made to go be like a, st a modern steel ocean liner. Uh, I, I don't think it probably would withstand a lot of different storms, but some people have simulated it with a level 10 on the Beaufort storm scale and, and indicated that at least the dimensions were sound enough that it wouldn't topple or turn. Uh, like the Gilgamesh uh, arc definitely would because the Gilgamesh arc is a cube. It would have toppled. I think when you get to Buford storm level eight, the cube starts rotating. The Gilgamesh cube would start rotating around. 
So all the ark had to do would, would be to find a place in the ocean that wasn't where all the action is going on, where all the subduction's going on and the volcanism going on. God, I think, had to have his hand supernaturally and guiding where the ark was going to float and where it was going to be because i have no doubt there were parts of the world that would have been either too hot or boiling or coming down with too much ash for the ark to to survive so but it is also uh noteworthy to say that the ark didn't have to be super seaworthy it just had to float for you know 300 some days amen well said i completely agree uh dr biddle it wasn't built to have to uh, go anywhere. It just had to flow, withstand the flood. And the Bible indicates that God is the Lord over the flood. So I completely agree mm -hmm. with you there. Good and, point. Uh, and, and there's storms going on in the world right now, and I'm not feeling anything from it. So I think you nailed it mm -hmm. when you said, you know, parts of the world during the flood would be experiencing a lot of action in other parts, not so much. So, yeah, but it was a divine event. God was intervening that that's, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So Amen. Well said. So here's a question that comes in from Cool Jesus. I got it up on screen here. Uh, a question like this obviously could take a, an entire presentation. I know there's a lot of flood uh, geologists doing research on this. Uh, we've had a few uh, flood researchers on to discuss where they think maybe the flood boundary is. Uh, do you have any thoughts or anything on that? The exact question, uh, Dan, is can you ask Dan where he thinks the flood boundary is in the geologic column when the fountains broke loose? Uh, the debate about the boundary makes the flood model hard for me. Any, any thoughts, opinions on that one, uh, Dr. Bill? Sure. I, I think I'm I'm less particular about where the flood boundary is than I'm about some of its implications. Because if you set the flood boundary in certain locations, some creationists have to speed up vertical evolution to explain where they think it fits with the flood, with the, with the geological column. Um, I live in California, and I've been to some very, very significant uh, geological locations. I can show you places where the Jurassic layers are on top of the Cretaceous layers, the opposite to what you would expect, where, where there's there's mixed up boundaries. I can show you areas that are just fascinating. California is the hardest geological state, I would say, to try to figure out from, from the from a flood geology standpoint. And quite frankly, I challenge secular geologists and a lot of creation geologists alike to explain to me, okay, well, what's What's the ice age features of the geology here? Or what's the flood feature uh, of the geology here? It's very, very difficult to figure out. So I'm skeptical of people who come down really hard in a model and say, we know exactly where the flood zenith is, exactly where the boundary is. Um, I, I think there's, a, there's a, lot of, a lot of different models that would work for me. I would refer you to a guy that studied a lot more than I have named Chris Roop. And if you send me an email, I can get you in contact with Chris, who's made a, a, a good go at studying the, the flood boundary and its implications. Um, but I, I'm not a, a young earth evolutionist. I certainly don't, don't believe that. But I've seen enough of geology through fresh eyes as a behavioral scientist, not as a trained geologist, for me to be very scientifically skeptical of anyone's certain model where they can come up and draw a line and say that was the flood zenith and I'm sure about it. So uh, I'm, I'm scientifically skeptical against either one of those camps right now. And our movie is going to tactfully steer around the flood boundary and not get into it too directly. But I, I do side with, um, with ICR's position so far and where they come down on the flood boundary to topic. I think uh, Dr. Tim Cleary has is, is studied that issue very, very well. But, uh, but Chris Roop is the guy that understands both sides and the implications of both sides. Absolutely. Great answer. Uh, Chris Roop did a fantastic job in Contested Bones, which I've got over to my left. And yeah. Tim Clary in um, Carved in Stone, another great book that I highly recommend. That's so, a great book. Yeah, yeah. great book. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. So, um, Matt, if you wanted to grab the next uh, question here, brother. Yeah, the question is, how come we don't find animals such as sharks and marine mammals in the Cambrian layers? Okay, so... What happened, what, 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 the best way to explain this is with a graphic, which I don't have it right in front of me now, but consider this. 
you've got a, a Pangea-like formation. I keep saying Pangea-like because creationists don't necessarily like the classic Pangea. It could have been a Rodinia configuration, Pangea-like formation. You've got it there, and all, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep break open. So you have a lot of shallow seas, you've got some deep seas, and you've got the land masses, which were all pushed, which were all pushed together initially. When the fountains of the great deep start breaking apart, you're going to have the shallow seas buried first. That's just the way the physics are going to work with the tsunamis, the subduction, the seafloor spreading. A lot of the shallow seas where we find things like trilobites are going to be snapshot buried in their layers without a lot of other types of creatures and varieties mixed in with them. As the flood progresses and it starts coming up beyond the shallow seas and onto land, then we're going to start getting into what's called the Zuni Sloss Mega Sequence. Sloss, that's S-L-O-S-S. -S. Because if you go through geology, there's six Sloss Mega Sequences that we can tap into with oil core boreholes. Tim Clary's done a lot of work with, with that with ICR. He's dug into uh, data with 1,800 oil core bore, boreholes. And they've established that in the Zuni formation, which is stage four, of all those Sloss mega sequences, it's only then when you start seeing terrestrial or land dwelling creatures show up in the fossil record. So the flood, uh, the, the peaking stage of the flood, the Zuni was probably around day 150 where the peak was hitting. It was building up, building up. It's starting with the, the shallow sleeves. Everything on the ocean floor would have been buried first with underwater mud tsunamis. And that's where we find the trilobites, where the Cambrian layers are, are found. Then it's going to start progressively going up. And that's why we find mammals buried at the top because a lot of those things could run, go for high cover, whatever whatever they, they, they needed. But that's... Um, that's a flood mechanics answer to that question. That's a great response, uh, Dr. Biddle. And I, I frequently point out as well, and as you put it, the order of the, of the fossils is the burial order of the flood. So the, the, the flood point. begins in the yeah. ocean, rips up all those marine creatures, buries them on the continents. And then we'd have them being the first creatures buried. And as the, the, the flood waters rose higher, you get the burial of the land animals. And that's exactly what, uh, what we find. So Good point. what I'll do here, Dr. Biddle, because I want to respect your time and we've got a great audience and about a thousand questions. I'm going to pick out one, one last question here. We'll, uh, we'll engage it a bit and then we'll, uh, we'll kind of call it a day. You've been so generous with your time. This has been an awesome presentation and right. you've got a lot of videos on this specific question. So I'll put it up on screen here so everybody can see. Dan, so the question is, what are your thoughts on the so-called transitional forms evolutionists like to point to in the fossil record? A couple examples, Tiktaalik, the whale series, uh, Archaeopteryx, for example. Okay, so there's, a, there's a, a big picture answer to this and a microscopic little answer to this. So let's go with the, the big answer first. The big answer is this. As, as a scientist, someone who's trained to do research, if evolution were, were true, um, I would expect to see, like Darwin said, countless numbers of transitional forms that are not only high in frequency, but obvious in appearance. If humans evolve, for, for example, you've got to give me much more than a pickup truck's bed worth of supposedly transitional fossils going from ape-like creatures to human humans. That's, that's all I've got. So if you take the most crucial thing to evolution, human evolution, and you take all of their transitional forms that supposedly leading from ape-like creatures to us, and all of that amassed evidence can only go into the back of a pickup truck or even a more conservative thing would say into a bathtub, you're going to have to show me a lot more than that. I would want thousands and thousands of transitional forms and I would want them to be obvious in their appearance. And that's exactly the opposite to what we find. Charles Darwin himself was completely complex by this because he said that's the, the most obvious challenge to his theory. Is like, we don't have them. And he expected over, over future digging, we would expect to find a lot more. But that's definitely what is not uh, that has not uh, happened at all. We, we don't have the countless different types of transitional uh, fossils. But then... Here comes the worst part for, for evolutionists. When you do pick one of their supposed transitional fossils like Tiktaalik or whale evolution or, or something like Archaeopteryx, 
we wouldn't even begin to describe the level of evidence. Just pick one. Like Tiktaalik, you can't even get evolutionists to agree that it's a transitional form. Uh, it's just one fossil that they found <laughs> that supposedly spans, you know, 10 million years, and they've got that they've got footprints ab ab above it that that are 10 million years out of order according to the evolutionary fossil record. So when you take one and specifically look at it, and you want it to stand firm it just falls away like a, a strand of hair. It's, it's really nothing. So I think the weakest argument for transitional fossils, for me personally, the, the most, the weak spot for, for evolutionists would be whale evolution. It's incredibly weak. When you say that we went from a pachycetus, like running whale-like creature or running wolf-like creature all the way to a, a, a 60 ton blue whale, I mean, <laughs> give me a break. You have to make 18 different physiological changes to go from a running wolf-like mammal to an underwater blue whale that's you know that, that that's doing all the things that it's doing underwater. And and even evolutionists have said, yeah, we admit there's not enough time for enough mutations to happen to go from a ma a, a running mammal to a blue whale. So they they admitted on on that front alone. So. Um, but yeah, our website has lots on on uh, transitional fossils. Great point. We need to see thousands and thousands, not just a few interesting mosaics. Where yeah. if they found the platypus yeah. in the fossil record and it was extinct, they you know make all sorts of uh, interpretations based on evolutionary imagination <laughs> on what you know that's evolving into or what the platypus has evolved from. So yes, uh, great point. Great response, Dan. I really appreciate it. Actually, let me hand it over to Matt. Anything you wanted to add, uh, brother, with that being the last question? Oh, the whale. Uh, yeah, the uh, the transition that you were talking about, they've actually found the reverse order of that in the geologic column as well. So it's kind of hard to say one evolved <laughs> to the next when there's discrepancies of finding one before the other. Yeah, you're right. Very yeah. weak evidence. And that's one of their favorites. That's one of their go-to. So it's pretty funny. So true. Very, very interesting. Well, I think, I, think the, I think the fatal blow, Dan, to whale evolution, as you put it, is the waiting time problem. Even according to them and their time frame, a few million years is not enough time to fixate so many uh, necessary beneficial mutations to take something like a pachycetus into a fully aquatic mammal. That's a great point. Yeah. And, and many very smart evolutionists have studied that problem and run the math on it, penciled it out, and said, you know what? It doesn't work you have to have way too many mutations to go from a wolf or a pig or a hippopotamus. I mean, again, if it were going to be a sound theory, why do they trace um, whale evolution back to a feline-like creature or a bear or a hippopotamus or a mammal like Pachycetus, like a wolf? I mean, if you look at the, the evolutionary stories that come from natural history museums, I think they've gone back to five different animals at the family level hypothesizing where these whales come from. And it would be a very consistent story if it happened. You wouldn't have to be grasping at straws. Amen. Well said. Well said, Dr. Right. Biddle. Well, again, I want to thank you so much for giving us your time for another fantastic presentation. Uh, last year, you gave us one on human evolution, which was incredibly helpful, irrefutable, in my opinion, and another uh, irrefutable right. presentation here. Uh, Second Peter 3, people in the last days are going to deny the world that then was being overflowed with water perish because the evidence is overwhelming. Uh, I want to hand it to you, Dr. Biddle, for some final words, final thoughts. You know, I, I think let's just end there. The Second Peter 3 passage to me is very, very important because Peter, with the stroke of his pen, says, above all else, know this. He's, he's fading out. He's writing the last things he's going to be writing. And he says, hey, guys, above all else, know this, that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing, saying, where is this coming? Where is the second coming? Where is the rapture? When's this thing going to happen? Because every sense that you know, our, our sister, you know, the ancestors were existing, everything from of old, millions and millions of years ago, it's all been going on. He's saying the idea of uniformitarianism is going to replace two things, creation ex nihilo or creation out of nothing, and that the, the same world that then was was cataclysmically destroyed by water. So he says they're going to intentionally deny those two things in the end times, that the world was formed out of water by a creator God and that was cataclysmically destroyed by that same water. And you can hardly open up a college textbook today without seeing that. 
So what does that say about the time we're living in? Amen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, thanks. It it's been lot. great spending time with you guys. This is wonderful. We'll have to do it again. Maybe when the, the movie's about to come out or something, we'll, we'll give another promo and plug. But I'm, I'm glad to see your YouTube channel growing, and you guys should uh, keep it up. I appreciate it, Dan. Again, thank you so much for all you do. Thank you for another uh, awesome presentation. And we're really looking forward to the um, to your movie. So, and, and to the audience, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for so much good feedback and questions and input. Please share around this content. The truth is important. Matt, thank you for being here as co-host. And again, thank you so much, Dan. God bless all everybody. Right. This episode will focus on how the Genesis Flood best explains the geology of the Earth. Present processes cannot explain what we see in terms of the Earth's geology. What we actually see points to catastrophic processes in the past. What type of catastrophic event could best explain what we see? The Bible speaks of a flood. This flood is clearly worldwide as it says that all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. According to the scriptures, only Noah and his family survived. The biggest reason people would even attempt to challenge a global flood is because they know you cannot have both millions of years and a global flood. A main line of evidence for an old earth is fossils billions of fossils. They would assert these fossils had been deposited over millions of years. A global flood would deposit most of these fossils in one giant flood. We know these fossils are continent wide. The sediments cover entire continents. In an older creation model, a global flood would destroy the fossil record. You cannot have deep time and a global flood. Unfortunately, many Christians have chosen to reject the plain reading of scripture, and they have decided to put forth a local flood instead. Jesus compares the coming judgment by fire to the days of Noah. The coming judgment would be a global judgment, of course, in the same way that the flood of Noah was a global and worldwide event. It would not make any sense for the flood of Noah to be a localized event in the same way that the coming judgment by fire would be localized. Why would Noah build a massive ark, take two of every kind of animal, including birds, if it were indeed a local flood? Even a continent-wide flood would not make any sense. Noah had 100 years to build the ark. He could have moved anywhere in 100 years. This is why the flood was clearly global. Because that is exactly why an ark was required in the first place. The flood itself is proof that the majority is oftentimes wrong. Only eight people survived the flood of Noah. The majority was wrong in those days. There is overwhelming evidence that the entire earth was once underwater. We find marine fossils on mountains and in landlocked areas that are far from any body of water. All you have to do is look at the sedimentary layers that extend across entire continents. The deposition of these layers must have been catastrophic. This catastrophic cause must have been global in order to explain these incredibly massive layers extending entire continents. This all had to have formed rapidly. If these layers were not formed rapidly, we would not have billions of fossils in the first place. Fossilization is an exceedingly rare event and requires extremely specific conditions. To get a fossil in the first place, you have to bury it quickly and deeply. Because if an organism is not buried quickly and deeply, you will get scavengers who will eat the organism, or the organism will bloat and float, never actually becoming a fossil. It would fall apart and disintegrate. The worldwide flood of Noah, the global flood with the immense and unique consequences have incredible explanatory power when it comes to the geological features of the earth. 
as well as in explaining the world's coal, oil, mountain ranges, fossils, canyons, and more. Global flood deniers, or as 2 Peter 3 puts it, the scoffers, assert that there is absolutely no evidence for a worldwide flood. This demonstrates just how willingly ignorant they are. The evidence is all around us. Before I get into some of this fascinating evidence for the Genesis flood, make sure to check out Biblical Creation Basics, Episode 1, The Genesis Flood. In that episode, we discussed how sedimentary layers that extend it across entire continents are testimony to Noah's flood. The cause of these sedimentary layers must be global. In order to explain these incredibly massive layers extending entire continents, we also know that deep time cannot explain the existence of billions of fossils worldwide. No. A process best explains the existence of fossils. This is a catastrophic process that results in rapid burial. There are fossils of animals giving birth. There are fossils of fish being eaten. And we see massive dinosaur graveyards where we know this must have occurred quickly through catastrophic means. What about fossilized footprints? Fossilized footprints indicate that very little time has passed before the next layer was laid down in order to get the fossilized footprints to begin with. The evidence for the flood is amazing. Everywhere we look, there is abundant evidence from geology that the flood really did occur. Nothing in the fossils support deep time evolution and slow geological processes. What the fossil record supports is massive death and burial on a global scale. What else do we see around the world that corroborates the Genesis flood? We see rapid or no erosion between sedimentary layers. We see flat featureless boundaries. We find whole rock layer sequences deposited rapidly in quick succession. The Bible tells us that at the beginning of the flood, all of the fountains of the great deep were broken for. This is actually a major problem for local flood proponents and Bible compromisers. The deep, which is the Hebrew word to home, connects back to creation. The creation event tells us that there was one ocean covering the whole world before the land was formed. Did the Bible only say that the fountains of the great deep broke forth? No, the Bible tells us that all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. This would suggest that most of the water of the flood came from below the Earth's crust in subterranean chambers circling the entire planet. Since the Bible clearly tells us that the fountains of the great deep broke open, we can then make testable predictions as a way to actually test whether this really did occur just thousands of years ago. These fountains erupted in such a way that the original crust of the earth, due to the tremendous force, would have been cracked or fractured like an eggshell. Do we find evidence for this? The answer is an astounding yes. We find exactly what would be expected with the mid-oceanic ridge. This is very well known in the Atlantic Ridge. If you follow this around the, the entire globe, much like a seam on a baseball, you find that this can best be explained by the original fracturing of the earth during the bursting of the fountains of the great deep. How about testable predictions? We know that the gold standard of science is to make testable and falsifiable predictions. Well, PhD flood geologists have done just this. In some of the global flood models, we have what is called runaway subduction. 
This is where one tectonic plate goes beneath the other. If this were done over millions of years, a subducted plate down under the earth would have warmed up to the surrounding mantle rock. Today, we observe snail paced movements of the plates. The continents are moving very slowly. The catastrophic processes during the flood can explain what today's snail paced geological movements cannot. At the time of the flood, we would have had meters per second movements of the plates through the flood waters. We would no longer be looking at continental drift. It would have been continental sprint. It turned out that a prediction based on many of these starting points was confirmed in the most amazing way. If this runaway subduction had only occurred just thousands of years ago during the flood, we should find evidence of this in the earth. And we have discovered this exact evidence. We have discovered huge slabs of cold rock at the base of the mantle, indicating that they had not yet had time to warm up to the surrounding materials. This is yet again huge confirmation of the Genesis flood. Remember, 2 Peter 3 tells us, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. As a quick reminder to everyone, hit that like button. It actually does help. So here's a question, um, John, that I want to get to. It's a question that came in from a skeptic of the young earth creation and global flood model. The question is, how could any vegetarian, and in brackets, um, he put trees, bushes, and grass, survive being submerged or even destroyed by salinated water? Okay, it is a good question, and it's one that I asked in the middle of the desert of Western Australia. Um, you see, my background is geology. Uh, I went and did three years of genetics as well. I'd grown up with a dad who loved gardening. My first gardening book, even as a non-Christian, was the old Yates Gardening Guide. Some of you may remember that it started with, man was made to live in a garden. And I thought, that's a wonderful idea. Later on, I discovered it straight from Genesis because God made a garden and he put the man in it. So man was made to live in a garden. But that didn't help me figure out how does a gum tree survive a flood? We're here in Australia. We're noted for gum trees because A, they can actually send their roots down and find the water. But B, if you flood the earth, this dry land plant, how does it cope? So I had an opportunity. I was with the head of the agricultural section in forestry and i asked him i said see that that gum tree over there um how does it actually survive how would it actually survive a flood that went not just 40 days but over 364 days plus a few extras right and uh, he said well simple actually this is the same way they do now i said what do you mean he said well built into the tree and we don't know why but every now and then in australia we have a year where there's a massive rainfall. Some of you may have read up on Jurassic Park. Back in 2011, we had 16 inches of rain, 400 millimetres in four hours. It overwhelmed everything. And now we've got the opposite. We've got a drought. Now, the gum trees live through both. And I'm out in the desert, and this guy said, well, look, come and have a look at this. 
He said, this tree grows in this pan. He said, this is a little lake bed in wet seasons. And the gum tree stays alive. And he said, sometimes the lake gets so deep, the gum tree should drown. But he said, here's what we've observed. They have a mechanism to turn themselves off. And he says, as soon as the water level gets to the right, you know, uh, humidity, they turn themselves back on again. Now, I had my students, after that conversation, I had my students run Charles Darwin's experiment for seven years to see if those sort of statements held up. What experiment? Well, Charles Darwin still got bottles in the basement of the university uh, in which he collected seeds, dry land plant seeds, wet land plant seeds, grass seeds, vegetable seeds, etc., and he put them in a bottle, filled it up with water, and then every week they would take one out and they would plant them to see what survived. Here's the general results you got. And by the way, I got exactly the same results in my students for seven years in a row. So feel free to try and disprove it. You're not going not to be successful. Domestic plants, corn, wheat, peas, all the things that Noah would have taken on the ark as feed for himself, um, they don't survive very well underwater. You put them in water, you end up with pea beer right? It ferments. They don't do well underwater at all. But all your grass seeds, all of the wild plants, they survive like crazy. I mean, we see it in the real world out here. We have dams. We build massive dams in Australia compared to many countries. And what you find is you flood the dam, the dam will be underwater for 25 years, then there'll be a mega drought and it will dry out and instantly the grass comes back up. Now the seed has been there for 10, 20, 30 years, um, it's not affected by the water at all. So as much as the question seems impossible, when you test this real world, you'll find that the sort of plants that Noah would have taken on board for food actually need to be on board for food. The sort of plants that are going to be outside the ark anyway, the wild animal food, the vegetarian stuff, no trouble at all. It survives now under for underwater at all. And by the way, you have an assumption when you say it was flooded with salt water. Hmm. Uh, we, we do have salt water we dig out of the ground with bores, and we can supply it to most of the plants. Um, they, they don't seem to struggle too much with it here in Australia. But if you assume all the floodwaters were salt water, you are assuming too much. Here's your assumption. Whatever the sea is like now, it's always been. Charles Lyell's principle of uniformitarianism. Uh, don't assume that the present is the key to the past. When God made the world, it was very good and there would have been just enough minerals in the water to do the best for all the fishes that they ever could do. Uh, that's why many saltwater fishes can move into fresh water and vice versa. Uh, and year by year, the amount of salt is actually increasing in the sea. Can you get it? Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. In the last days, a third of the sea will die. That's the inevitable result, which means one thing. When God made the world, he knew how it could end. Interesting thought. I got to say, uh, John, again, great answer to a common question, a good question with a, a solid answer. I find even the best so-called objections to a young earth and a global flood have uh, very good answers ready to uh, ready to go, as, as you've um demonstrated here john uh george did you have any comments or anything brother before we get to the next next question yeah i'd just like to confirm what john uh, had mentioned um one day when you come up to my lake house john i'll uh i'll show you exactly what uh you were saying about the water the water level of the lake when it drops in those drought years the banks it's amazing how quickly they come up with vegetation the wattle trees the grass the weeds they'll come up and the other thing, of course, after the flood, the soils and the materials would have been rich in mineral minerals, perfect sort of composition for seeds to grow in. Uh, yeah. One other thing I might throw in there, now that I've been a gardener for many, many decades, here's what I've observed. There are some plants that if you submerse them underwater, the first thing they begin to do is swell. They take a certain amount of water in and then they form on the outside an impenetrable barrier. They lock themselves in. It's built into the sea. And that barrier will begin to disintegrate 
as soon as the humidity outside the search of the, the seed in the ground gets below a certain point, then they'll germinate. So they have an inbuilt mechanism to cope with the right amount and the wrong amount of water. So intelligent design, way above the normal level we used to think about. <laughs> And these inbuilt mechanisms that we frequently talk about, they are evidence of forward thinking, which points us back to the forward thinker. Um, so those are some great points. And, and as you uh, pointed out, John, correct me if I'm wrong, Darwin himself, Charles Darwin himself, helped us with this answer yeah. through his experience. Yeah, my God, great, we're great at you. Yeah. St <laughs> St standing, there's, there's another Australian, I think it's the bottle brush. Uh, John, doesn't it uh, rely on a bushfire to actually germinate? It does, uh, there's two ways you can take this. One is that it's adapted to actually become fire resistant, but the real history of the plant is that you have a plant which all the non-fire resistant ones have been eliminated to the point where the seed has got such a thick uh, coat on it, a fire is needed. So it's become mm -hmm. degenerate dependent, right? So it's not an example of creation per se, but it is an example of forward planning to a world which you would have terrible conditions like we have in Australia six years out of 10. Yeah, and evolution doesn't do any forward planning, does it? No, it doesn't do any forward planning, no brains. Uh, just slightly on a different uh, sort of line here. Um, uh, can the rapid, this is a question, can the rapid formation of core beds, oil and natural gas assist in removing much of the heat produced during the global flood? Um, this is that old, that old question about, you know, the heat problem, the accelerated radioactive decay and whatever. Yeah. You'll find that all chemical reactions either give off heat or they absorb heat. Uh, or the structures produced themselves will take up the heat and convert it either into pressure or they'll convert it into movement. So despite the claim that the world would have got too hot, this is in the ignorance, not the absence, but in the ignorance of other mechanisms that can convert heat into other things. Now, you ought to be able to remember from primary school where your brother would get you, you poor innocent young girl with long pigtails, he'd get your hand and he'd do a Chinese rope burn. Now, all he's doing is actually moving his hand around you, but that movement translates into heat. Now, you haven't destroyed the arm, you haven't done anything, but you've actually removed energy. And you'll find the same sort of mechanisms, not just the heat itself, but the heat converts into all sorts of other things, chemical reactions, exothermic, endothermic, movement of rocks, etc. We actually watched one day a, a, a dike form as the water underneath our stratum of heat just took off for reasons unknown to us straight up through the sediments above. Now, that represents energy, represents movement, but it was all happening in the liquid itself, and it produced this massive structure that we would have said, that's a sedimentary dike. Must have been, uh, yes, all of the theories went out the window. And, uh, and we know from experiments, John, that have been done by the CSIRO on oil formation, and many others have done experiments on coal as well, that it, ta it takes roughly 350 to 400 degrees Celsius to um, to actually uh, create that oil. So, yeah, so the, the, uh, the, the formation of the oil. Can I interrupt you there? Yep. What they're doing there is taking the organic chemist and making oil the way he does. Right now, if you do what we've done, you simply like we, we've run lots of experiments. You'll see some of them listed on our website. Um, in which you actually take what's actually in the real world. So that if I go and I look at a coal field, which is my special area of interest, I find that the best quality coal, and I gave a paper on this to the Sydney Natural Sydney uh, um, Coal Basin Conference, right? Because our best coal has a certain percentage of high-grade kaolin, fine microscopic clay scattered throughout it. Um, you see, if you get too much clay, the coal, it, it's just, it ruins your sort of burning equipment you want to put in it. But if you actually have this stuff microscopically spread through it, it acts as a catalyst and it gets to coal without even being heat. You say, how do you know that? The answer is we use coal in, uh, clay in pottery. 
and clay is used because it has one interesting property. As you cook it higher and higher, you know, that soft white clay, all of a sudden it goes hard. And you can put it on the side and leave it and it won't go back to being soft. So clay has an irreversible structure change as you raise the temperature. Now, the case of the clay that's in the, in the coal, it's about 200 degrees. So I'll be brutally blunt, the clay that's in the coal tells us it has never been as hot as all the local flood experts want it to produce this vast amount of heat. It's a catalyzed reaction. And the same is true for the oil and the gas. We have made all three using simple clay experiments with no temperature emissions of any great significance at all. All right, welcome to Standing for Truth. I wanna thank everybody for being here for today's awesome presentation. The topic for tonight is an analysis of the flood account in Genesis. We've got uh, my co-host, Matt, We've got Sam Jenkins and uh, Indiana Joe Hubbard from the Creation Research Team. Uh, they are truly a blessing. We've got surprises today. Uh, we've got an audience Q&A. It's going to be very interactive and it's going to be a ton of fun. So I want to thank everybody again for being here. Uh, before we hand it to uh, Sam and Joe for some introductions, though, uh, Matt. Matt, thanks for being here as a co-host. How you doing today and what's going on, brother? Uh, doing good. I got to stop staying up watching your stuff so late, though, because uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, yeah, you stay up late. Um, but everything's going good. Uh, it's perfect timing. We got a good audience. So make sure everybody that can hear me right now, make sure to tag just standing for truth because I'm logged in on his. So I'll see the questions and I can set them aside and uh, make sure to stay till the end because there's a surprise for everybody. And also something that came to my mind was that uh, Kent Hoven, his channel has been blocked for him. So all of the content that he is doing is now on Matt Powell's channel. So if you're looking for Kent, you can find him on, on Powell's channel. We might have to put the uh, uh, link in the description for people that don't know his channel, but I would imagine most will. And uh, for today, uh, make sure to get your questions as far as barominology, geology, and paleontology goes, because that is... Uh, their specialty. So start, put your thinking caps on. <laughs> All right. I appreciate that uh, introduction, Matt and uh, Sam and Joe. Maybe we'll start with uh, you, Joe. Joe, you're popular around here. You were uh, here a couple of weeks ago. You're going to be mm -hmm. here again in another couple of weeks for a presentation mm -hmm. on the uh, flood boundary, which I'm really, really pumped for. Uh, yeah. How are you doing today and how's everything going on? I'm pretty good, and uh, I'm looking forward to the flood boundary presentation because I'm actually going to be back in the Isle of Wight when I'm doing it, right? Uh, we like to travel around and do a lot of research with creation research. We're going to the Isle of Wight, which is, in my opinion, one of the best places to go looking for fossils in the UK, right? Uh, it's the sixth best place in the world for the diversity of dinosaur fossils, so you get a really nice diverse range of dinosaurs found there. Um, but it's also going to be quite interesting from the flood post-flood boundary kind of question because you have rocks there which I believe are definitely laid down in Noah's flood and you have rocks there that I definitely believe weren't so it should be interesting to actually use a balance to actually see can we work out which flog, uh, which rocks sorry are flood rocks and which rocks are post-flood rocks and uh, where could where should the boundary be if, if anywhere at all so that should be quite interesting um, generally speaking I've been pretty busy over the last few uh, uh, weeks or so we've been up and down all over the country ministry has started up in person again which has been really nice including here in the uk we've had a, a big event happen called cop 26 the big climate change event right and we deal with a lot of stuff about climate change with creation research it's our most requested topic we've produced more dvds and stuff and programs and any other topic uh, is always climate change right so we thought well we've done lots about the history and the science let's go have have a look at the politics so we traveled up to glasgow we interviewed a load of the protesters we're still working on this project we're getting some great people in to interview and talk about as well and there should be a, a little trailer
trailer, teaser trailer, go up on Creation Research's YouTube channel uh, in a few days' time. So keep an eye out for that. But that's kind of what we've been doing. With regards to me here tonight, I'm not here to hijack Sam's presentation. I'm here because uh, we well, we went through uh, Sam's presentation a couple of days ago with, uh, with John Mackay, and it looks really, really good. Uh, you're in for a great treat. But I'm here sort of as a... The next level up, shall we say, from Sam in terms of expertise about this issue. So I'm here particularly to help with the question answer session, as well as if at any point during the uh, presentation there's uh, uh, something that I feel I can give or help out or go back and forth with Sam about, then that's why I'm sort of here in the, in the background, but specifically here for the Q&A time. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Joe. As, as we always say, you guys at Creation Research are a, a blessing. So thank you again. Thanks for that introduction, uh, Joe. And Sam, the uh, man of the night, uh, we are pumped for this. Uh, you know, I've, I've said it's the much anticipated presentation. We've got a lot of people excited. So uh, yeah, a little bit about yourself. This is uh, technically your first time here officially on the channel, especially giving a presentation. So uh, yeah, maybe a, a, a more of a, d a detailed introduction, who you are, maybe a little bit about your, your testimony uh, for us in the audience. Sure. Um <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, uh, hello everyone. Um, I'm Sam. I'm another part of the creation research team um, in the UK. Um, I'll go a bit into my uh, presentation about sort of like my testimony and stuff like that. I've got a few sort of slides on there. Um, but yeah, I, I jumped on sort of semi recently ish within the last year. Um, but it's been going really good. We've got had some really good presentations and uh, creation conversations on there. Um, which has been really, uh, uh, really interesting, a good blessing um, on the channel. Um, and good to see a lot of uh, your viewers come on to our um, our live streams and to interact, which is really always really good to see. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, Sam, yes, if anybody in the chat who's not yet subscribed to um, the Creation Research YouTube channel and also the podcast, Sam, that you've put out. Please uh, go check that out. All the links and everything is in the description box of this video. So uh, that being said, yeah, I guess we'll kind of just get right into it, uh, Sam. Yeah. Um, and yeah, unless there's anything else you wanted to add, of course. Uh, no, ahead. no, no, that's fine. Um, I'll, uh, I'll share my screen. Why sure. not? Because I can. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Now, can you all see that? Is that all good? Because I've got the presentation sort of thing of PowerPoint up on there, so I can't see you guys at the minute. It looks, oh yeah, it looks great. Full screen. Okay, full, full screen. screen. Cool. Awesome. Why? Well, hello, I'm Sam. I'm, an, again, another part of the Creation Research team in the UK. Um, just a little bit of a plug at the beginning. Um, our Creation Conversations, we do every week on Friday. Uh, that's at 9pm UK time um, at around about 6am um, East and Australian time. Um, and we're also available as a podcast. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify. Um, there should be a link in the description. If not, I'm sure Donnie will add it um, for our link tree uh, where you can find all the platforms we're available on. Um, and you can subscribe on there and get listening. Um, it'd be really great to uh, hear your feedback on that. Uh, and the uh, other thing as well is we're actually on Twitter um you can search creation research or you can at us at the creation guy and um yeah it'd be great to see you guys on twitter as well uh and oh yes one other thing we do have a little small tiny minuscule little project in the works uh yes the genesis film project from the producer fire and ice we've got genesis where you can experience creation from the beginning uh we may or may not we don't know well I, I know and everyone else knows, but you'll just have to wait and see uh, if we have something special for you after the presentation. So make sure you stick around and we'll, uh, we'll get started. So a bit about me. So I was born and raised in a uh, small sort of city uh, called York, in the north of England. Uh, it's a place rich, filled with history. Uh, and we've mentioned York a few times on Croatian Conversations. Um, I'm now living in, uh, in Birmingham. Um, which is around where sort of like the England uh, section on this map is. Um, so I've moved around a little bit, um, fairly stable here, so that's good. Um, but York is a fantastic place to visit. Uh, here's some lovely photos of York to get your 
uh, get you chomping at the bit to visit. A uh, beautiful place. Um, you've got the uh, Snickleways, sort of reminiscent of Harry Potter. Um, and you've got the uh, city walls, which is oozing with history. And uh, as well in the uh, lower left-hand corner, you've got the uh, Jorvik Viking Centre. So if you love Vikings, if you love uh, history, uh, that's a really great place to visit and, and learn a bit about the a, a certain time in uh, in York's lifetime. So I was born and raised in York. Uh, I had a, a Christian upbringing, um, and uh, one of my passions that a lot of people may not know about is acting. Uh, I've done a fair bit of acting in my time. Uh, this is me in the York Mystery Plays in 2012. This is from the trailer. You can search it online. It's me being stabbed, um, as I'm sure many atheists may want me. <laughs> but um, uh, but yeah, so um, it, was, it was great fun to do. Um, and it was um, one of the first times where the Mystery Plays, if you don't know, is a story from Genesis through to... Um, the end of, of the Bible. Uh, it's all acted out in sort of old sort of Shakespearean English. Um, and that's me with a bunch of my old college friends. There we go, all, all dressed up in costume there. And that's me looking very moody uh, during another one of our school productions. And uh, another little known fact as well, I've actually been in a feature film. Yes, I've been in a film called The Knife That Killed Me. Uh, only background character though. Uh, and uh, you can see if you can spot me although that's probably given a little bit away uh, there. So my testimony and also how I got involved with creation research. So like I said earlier, I was born and raised in a Christian home uh, and I was a Christian because I thought it was the done thing. Uh, my parents went to church, so I went to church. I talked the talk, but I didn't walk the walk. And um, I went off to um, a Christian university in uh, Malvern, if you don't know where that is, Google it. I unfortunately don't have a map for that. <laughs> um, but I, I went there and um, in my third year, I lost my faith uh, very heavily. Uh, I became a vehement atheist. Uh, I would actively bash people online for um, speaking of anything towards faith and uh, the Bible, creation, anything really. And... Um, it was a very sort of dark time in my life and I went through a lot of uh, bad stuff. Uh, I won't go into detail, but it wasn't needless to say a good place for me. Um, and if we fast forward to last year, around about June time, I was browsing Facebook and all of a sudden an advert pops up for a group called Alpha. Now those in the UK will probably know what Alpha is, but those outside of the UK may not. So Alpha is a Christian, uh, sort of group that meets once a week where you can discuss for about 12 weeks ish uh, big questions of life you know what's the meaning of life does god exist what about jesus you know all that all that kind of stuff and anyone is invited along atheists christians hindus buddhists muslims anything agnostics everyone is welcome and they you can all put your opinions in um and this advert popped up and i thought it was extremely strange because obviously the way facebook works is that the ads that pop up are based off your search history and that had nothing to do with my search history at all um the the i was very perplexed very confused um but i don't really know what sort of led me to sign up but i ended up signing up then and there and i don't know how to explain it but there was a big hunger a big need to know more and so that led me on about a two-week journey uh, researching everything under the sun, uh, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, Christianity, atheism, agnosticism. I wanted answers and I wanted them very badly. And I was staying up until five o'clock in the morning doing uh, research. Um, but yeah, so that was very intense. And it was looking back now, it was clearly supernatural in nature. Um, and it got to about week two and the, I'd managed to narrow it down to two faiths, Christianity and Islam. And the main crux of the argument was, if Jesus didn't die on the cross and didn't rise from the dead, then Christianity has got nothing to stand on. That's basically the whole leg of everything, is that he, if Jesus wasn't who he says he was, there's no point in believing it. So then I started researching, 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 reading articles, reading books, watching videos, watching debates, all sorts of things. And then what comes up on week two? 
the death and resurrection of Jesus. And no matter where I looked, there was just nothing. I couldn't escape the wall of evidence in front of me. And me being scientifically minded, um, I would look at this wall of evidence and I'd have two choices. I would have to be true to myself and my morals and say i have got no choice but to accept this or i could do the unscientific thing and walk away turn my back and just ignore it and i had to give in because that's how my brain is wired and i gave in i gave my life back to christ and uh i haven't really been the same since <laughs> um but then fast forward to about sort of june of this year maybe july ish i don't know i don't know when um my dad sent an email to uh, John Mackay. For those who don't know, John Mackay, the creation guy, is our international director over in Australia. Um, if you're watching John, hi, John. Good to see you. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it was um, uh, my, my dad sent him an email. And um, he, but John emailed back and said, oh, oh, yes, very good. Thank you for sending that out. Oh, how's that son Sam of yours? People may be thinking, oh, well, how does he know who I am? Well, many years later, well, earlier, that's me and John back in 2012. This is when he was speaking at a, a church uh, in the north of England somewhere. Um, he um, he came and gave a talk and there was a, uh, I, I went to one of his talks and I, uh, as a sort of a, I, I went through a bit of a stage. I didn't really know what to believe when I was much younger. Uh, I went to one of his talks and believed essentially. Um, and then I've come in and out of his life several times. Uh, it's almost as if fate is uh, weaving us back together, as it were. And um, I think I can speak for uh, John when he, he felt the same, uh, that God was bringing us back together for some reason. Um, and Joe knew of me even before he met me because John had sent him this picture or showed him this picture saying, oh, yes, this is Sam uh, from the UK. And he's kept that, that picture all these years. Uh, sharing with people um, and there's a definite supernatural element here so we couldn't ignore it and so I, I joined the creation research team uh, I do the uh, sort of the more the multimedia side of things uh, so I look after the chat all the social media stuff and um, oh yes that very small project that we're doing the Genesis film um, so that's sort of what we're doing uh, together at the minute and uh, a few months ago, I went to go see Joe. Look at me. It looks like I've had an accident with a mop, but there you go. Um, that's before I had my hair cut. That's my lockdown hair. I can just feel the memes growing now with that hair. Um, but yeah, so that's me and Joe. I went over to see the uh, Creation Museum, how that's getting on. I actually managed to hold real dinosaur bones. I mean, come on, every little boy's dream. Um, but that was amazing. And if you can, if if covid laws allow you to or you know whatever uh, do make sure you get in contact with joe try and get a visit into the uh, creation research museum uh, it'd be great to have you um we've got some really great plans for the museum it's going to be really really good so at creation research we love show and tell uh so can anyone tell me what this is i wonder if anyone knows well this is a spinosaurus tooth this is being excavated from Morocco. Uh, and uh, secular scientists will tell you it's several million years old. We'll come on to that a little bit later. Uh, this is a bit more of a confusing one. Uh, this looks a bit sort of like a, a blob of rock you picked up from the beach, but actually this is an infilled horsetail rush. Um, and this is actually a what's called a polystrate tree. So this has been found vertically. It's, we know it's been found vertically because it hasn't been squashed in the uh, in the middle of the rock layers. Uh, so it's nicely all rounded and you've got a nice texture on the outside to let you sort of give you a little bit of a key as to what this actually is. Uh, here we've got a little bit of a trilobite embedded in a bit of rock. Um, you can probably find trilobites everywhere you go. They're quite common. Um, but I've got one or two trilobites in my collection. They're very pretty. If you get a nice whole one, they're very good uh, to look at. Um, now, this one is a, a pressed fish. It's been squished. Uh, we have a beautiful uh, specimen at the um, Creation, uh, Creation Museum uh, in the UK. 
um where i've got a fish eat well eating another fish but um it's not actually eating it it's actually regurgitating it but joe will probably describe a little bit more of that probably at some point um now this one ah yes this is a bit of an issue i've put it the wrong way around let me flip it over let's see if we can see what this is Wow, look at that. That's an absolutely beautiful ammonite. This is from the Yorkshire Jurassic Coast. This is from my neck of the woods. Uh, we have a fantastic uh, beach, uh, well, stretch of beach uh, in Yorkshire called the Jurassic Coast. Uh, you can find some beautiful specimens there, including one of these. This is very interesting. This is a ichthyosaur vertebrae, or possibly a plesiosaur, but most likely it's ichthyosaur. Uh, you can see the, uh, the residue from the barnacles on the back there on the uh, bottom left picture uh we know it's been washed in from the sea because of that um but little fun fact for you did you know these used to be called dragon bones i know very interesting <clears throat> excuse me if you go to the natural history museum in london and you look at uh the old ichthyosaur bones they're actually the still have the old labels on and it says sea dragon bones or sea dragon um because that's what they used to be called back in the day, back before we even had the classification system of ichthyosaur, plesiosaur, tyrannosaur, whatever. Um, these used to be called sea dragons if because they were found on the beach. So that's a little bit of a fun sort of beginner for you. So let's get into the beginning of the presentation. This is an analysis of the flood account in Genesis. So let's move on to the next slide, shall we? So, at creation research, we always start with scripture. So this is the flood account in Genesis. This is what we're going to be reading together. We've got a nice bit of flood water and a plesiosaur there. Uh, so let's have a read of the in beginning of the flood account. When the Lord saw that human wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time, the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and he was deeply grieved. Then the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I created off the face of the earth, together with the animals, creatures that crawl and birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. Noah, however, found favour with the Lord. And then we've got the family of Noah. Uh, we've got Sham, Shem, Ham and Japheth. And it carries on after that saying, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with wickedness. God saw how corrupt the earth was, for every creature had corrupted its way on the earth. Then God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to every creature, for the earth is filled with wickedness because of them. Therefore, I am going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it with pitch inside and outside. This is how you are to make it. The ark will be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. Very interesting, very specific measurements. You are to make a roof, finishing the sides of the ark to within 18 inches of the roof. Again, very specific. You are to put a door in the side of the ark, make it with lower, middle and upper decks. Understand that I'm bringing a flood, flood waters on the earth to destroy every creature under heaven with the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark with your sons, your wife and your son's wives. You are also to bring into the ark two of all the living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of everything, from the birds according to their kinds, from the livestock according to their kinds, and from the animals that crawl on the ground according to their kinds, will come to you so that you can keep them alive. Take with you every kind of food that is eaten. Gather it as food for you and for them. And Noah did this. He did everything that God had commanded, them, commanded him. Then the Lord said to Noah, enter the ark, you and all your household, for I've seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. You are to take with you seven pairs, a male and its female, of all the clean animals, and two of the animals that are not clean, a male and its female, and seven pairs, male and female, of the birds of the sky, in order to keep offspring alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now, I will make it rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and every living thing I have made, I will wipe off the face of the earth. And Noah did everything that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood came and water covered the earth. So Noah and his sons, his wife and his son's wives entered the ark because of the flood waters. From the animals that are clean and from the animals that are not clean, 
and from the birds and every creature that crawls on the ground, two of each, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark, just as God had commanded him. Seven days later, the floodwaters came on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the sources of the vast watery depths burst open, the floodgates of the sky were opened, and the rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On that same day, Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, entered the ark along with Noah's wife and his three sons' wives. They entered it with all the wildlife according to their kinds, all livestock according to their kinds, all the creatures that crawl on the earth according to their kinds, every flying creature, all the birds and every winged creature according to their kinds. Two of every creature that has the breath of life in it came to Noah and entered the ark. Those that entered, male and female of every creature, entered just as God had commanded him. Then the Lord shut him in. The flood continued for 40 days on the earth. The water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. The water surged and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. Then the water surged even higher on the earth, and all the high mountains... Oh, I don't know what's happened there. I don't know. I've had a bug. There we go. Um, the mountains were covered as the water surged above them more than 20 feet. Every creature perished, those that crawl on the earth, birds, livestock, wildlife, and those that swarm on the earth, as well as all mankind. Everything with the breath of the spirit of life in its nostrils, everything on dry land died. He wiped out every living thing that was on the face of the earth, from mankind to livestock, to creatures that crawl, to the birds of the sky, and they were wiped off the earth. Only Noah was left, and those that were in the ark, and the water surged on the earth 150 days. So that's the beginning of the flood account. Well, it is the flood account, let's be honest. But the most important thing that we need to do in this presentation is we need to look at the earth now, looking back into the past and see what's happened. You know, where, what has happened in the past? Why do we come to different conclusions? And what do the rocks really say? So before we start, we need to define what is science? So from the Oxford English Dictionary, science or silence is a noun, the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. In other words, the main aspect to remember is that science is repeatable, observable and testable. So question. If the flood were true, what evidence would we see today in the historical, geological, and paleontological record? So let's have a look at a bit of history here. So this is historical accounts of the flood. We've uh, got some sources along the, um, the presentation um, of which I can make available if people request them so people can look this stuff up for themselves. So. Let's do a little hop around the world and see what we find. So Hawaii. Nu'u built a large boat to save his family from a flood. When the boat landed safely on Mauakana, Nu'u offered pig and coconuts to thank the moon. So the creator descended on a rainbow to reveal that he was the one who saved mankind. Peru. The creator, for a choker, sent a flood to destroy the unruly giants he had made. Only two giants survived in the boat, which landed at Tihuaco. The creator made animals to fill the earth, and he made people from clay. Tanzania. God told two men to take seeds and animals onto a boat so they could survive a mountain-covering flood. These men sent out a dove and then a hawk to see if the earth had dried up. Western Australia. Gajara and his family survived a worldwide flood on a raft. He then sent birds to see if the waters had receded. Pleased by the smell of cooking kangaroo, the god Ngaja placed a rainbow in the sky to stop the rain clouds. China. When a sky god flooded the earth, a brother and sister survived on a boat. They had a deformed child, which the brother cut into pieces. Ugh. The earth was repopulated from the pieces. Mesopotamian. The god Ia warned Untampishi of an imminent flood and instructed him to build a boat to preserve life. 
the chief god Enlil, then brought a flood upon the world which lasted six days and seven nights, following which the ark landed on Mount Namush in modern-day Iraq, Kurdistan. After another seven days, Untapishi released a dove which returned, then a swallow which also returned, and finally a raven which did not return. The flood clearly now over, Untapishi offered a sacrifice on the mountain, and the gods gathered round like flies to savour the smell of the sacrifice. Finally, Untapishi was made immortal. So these all generally don't sound a lot alike, but there are some key elements here to look at. We've got pretty much every account has a boat of some form or a floating device. And in many of the accounts, it lists a rainbow. And in uh, the uh, the account in Tanzania, it has a, a mountain covering flood. Hmm, interesting. If you look at a, a police statement, if someone was to take a police statement today, who you've got four witnesses and you were to interview them each separately, if the details don't match, but the core story remains, you know it's reliable testimony because people see things differently. People will notice different details. They might see a colour differently because someone might be colourblind. But if every single person has the exact same eyewitness account, you know something's wrong. It's been doctored, it's been altered, they've corroborated. Now what we can see here is possibly we've got a core story and the details have changed as people have developed their own uh, cultures and traditions. Um, things have changed over time. And so we've got multiple different accounts, but they're very similar in terms of the core. We're looking at the root here. So we'll move on from here and we'll move on to geological and historical evidence. So this is from The Guardian. Evidence found of Noah's Ark flood victims. What? A secular newspaper has reported that Noah's Ark happened? Let's read a bit further and see what they're actually saying. So marine archaeologists found the first evidence of people who perished in a great flood of the Black Sea that has been linked with the story of Noah's Ark. Ah, we've got an issue. This is being protruded as a local flood. Interesting. So... The general gist here is that they've used remote cameras and submarines to analyze a section in the Black Sea. And if we look down here at the bottom, it says uh, they've found objects which look like beams and branches, debris that might have been stifling for wattle endowed homes. And also they found um, uh, different, um, oh, where has it gone? Uh, they found different, um, like mollusks and seashells and things like that, uh, from both fresh and seawater. So these have obviously mixed together. However, this is a local flood, but we're sort of on the along the right tracks, but we need to scale this up quite a bit. We need to look at the whole world. So let's move on from here and see where this takes us. So what can, can we conclude from this? It's an interesting premise that a flood happened in that area. Is this Noah's flood? Unlikely. Is this something to look for? Yes. There's some key elements there that we can look for. For instance, the mixing of both fresh and seawater animals, as well as leftover bits and bobs, we can possibly look at. But that's the main thing here is that we can look at this account here and say, it's interesting but we're not quite there yet. So let's move forward a little bit in this presentation. So what is a fossil and how does it form? This is taken from the Natural History Museum website, which is a secular website, which purports evolution of millions of years. So we're not getting a Christian viewpoint on this. However, it's very interesting because this is taken from a kids section so it's easier to understand as opposed to reading a science journal so what is a fossil a fossil is a physical evidence of a prehistoric plant or animal they may be uh, preserved remains or other traces such as marks they made in the ground whilst they're alive other fossilized signs of a plant or animal are called trace fossils 
Dinosaur trace fossils include footprints, imprints of their skin or feathers, and poo called corpolites. And here we have some examples of what we've just looked at. <clears throat> so on the left-hand side, we have a fossil of an ancient creature. It's been preserved in rock. We've got the bones left over. That is a proper fossil. That's like what we all want to dig up at the beach one day. Now, on the right hand side, we have they are still fossilized, but they're not a fossil creature. So if you have a look at the, uh, the back picture, those are some footprints. Very delicate, but still preserved very beautifully. Uh, on the left hand side, we have poo. This is a uh, <laughs> corpolite. Um, and also in the uh, bottom right hand corner, we have a picture of Archaeopteryx. And we can see here that there are feathers protruding from here. Something very interesting, though, which I'm sure Joe will probably want to expand on a little bit. Um, Archaeopteryx is not a dinosaur, as many people in schools may wish to have you believe. It's, it's not a dinosaur. It was reclassified recently as a bird. And the, this is this again has not come from creation science. This has come from the actual curate, one of the curators at the Natural History Museum, who is in charge of Archaeopteryx. Um, Joe, do you want to expand a little bit on that? Sure. Let me just turn my microphone on. There we go. Sorry. Um, yeah. So Archaeopteryx has got a rather long history. Uh, to give it in a nutshell, it was actually Thomas Huxley, uh, who was known as Darwin's bulldog, who first. Uh, pushed forward the whole idea of um, uh, Archaeopteryx perhaps being this sort of uh, intermediate link between dinosaurs and birds. Um, and so this is like way back in the 1800s, right, when everything was sort of first starting out when it comes to this. Um, since then, uh, a lot more research has been done, in particular by the Natural History Museum, has been uh, led forward by one of their main people. What they've been able to do is actually take a scan of its brain uh, or it's it, it's where its brain would have been right it's it's cranial space the empty space there and this is quite important because there is a major difference between bird brains and reptile brains i mean if you're a bird you've got to cope with so many different things from reptiles including things like flight and so on and so forth right uh, it's a completely different wiring up system their hearing is wired up differently their brain is wired up differently because they essentially have a flying gyroscope right to keep them level when flight which uh, we now have in drones and planes and everything else, our helicopters, a reptile doesn't need that. So uh, what they've actually done is pull out the brain space and it is 100% a bird. Um, there's just no doubt about it. It's not a reptile in the slightest. It's an unusual bird, we'll give you that, because it has teeth and claws, but that's not really that unusual because we have a good number of birds today that have teeth and claws. In fact, every bird starts off with at least one tooth, right, which it uses to break out of its egg. Um, and there are multiple birds today which have very large, vicious claws on their wings. So it's, it's an unusual bird. Bird, but uh, one thing that's for sure, and this is even from a secular perspective, it is just 100% a bird. So there's a, a thought on that. There we go. Thank you, Joe. Right, we'll move on to the next slide here. So does everything fossilise? Do all living things turn into a fossil once they die? No, very few things do. A specific set of circumstances and conditions are needed for fossilisation to occur. So it's actually a very rare event. Most things that die rot away completely, leaving nothing behind. This is very interesting here. Nearly all fossils we find, around 99%, are from marine animals, such as shellfish and sharks. This is because they lived in the sea, where sand or mud could bury their remains quickly after they died. But dinosaurs lived on land, so how did they get buried quickly enough for some of them to fossilise? Well, Dr David Button... A dinosaur researcher at the Museum of Natural History in London says most of the dinosaur fossils we find are from animals that were living near to a lake or river. Some died shortly before the area flooded and covered their remains in mud and silt. Others were washed into a river by heavy rain. Ah, did you catch that? Very interesting here. A specific set of circumstances is needed for fossils to occur. The fossils have to be buried and quickly in water where mud and sediment can wash over them at a very, very large rate or large volume 
enough to cover them so rotting can't take place and to preserve the actual specimen. Interesting. So how do fossils form? The most common way to an animal such as a dinosaur fossilizes is called petrification. And these are the steps. The animal dies, soft parts of the animal's body, including skin and muscles, start to rot away. Scavengers may come and eat some of the remains. Before the body disappears completely, it is buried by sediment, usually mud, sand or silt. Often at this point, only the bones and teeth remain. Many more layers of sediment build up on top. This puts a lot of weight and pressure onto the layers below, squashing them, eventually turning them, turning they turn into sedimentary rock. Whilst this is happening, water seeps into the bones and teeth, turning them to stone as it leaves behind minerals. Ah, have you caught it there? It's buried by sediment, mud, sand or silt. Interesting. We're looking at the flood account here and we found something very strange. All fossils have to be formed by burying in sediment. Interesting. Now, secular science will tell you that the creature lived and died where you find them in the rock. But why do we find sea creatures buried on land with animals? Interesting. More on that later. Can I just interrupt you very quickly there, Sam? Yeah, just of course. A, a, a little point, because it's something which it took me quite a while to um, pick up on as well. When you go to um, you know museums, especially sort of layman museums, because that's that's at the end of the day, that's what most museums are are designed for, right? Uh, the original concept of a museum was that everything was put on display so that researchers could go there and see stuff and compare their finds to it and make notes and so on and so forth. Today, the majority of uh, museums are educational places for the public. Right, so it's put up signs and information and stuff, and only a very tiny select amount of fossils are put on display. Right, to give you an example, the Natural History Museum in London has millions upon millions of fossils in its archives, right? But a relatively small number of them actually make it on display, and most of the big ones that are on display are replicas, right? That's fakes to you and me, right? Just replicas of things that have been uh, put up, right? Now, when we're dealing with the description of fossils in museums, you get a varied response, but the standard one which reaches museums and the standard one which reaches your textbooks and your kids' books about dinosaurs and stuff, right, is that these bones have turned to rock. Now, that's what we refer to as petrified. Now, petrified literally means turned to stone, right? Now, you certainly do get petrified fossils. I've got plenty of them all over the place, including this little one right here, right? This is from the UK. It's from Charmouth. It's a lovely little bit of petrified wood, right? Um, the wood has literally turned to stone. It's gone through a chemical process that has altered it and has turned it completely mineralized. And now you have something that has been completely turned to stone. But when you're dealing dinosaur fossils in fact most if not all dinosaur fossils and most fossils in general they're not actually petrified in the sense of turned to stone they are permineralized now you can break the name down permineralized these are bones that have become permeated with minerals in other words minerals from the sediment which they're buried in has been seeped in and you're absolutely right it has to be buried with sediment and the majority of it is buried by water although there are some other ways you can bury rocks right by wind or moving and stuff but the majority of them is abundant the evidence is clear right it's been with water but when you have permineralization you have minerals that permeate the porous spaces of the bone now bone has lots of porous spaces it's got the honeycomb structure inside right and so when you permeate this you're not actually permeating the bone itself you're just infilling all of the gaps so when you end up with a permineralized or a fossil bone, you're actually still touching the bone, the actual bone that was inside the animal. Right? When you touched the bone when you came and visited our museum, Sam, you were touching actual dinosaur bone, the very bone that was also in that dinosaur. What's happened it is it has become preserved in the fossil record by being infilled and entrapped with minerals so you don't actually turn the bone to stone you just encase it and entrap it and there's hundreds of different forms of uh, fossilization and we could talk through all of them right where we don't have time but permineralization is the most common one and it actually preserves the bone itself 
the very bone that was in the dinosaur bone is still there in the rock it's just become encased and entrapped this is why you can split rocks and bones open right and inside some bones that you split open you actually have got soft tissue inside of them soft squidgy stuff um that's because it hasn't fully turned to stone in fact it hasn't even fully been permineralized you're still entrapping something in the middle so that's something that took me a long while to realize and it's something that you know people still get surprised at when we're talking because the museums would simply imply otherwise but it's a well-known fact in paleontology and the study of fossils right that the majority of these bones have been permineralized not petrified and not actually turned to stone so there's a little important point to add on to that thank you joe as always full of knowledge far more than i could ever co possibly comprehend so <clears throat> let's have a look at how modern secular science sees the age of the earth this is the uh, the traditional view of the uh the, the rock layers that are, are all across the planet uh we have um rocks for the base layer archean so about 2.5 billion ish i mean they state i mean the age of the earth is again widely contested it changes all the time one minute it's 4.6 one minute it's 4.8 one minute it's 4.2 who knows it's fluid and then we move forward and we see the paleozoic era so this is around about 542 to 299 ish million years ago um and then we're moving forward to the uh, mesozoic uh, and then the Cenozoic, and then we get to modern day man um, pointing at the living pterosaur, strangely enough, on this secular drawing. Um, so creatures die and are buried over time. More and more time passes and more sediments and rocks cover the specimen. Millions of years pass and compress the specimen, which begins the process of fossilization or mineralization. We find the fossil when we go digging for bones and samples. And as I stated earlier, the animal died where it is in the rock. Let's move forward a little bit here and see what we can gather. What do we actually find buried in the rocks? Interesting question. Let's see. Can anyone tell me what these are? These look very weird. These are actually polystrate trees. So, a polystrate fossil is a fossil of a singular organism, such as a tree trunk, that extends through one or more geological stratum. The term is typically applied to fossil forests of upright forest tree trunks and stumps that have been found worldwide. Multiple places in the United States, Canada, England, France, Germany, Australia, and typically are associated with coal bearing strata. These have to be buried quickly in order to fossilize. It's important to stress that if these layers formed millions of years, over millions of years, you'd only find a small slither of, ro of wood in the rock. You wouldn't find this massive great tree trunk protruding through two, three, even four layers, which go through multiple millions of years. Here we have some fossilized trees at the top here. And at the bottom here, we have a coal seam. So coal, can be produced in the the lab within a few hours, few minutes. It varies, but typically coal is compressed. Coal occurs when it's compressed and heat is applied and we get coal. But this coal seam has come from a tree and it goes through multiple different layers of rock here. Interesting. Let's move forward, see what else we can find out if my presentation will cooperate. Uh, what evidence would we see for Noah's flood in the fossil record? Well, let's have a look. Here we have some petrified fossils and drowning dinosaurs. I forgot to get rid of the petrified on John's notes. Apologies, John. <laughs> um, so here we go. We've got some pictures here. I'll get them all up for you so you can have a little gander. There we go. Lovely, beautiful specimens here. But there's something very interesting about these. Let's go in a bit more detail. So the first picture is a plant, specifically a redwood branch. Much of the original plant is still there, but 
by the by looking at the the rock and what's surrounding it, it's been picked up and dumped elsewhere. So this has happened in a, a, a flow of water. The next picture along, we've got a fish within a fish. Interesting. The fish hasn't even been digested. How is that possible over a long period of time of burial? And then if we move down to the bottom uh, left, we have a fish and a... Oh, that's strange. A land plant. That shouldn't be there. Interesting. And then on the far right hand side, we have a jellyfish. A jellyfish in rock, you say? How is that possible? They don't have any fossilizable material. Very true. But we find the indentations of them. That can only occur if it's been buried very quickly under extremely huge amounts of pressure. And of course, we've got our good old dinosaurs there. It's not a creation research presentation without dinosaurs. But there's something interesting happening here. You see the way their tails and their necks are arched back? Hmm. The reason for this is it's a central nervous response. So the central nervous system in an animal, when the animal drowns, if it has a tail and its neck will arch up in a central nervous response, and if it's buried extremely quickly, this is preserved. Interesting. All of these have to be buried extremely quickly in order to fossilize. And what's interesting about the bottom left-hand picture is we've got sea creatures being buried with land plants. Interesting. Let's move on a little bit. What's the biggest thing that you can think of that would prove that life and uh, that the earth and the life on it is young? So I've got a little video here for you. Now, there's no sound because I don't want echo from everyone else. Um, so let's give this a play, shall we? So this is from, um, is, uh, is Genesis history. And you can see here, so this is from a triceratops horn. And you can see in here that there is actual pliable material. This is elastic. This is tissue. But this fossil is millions of years old. How is that possible? Ah, we've got an issue here. You see, this tissue should have rotted away or have been fossilized. Interesting. You see, with this triceratops horn, they didn't even do the decalcification process in order to get at the living tissue. Living tissue. Well, they say living tissue, organic tissue. <laughs> they didn't even do that process. They just cut it open. It was literally just there bare. Interesting. And you can see here how it stretches. It's elastic. Interesting. This should not be in a dinosaur bone. This is millions of years old. And that's a close-up microscope, microscope view of the actual tissue itself. We have what's called osteocytes. Uh, Joe, could you possibly in, illuminate the audience as to what an osteocyte is? Okay, an osteocyte is uh, part of your bone cells, right, um, which helps you to, to, to develop. And it's, it's one of the stereotypical softer parts of your bones, right? Your bones are full of soft, squidgy stuff, including proteins and ligaments and stem cells and stuff that help you produce it, right? Now, one of the interesting things with these organic tissues... Uh, that you, you find in here, right, is that when we first started finding them, the first was discovered by Mary Schweitzer in 1993, right, and it was almost purely red blood cells. And the argument was, I mean, as paleontologists, we deal with dead things, right? We're not brilliant with the living, right? So uh, when they first started red blood cells, the initial, well, the initial, initial reaction was, this is impossible. But when they proved that it actually was real, they said, well, it must be amazing because red blood cells must just be able to last 65 million years. And then when the organic chemists started to get involved, right, it was, well, this isn't quite as easy, uh, easily explainable or dismissible as that, right? And so the argument was, well, if you have these very high iron-rich deposits, lots of iron in them, and red blood cells are full of iron, maybe it's the iron that can actually preserve this. But we've gone on so much further than that now, right? We now have osteocytes and we have 
uh, protein ligaments and we have all sorts of interesting things right uh, and collagen ligaments which are which are coiled up right and uh, one of the biggest problems particularly with collagen is that the half-life is around 400 years uh, that's reference from a number of papers that have been published on collagen right in other words you start off with x amount of collagen and in 400 years you only are left with half of it another 400 years you've only got half of that another 400 years you've only got half of that and so on and so forth right so the oldest these could possibly be uh, these bones full of this soft squidgy stuff particularly things like collagen right and collagen peptides is a few thousand years old and that's the real key um, to what we're getting at here fantastic and we actually have some of the um, pictures from um, the t-rex vertebrae that they uh, see there you've got the el elasticity of the tendons you even got the red blood cells and the veins there uh, fascinating stuff but this is a huge huge problem for secular science at the minute um and you'll find that atheists will come at you and say well oh, well it's the iron or well no it's not it's this has to happen recently you wouldn't you dig up old grandma in the well you wouldn't because you get arrested but if you <laughs> dug up grandma um you still find some form of osteocytes and some form of tissue on there um However, if you the further and further back you go, the less and less you have, which is very interesting because when you look back at, say, Viking remains, you see that there's just bone left. And then you go even further back and you see that there's less and less organic tissue because it's degrading quickly. It degrades at a very fast rate. So we've got some problems here. We've got problems with radiocarbon dating got inaccuracies in radiocarbon dating. So radiocarbon dating is a key tool archeologists use, use to determine the age of plants and objects made with organic material. But new research shows that commonly accepted radiocarbon data standards can miss the mark, calling in question historical timelines. And there's such a thing as, you know, you've got carbon 14, you've got, um, you've got a, a radioactive dating, or no, radiometric dating rather, um, all kinds of different dating methods, but they're all running on the same presupposition. That the earth is extremely old because as you can see here we've got shells from living snails that were carbon dated as tw being twenty seven thousand years old interesting living snails uh, joe do you want to expand a little bit on that for our more scientifically inclined audience sure yeah um this this particular i will just say this particular snail shell although it's been uh, it's been published in science it was a number of years back and there's been a lot more recent and newer th examples that you could use as to some of the problems with radiocarbon dating right um to put it into a into a biblical spec perspective because we always like to do that on this channel and whatever we're doing with creation research right it's important to remember that those who are watching here today who believe in the bible when god says everything was very good uh, what does that word very good mean because you and i view that as a moral thing today and in reality it's so much more than that good men if you read in genesis chapter one animals were 100 vegetarian uh, good men that there was no death or disease or death. now one of the ways that carbon 14 works is that you have the decay happening in the upper atmosphere the decay transfers to the rain the rain falls down and the rain is radioactive right the rain hits the ground and the ground's radioactive the plants suck up the ground and the plants are radioactive you eat the plants and you're radioactive and when you die that radioactive material leaches out and the argument is that it leaches out at a set rate so you can measure how much radioactive material is in you slash the dead bones that you've become and so you can work out how old it is right now it is certainly true that carbon dating is accurate up to a certain point and it's very useful for determining you know whether a grave is a viking or whether a grave is a roman or whether a grave is a bit older or whatever right the reality is most of the time you don't have to go near that because there are enough artifacts buried with the bone so that you you know you don't actually need that but once you start getting into the deep time that's where things tend to get a little bit more inaccurate and where you're relying quite heavily on assumptions which you simply don't know but give you back to get you back to that biblical perspective right uh, radioactive material is bad if you walk into a laboratory they'll tell you put your mask on 
right? If you go into a radioactive laboratory, the reason if the radioactive material falls on your skin, it won't do anything. Your skin's dead, right? But if you breathe it in, it will produce cancer. It can go towards producing cancer. It can begin to destroy your living skin inside your lungs, right? So you wear a mask and you're fine. But the reality is this radioactive material is all over the planet, in the atmosphere, in the ground, in the plants that you eat, and that's why you're turning radioactive. And it can cause cancers and all sorts of nasty things, right? Here's a question. In the beginning, when everything was very good, how much radioactive material was Adam breathing in? The answer is none, right? Because everything was very good and radioactive material is bad, it harms you, it causes cancer, right? So something had to have happened in Earth's history to begin the producement or the producing rather um, of radioactive decay to actually flip that switch to start turning things radioactive so that you can ingest radioactive and so on and so forth. Now, I, from a biblical point of view, would say that a global flood would do that quite nicely. Major climate change and major changes to Earth's atmosphere. Now, that may explain why you are struggling to find carbon-14 uh, in some of the fossils and stuff that you dig up. But there are certainly a whole number of assumptions that have to go behind carbon-14. And the fact is, it's been proved over and over again to be... Uh, unreliable uh, when you're dealing with the the very very deep time the much older stuff that you're supposed to be dating with it but flip that on reverse right and this is the final point before i give it back to sam right um carbon dating actually supports a young earth because the oldest you can go up to is a few thousand years right with carbon 14 before you're supposedly completely run out of any carbon 14 in the slightest Right. Well, if you get things like diamonds and you get things like dinosaur bones, which are supposed to be on the order of hundreds of millions or tens of millions to hundreds of millions to even a few billion years old in the case of diamonds. Right. All of them have been found with vast amounts of carbon 14 in them. And you can find the reports. In fact, I was working. Uh, we've got quite an interesting um project going on that i'm doing and i can't really say anything about it but it's to do with dinosaurs and in one of the big papers that we were reading these are secular journals which have expressed concern because dinosaur bones have been found with carbon 14 in them well that means the oldest they could possibly be is a few thousand years old of course that's older than what i believe the earth is but it shows that there's a major flaw in the way that these things are actually being dated because there's no way there should be any carbon 14 in anything that is 65 plus million years old in the case of dinosaurs or 1.5 billion years old in the case of diamonds so there's lots of big problems and, and, and major issues with the standard assumption surrounding um, carbon-14 and radioactive dating. And I'll tell you what the problem is. All of them are based off the same assumption that Charles Lyell made when he set out to actually destroy God's word and remove uh, the Bible from people's thinking. And that is all of them are based around the philosophy, the present is the key to the past, which is the complete opposite of what scripture teaches. Exactly. Thank you, Joe. Right. Living fossils. Oh, dear. We have a little bit of an issue here. We have living fossils. See, these are creatures that are still alive today, but are preserved in fossils pretty much exactly the way they were. They haven't changed over millions of years. Why is that? Why is that possible? So on the left here, we've got a horseshoe crab, and on the right-hand side, we've got a coelacanth or coelacanth, whatever you want to call it. Um, you look at the uh, fossil specimens on either side, they look remarkably preserved. And interestingly, there's no changes. you still got here, you've got the spines here and the big long spine here, you've got the spines here, the big long spine there. You've even got the imprintation here, spines here, big long spine there. It's got the same structure. Now the seal accounts, we've still got all the fins, everything like that here, exactly the same. But over millions of years, this hasn't changed. Why is that? Maybe because it didn't evolve, dare I say? Interesting. Let's go a bit further. What can we deduce from living fossils? Well, we can deduce that they haven't changed. <laughs> They're still the same they were in the past as they are today, which would indicate that, well, not really a lot of time's passed. If you're a propo proponent of evolution, you'd say, oh, well, they didn't need to evolve. I'm sorry, the creature doesn't decide to evolve. It's a mutation. It's a genetic change that results in one, going from one species to another. 
I mean, sure, there are slight variations, but it's still a horseshoe crab and a coelacanth in the in the fossil record. Interesting. What about the missing links of human evolution? Okay. Well, let's have a look. Human evolution evidence consists of either ape, human, and a mix of the two. So let's move this forward a little bit here. So human evolution evidence. Evidence for human evolution has been radically simplified by genetics, which has conclusively found that the fossils or unfossilized bones coming from one of, are coming from one or three categories. Those fully ape, those fully human, or those com uh, comprised of a mix of ape and human. In other words, they have either been found as 100% ape, 100% human, or essentially a gluing of the two together. There's no middle ground. There's no, oh, these genetics are 50% ape and 50% man. Interesting. You see, when you look at the museums, they say, oh, yes, you look at Lucy and look at um, all these wonderful uh, missing links of human evolution. We have the full family tree going from ape to man. This is how we evolved over millions of years. Uh, one thing they first first start with is Lucy. But Lucy, there are some problems with Lucy. For one, the hip structure that was found was found as being ape-like. Interesting. It was a knuckle walker. It was not, had no purpose of being an upright human-like walking. And in the lab, the scientists didn't like that. So what did they do? They cut the hip bone to make it look more human. If that's not a fabrication of evidence, I don't know what is. If you were to go to a court of law with that, it'd be thrown out. Interesting. The, um, the uh, finds of uh, Lucy as well indicate that um, she died from falling out of a tree. Surely she couldn't have died from just falling over. She fell out of a tree, so from a great height, that's what killed her. So why was she in a tree? Okay, well, numerous amounts of possibilities, but it's not looking good for Lucy. Uh, Joe, I know you've you've uh, done some research into this as well. Um, what have you managed to find? With regards to Lucy or missing links in the evolution in well, general? Well, we'll start with Lucy and go a bit further. Okay, we'll start with Lucy. Um, first of all, the most recent thinking, um, I'll tell you something funny, the most recent thinking shows that Lucy was actually male, the original famous Australia Pithecus <laughs> afrohensis. If you want to know why she's called Lucy, it's because the guy, people who found her had been up the night before listening to the Beatles, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, right? Um, and, and so they named the fossil they found the next day after it um let's give you some context of where it was found so i would call them post-flood fossils we're not dealing with actual fossils here uh from noah's flood if you want my perspective of it but you've pretty much hit the nail on the head with most things um there was a lot of fabrication going on around her the original ones um design but one thing we know for sure from the others that have been found is that the two or three rather main characteristics that distinguish apes from humans in terms of bone structure shows that she was 100% a large ape and got nothing to do with human. Now, we found more Australopithecus afrohensis since then, right, uh, including things like fingers, including things like jaws and pelvis. Now, I've already mentioned the sneaky goings on with the pelvis, but one thing that all of them have shown, including the one, the famous one that was um, uh, mysteriously altered, is that they were quadrupeds they walked on all fours they were not designed for standing upright and even though you perhaps could stand upright just like modern apes and chimps and uh, orangutans can stand upright they're not designed to be like that for very long they predominantly walk on all fours the next 
major um, thing that shows between humans and apes is the jaw. Humans stereotypically have a very U-shaped jaw. Apes have a V-shaped jaw. There's no doubt about it. Lucy was an ape from her jaw. And the final one is those fingers. Now, you've already mentioned Lucy falling from the uh, trees, right? That's one idea of how she ended up dying. But now we have enough of her fingers to tell that she was a knuckle walker. Now, you and I have something quite special. We can do that, and apes can't. Right? That's why we can actually hold a paintbrush and do beautiful designs, and apes can't, because they can't do this. Right, We have much more uh, dexterity with our fingers. But one thing's for sure, you can actually tell the difference between somebody who's designed to do stuff with his hands and something that's designed to walk on the knuckles due to the curvature of the bones. Now, if you have very curved bones, it's because you're a knuckle walker and you're used to swinging from the trees. Lucy 100% was a knuckle walker tree swinger from her finger bones. So, uh, yeah. The evidence all points to the fact that she's 100% a large ape, no doubt about it. And the point that you made earlier um, is that with all of these fossils that you can find, they can all easily and clearly been put into the ape box or can be put into the human box. Now, the missing link is a little bit deceptive because that's not quite how evolution is, human evolution is supposed to work. But the point is still fairly strong. We are missing the thing from the middle. We're missing the things from the constant line into human beings. Yes, exactly. Um, so also as well, another point as well, which you may wish to expand upon a little bit, um, is about DNA, uh, about it, mm -hmm. it's actually designed by itself not to evolve. Could you mm -hmm. elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. This is one of the things we like to remind people, right? particularly when we're talking about what a design is. So we have a whole program on what a design is and how do you recognize the design and all this kind of stuff. And we make the comparisons between coding and DNA. Right? To recap, and we've got loads of programs on design, so go back and watch it. A design is, or you know something is a design, if the end product has properties that do not come from the materials that it's made of. Now, by that definition, DNA contains all the hallmarks of design, but it's actually designed, it's got an extra design because you and I can design cars and computer codes, right? But what we can't design is something that is self replicating and self repairing, or at least if we try, it's not particularly very good, right? DNA is actually designed to not evolve. Mutations are just supposed to be the driving force of evolution. You have a mutation, which is a mistake. You either replace or add or change something around in the genome, right? And uh, you end up with a mistake, and then natural selection eliminates the bad mistakes and only leaves the good mistakes hence driving evolution forward now there's lots and lots of problems with that and we haven't got time to go into everything but one of the biggest problems is that dna is designed to not evolve it has a self-replicating system that actually checks to make sure that there are no mistakes it when it duplicates itself it checks to make sure there are no mistakes uh, and so it has a mechanism by which it stops itself evolving now it's true a vast number of mutations get through because we live in a fallen world and there are problems with this uh, self-replicating design but the very fact that there's a design there to stop it from uh, mutating in the first place shows you that they couldn't possibly have evolved from this very design design which is supposedly there to stop it evolving in the first place it's just a circular issue right so um the whole point of dna is that it's designed to not evolve now it's true that new problems and mutations do slip through uh, slip through but that's uh, part of the result of living in a falling world yes and also as well you've um if you look at uh, say for instance the the dogs um you can breed all of the different kinds of dogs within mm you know, a, a very, very short amount of time. Um, but also as well is that they will never go outside of that because there are genetic yeah. limits. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So genetic limits for those people who don't understand is that um, there's hardwired <laughs> limits on either end of the genetic spectrum within a kind um, or species, whatever you want to call it, where a dog will not transform into something else. It is genetically impossible it will stay within the confines of these hardwired limits to stop it from changing into something else which i think is very fascinating because it, you, that argument in itself just goes to show how much faith there is in the evolutionary theory mm -hmm. but yeah anyway so i think this has been a fun presentation uh 
I'd like to end with a little bit of scripture. This is one of my favourite quotes. Uh, this is from 1 Peter 3.15. Um, but in your hearts, honour Christ, the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. And that's what I've tried to do today. I've tried to give a defence for my faith and to get, do it with gentleness and respect as anyone deserves. And I want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, looking forward to your questions. There we go. That's all done. Oh, Matt, Matt's still on mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Donnie must be as well. <laughs> it's all right. We can jump into the Q&A. A lot of questions came in, actually. So, oh, good. Fa fantastic. Yes. Yeah. It'd be good that you're both here for it because we don't know where this will go. Um, you might like some of them. You might not like them. It's okay. That's fine. Yeah, so we throw them. I've, I've got a thick skin. It's fine. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> um. It looked like I stepped away right at the time that you were just ending. So I appreciate that. Oh, uh, sorry about that. Got, my, my timing, as always, is impeccable. You can just ask <laughs> my parents. It's fine. No worries. No worries. Uh, everything is good. And uh, that was a fantastic presentation, as always. Um, I always compliment. I always like to point out that I appreciate your slides. Um, you know, Sam, Joe, and uh, John Mackay, you guys all. Have awesome presentations, tons of kind words from the chat. Uh, today we're actually uh, double streaming. So we're streaming to both our channels at the same time. And uh, we've got over 60 people in the chat. So we've got a great Ooh, turnout. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we've Come got a, a, a lot of compliments and uh, great things to say. So God bless the both of you. Um, we've got questions that'll keep us busy for about the next five hours. So if you guys need a bathroom break or anything like that, I'm, <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're not going to go that long, but, um, so that being said, oh, actually there were some comments in the chat, Sam saying that, uh, we found the perfect, uh, narrator voice. So they no longer need me. They want you Sam, to uh, report a, uh, an audio Bible. They said they could listen to you all, uh, all day so it's because it's i'm british isn't it that's just that's just what it is <laughs> I've, I've, i found that going through well particularly the states is um you know we turned up at a school one day and all these all these young ladies there you know just start talking and they're like oh i said oh are you going to come and listen to me later on then oh yes 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 absolutely <laughs> you don't even know what i'm talking about doesn't matter we're gonna be yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even if it's somebody you disagree even, with we... exactly well, it's funny because we had a super chat from an atheist named Bob. I appreciate your support. He pointed out he's an atheist, doesn't believe in any gods, but uh, nonetheless, he's enjoying the presentation. So, oh, uh, you thank know, you. great job. Great yeah. stuff. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Sandy C says, exciting panel. Uh, love the John Mackay team. Well, to see more of them, please check the, descri the description box. Make sure you subscribe to their channels, check out the podcast, yes. and utilize their website. Uh, I know I do. So that being said, let's kind of get right into it then, unless there's any uh, comments or points anybody wants to add before we get into the questions themselves. No, I, yes. I mean, I'm honored to have had such a lovely welcome. You know, it's, it's been fantastic. <laughs> so it's been, it's been really great doing this. It's, it's fantastic. Great fun. You did a great job. Oh, yeah. I got to say an, an hour and a half flies by as well. Great slides, great information. So, and you touched on so many different things, which is why I think we got a good diversity of, um questions now are, are we going to do the questions first sam or do the surprise first oh I don't, uh, is there a surprise though i don't know <laughs> oh. <laughs> we, oh, oh go on then all right fine um so this is um th this is something special for standing for truth from myself and the creation research team uh, as you all know we have partnered together for the uh, the genesis film uh, I did tease a little bit earlier in my presentation that maybe something there is something. Um, and tease. I wanna... <laughs> you, very, you very heavily hinted at the next. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so this is something exclusive for you guys to say thank you for tuning in to me. Um, so yeah, whenever you're ready, guys, roll the new trailer. 
All right, Matt, do the honors, brother. All righty. Very that good. There we that go, guys. That is the new Standing for Truth exclusive trailer. So that is exclusively for Standing for Truth. Um, I'm assuming, Donny, that'll be uploaded pretty much instantly as soon as the stream ends. <laughs> you got it. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's just something I threw together um, for, for you guys. And uh, you've seen it. You've seen it in previews before. Um, and you guys have, have seen sort of a preview of the actual project itself um and we're just we i'm i'm stoked for this i really am it's going to be awesome no I'm, I'm so pumped the hype is real and uh what a an awesome trailer that just pumps me up more and more every time i watch it uh more hype from that trailer than the next big avengers movie <laughs> i guess you could say <laughs> or the next big jurassic park <laughs> new movie but seriously awesome trailer and i'm really really excited for uh people to see this um you know in early 2022 so something to look forward to well well we'll see about that we <laughs> we, we met we may i mean th i mean i'll be honest things on the project are going so well we may be able to release it before christmas wow well, that's a may possibly. i can't guarantee it but right. i'm i'm doing my dundest to make sure that this project will get done before Christmas. If not, it definitely will be early 2022. But obviously, we we at the Creation Research team will, will keep you abreast of any changes. Um, if there are any issues, whatever, uh, we'll keep you informed. But I mean, this is this is my passion project. This is something I've always wanted to do. Um, and I'm so pleased that, you know, our ministries can combine um, together. Uh, so don't tease us like that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, and good old, good old george promoting your content cheers on you mate yes. yeah um but yeah so um i mean if you guys have any questions about the project or even pe people in the chat have got any questions about the project i'll see if i can answer them yeah yeah so as as comments come in especially uh, uh pertaining to the film uh guys i'll just put your comment up on screen mm -hmm. as far as the questions go these are questions that we say yeah sure from, uh you know an hour ago so we won't be able to put them up on screen but that being said matt why don't you uh pick out the first question that you think might uh, be suitable and uh we'll kind of go from there all right let's see a uh, question directly for joe on this one how does the evolutionary community respond to the existence of polystrata trees and do you find their explanations convincing Okay, um, there's two parts to the answer. Uh, the first one is that they just completely ignore it, or at least that's what they used to. All right, we first started, uh, or the first secular uh, person to start documenting polystrate trees was Professor Garrick Ager, right, um, from uh, uh, Swansea University in Wales. And he was the first one to point out there's something seriously wrong with the way that these rock formations actually form, right, or they're supposed to be formed. But prior to even that being published, John Mackay was taking photographs of polystrate trees in Newcastle in Australia, right, to a beach where I've been to. To. beautiful beach wonderful very difficult to get down there but once you get down there you're presented with some glorious fossils including these polystrate trees all right they all have the same thing in common they have the bed of coal at the bottom inside that bed of coal there are no roots inside that bed of coal there are no pine needles and that's important because these are the pine trees right and there is no soil uh, and then protruding out of these uh, these uh, coal deposits, you have this polystrate tree which sticks up through all the layers. They have no roots, they have no branches, and they have very little bark. And what little bark there is has been turned to coal. Uh, 
So these trees, by definition, have been ripped up, stripped, and dumped there, uh, standing upright as they've got waterlogged, right? They've been carried along by water. And John Mackay was taking photographs of these in the 70s and the 80s, right, and decided he was going to publish his report on them in the Sydney Basin Coal Conference, one of the biggest coal conferences, well, in the world, but certainly in Australia, right? And at the time, there was a very prolific atheist in charge of the Sydney Basin uh, Conference and uh, a very, very anti-creationist, new John knew John Mackay's, uh, you know, creation guy reputation. And so when John tried to publish these photos and the reports of these trees, he simply rejected it and said, there are no such thing as polystrate trees in Newcastle. Now, John had had all the papers and everything, right? And then he turned around and he said, well, if I can't do it in the Sydney Basin Coal Conference, I'll publish it in the International Coal Conference Proceedings, right? And he went to publish it and he found that it was rejected by exactly the same guy who'd rejected him on the Sydney Basin Coal Conference. Now, you could go and comment about some of the issues with peer review there, right? But here's something where they are physically saying, no, we refuse to accept even the existence of these, despite the fact I can take you there and see them, right? Now, as it happens, there's so much, uh, so many records and documents of these polystrate trees. They're all around the planet, right? I know about 30 different sites just in the UK where I can take you and show you, right? There's the famous trees uh, in uh, in um, Yellowstone National Park. Uh, a lot of those trees that Sam put up was in Tennessee, and I've collected all up and down the uh, coal deposits around Tennessee and seen these marvelous polystrate trees, right? What they tend to do now is say, well, okay, we're still going to accept the millions of years is, but we're going to say that these formations actually were deposited very quickly by water. Now, you saw some of the example of this um, in what Sam was saying about these things have to be buried quickly, but there's still a bit of a contradiction there uh, for two reasons. The first one is what they say is they say, well, you have a, a swamp-like environment where all these trees are going, and then it became inundated and buried in a sort of a flash local flood, which ended up burying these trees. Well, your first problem is the swamp scenario, because the majority of these polystrate trees, which were supposedly growing in a swamp before they got inundated and uh, it got compressed and turned into coal, the majority of these trees they're so well preserved we know exactly what kind of trees they are we have their modern living counterparts right they're pretty much living fossils and they don't live in swamps they simply can't survive in swamps so there's your first problem from a paleobiological perspective there's something else going on here secondly we've already mentioned the fact that they've been stripped of their leaves and their branches there's no soil that they're sitting in so the majority of them have clearly been stripped and washed into position before settling upright due to waterlogging. Now, this is shows you clearly that they haven't been growing there, right? Uh, so that's the first problem with their explanation. The second problem is this idea of a local flood, because these deposits are certainly not local. Now, the majority of polystrate trees, and I say the majority because there are examples outside of this, but the majority of these polystrate trees are found in the Carboniferous. Carboniferous means full of carbon. It's where all the coal is from. Right Here in the UK, we've called it Upper and Lower Carboniferous, and you Americans who couldn't possibly go with our British naming of things named them Pennsylvanian and Mississippian, right? But they're exactly the same deposit, just a different name. Now, Derek Ager, the guy who I pointed out earlier, was one of the first secular scientists to point out the problem that the Carboniferous deposits cover 180 degrees of the Earth's surface. Now, that is a very big flood. They're all identical, identical fossils, identical coal mats, identical fossil trees all throughout the Earth. And if it wasn't for the temperature difference, right, I could jump in one of those Doctor Who TARDIS machines and go from Tennessee in the USA to Northumberland in the UK to Newcastle in Australia, and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference from the rocks. Thank you very much. My refreshment has arrived. Um, now, this is a very, very large flood we're actually dealing with. So they'll admit it's a flood, but what you won't ever find somebody willing to do, and this is partially the fault of the academic system, is to get them to say, well, how big was this flood, if it really was a flood? And you'll find that the flood covered pretty much all the world, if uh, all the earth, if not all the earth, just from the Carboniferous rocks. Add on to it the Jurassic rocks that go around the world, the Cretaceous rocks that go all around the world, and so on and so forth, and you've got a pretty clear evidence of a global flood. That's a great answer, Joe. Um, I was just pointing out that again, that answer on polystrate trees could be a uh, separate clip, 
um, for the channel and, and just kind of end old earth creation for good. So mm. uh, one, uh, one project we've got in the works and I say it's in the works. I don't really mean that. I mean, it's sort of dreamland over there is to actually produce a, uh, our, our next major documentary. Um, we want to be on polystrate trees. I mean, creation research has been investigating polystrate trees for the last sort of 35 to 40 years. Um, and now I'm on board and taking that further. Right. And we found brand new ones in the UK and so on and so forth so it'd be nice to film in australia in the new zealand in the uk in europe in america in canada right there are all these alaska all these polystrate trees all over the world and they are absolutely fabulous so um if you get behind us and support us and pay for our airfare we may be able to do that so uh, keep watching this space that would be awesome. That would be awesome. And and such an important answer that, that you just gave, Joe. Uh, such a, an awesome line of evidence for the Young Earth Creation Global Flood position. And to kind of just point out that all of their explanations are what we like to call rescue devices really shows yeah. how, how strong the Young Earth Creation position is. Um, okay. So that being said, Matt, uh, go ahead, brother. Uh, pick the next question. Sure. This one will be for both of you. So you can take your time or each answer it differently if you like. doesn't really matter. But... Uh, I don't see a name for it, but it just says, I'm curious to think, uh, was the Great Pyramid in Egypt built before or after the flood? Okay. Um, Do you want to give a shot at that, Sam, and then I'll... I'll, 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 give, I'll give it a go, but you're just going to outdo me, so it's Probably, it's but that's why I'm going to first. So initially, I, I would say it would be after, um, simply because of if you're looking at the Tower of Babel, uh, the distribution of the uh, different um, people across the earth when God scrambled the language to make people it, unable to stay in one place. Uh, you have different cultures forming across the world. Uh, they would spread and obviously flood legends would arrive and different creation myths and gods, goddesses, etc., etc., etc. And very quickly things would get very, very out of hand um, because people wouldn't be able to even comprehend um, how much... I mean, that's why I like to think about the Egyptians anyway, is that everything just got so complicated, they eventually had to write it down. Um, because if you're looking at a, a book of ancient Egyptian mythology, uh, it's probably about that thick. Um, there's so many different things of, you know, you've got Set and Nun and, you know, Anubis, all kinds of things. Um, and they have got different, you know, laws about, well, traditions about burying the dead and things like that fantastic pioneers of technology don't get me wrong i mean this was a very advanced people and you see that all across the world you've got you know you've got the uh, pyramids in um in america that well sort of they're sort of pyramids not the same sort of type as you'd find in egypt but still very very impressive buildings by some very early civilizations which would indicate that intelligence would be much higher back then um and pyramids i would say would again would be a response to their beliefs but also it's uh it is proving that they are a more advanced race uh of people compared to others um so yeah that's my take on it but i would say definitely after the flood you're muted Joe, you're muted. Yeah, yeah, I just realized that. Um, Sam's given an archaeologist perspective, and we actually have a rather beautiful mummy mask here in our museum collection. It's uh, really rather spectacular. And it's these artifacts like this that actually do help us get that biblical perspective on things like um, the pyramids and when they formed and... Uh, and everything else right um but to give you a geologist's perspective particularly if we're talking about noah's flood and when the great pyramid formed you have to ask what is the great pyramid made from the answer is very large limestone blocks right and okay what is limestone made of well it's done plenty of stuff with limestone on standing for truth before right but limestone is is, is made out of calcium carbonate uh, which is a mineral okay where does that calcium carbonate come from it comes from one or two places it's either a chemical reaction so we call it a chemical limestone in which case it's devoid of fossils and organic stuff um, or it's uh, directly derived from fossils right it's from little shells whether it's large shells or coccolithophores as we call them um which are little tiny planktonic shells, it is essentially a fossil rock. So it is a massive uh, 
fossil in a sense, the Great Pyramid, right? Because all of the source of limestone which they got from the local region is all what we would call fossiliferous limestone. Uh, it's from the phosphates, and then the phosphate beds run all the way along the top of Africa and up into the uh, sort of Middle Eastern area. In fact, some of uh, Sam's fossils, the um, Spinosaurus dinosaur tooth, was from the Moroccan phosphate beds, right? Uh, so it's all this very, very large Cretaceous limestone deposits. Now, by that definition alone, it's a global deposit, therefore it's a worldwide flood, right? It's this very, very, very large limestone deposit, and it's full of all mixture and manner of different things, including plants. It's a big old mess. And so by that definition, the rocks which make up the uh, bricks, which make up the pyramids are flood deposited rocks. So yes, from geology, as well as from the indications that you can get from history, because pyramids are fascinating. They go all over the world, right? We've got a whole program which we're putting together on uh, archaeology and history and sort of archaeology of the Bible, which would be good to do on Standing for Truth one day. But um, it's uh, it really does uh, make the, the point, yes, the uh, Great Pyramid is certainly a po not only a post-flood, but a post-Babel event as well. Awesome answers from the both of you, Sam and Joe. Uh, the chat's loving this. We are now over 70 people uh, who are really um, giving you guys some some good Great feedback stuff. and compliments. Fantastic. So I, appreciate, I appreciate that. So, Matt. Probably the highest uh, amount of people I've ever had watch me at one time on the internet. So, <laughs> new record for me. I'll You're doing it. well. And, and I let everybody know that when the show's over, you will be signing autographs, especially oh, okay. because you used to be a big time movie star. Uh, given your, uh, well, I'll, I'll stop well. it. I'll stop it. <laughs> uh, Matt, you're doing a great job uh, picking out the good questions. So I'll let you pick out the next one as well. All right. We're going to jump back to an earlier question. And it is uh, skeptics on oldearth.org have asserted that if you believe in a young earth global flood model, you would expect all rocks to show evidence of a cataclysmic origin, but they don't. They say that most rocks give evidence of slow, gradual deposition. What is the best way to respond to this? Okay, I can jump in here if you want, give my initial thoughts. Go for it. Okay, so uh, first of all, I, I point to one of my slides saying polystrate trees. Those take a very short amount. They need a short amount of time to form uh, just simply because of the origin of them. They just simply cannot form slowly because you would just get, again, a tiny sliver of wood um, fossilized in the actual strata themselves. And again, going back to the, the fossils themselves, I mean, you've got the jellyfish there that was formed incredibly quickly. You have a lot of pressure pressing down on that specimen in order to create that imprint. Um, and as well, I mean, I know that um, Diane Eager is uh, our... Um, uh, uh, biomed biomedical um, biologist thing. I never remember her whole title. Sorry, Diane. Um, but um, she has done uh, experiments with uh, fossil ink, which is very interesting. And they found fossilized ink from a squid, taken it into the lab, and we've actually managed to write with fossil ink. Interesting. So you look all across the fossil record, you're seeing all of these fossil specimens and these polystrate trees that again have had their roots ripped off. They've got no branches, basically no bark, and they are they are lying vertically. Now, Creation Research has actually done some investigation into this. We've done a, a little experiment, taken a whole bunch of sticks and dumped them in a big sort of pot of water. And we've observed what's happened. Now, something very interesting happens. Some fall horizontally, so they just sink down as they become waterlogged. But something very interesting happens. What happens is that one end of some of them will become waterlogged. Now, this in turn will turn the stick vertical, and it will slowly sink down like that. And it will land vertically or at a slight angle, which shows how polystrate trees form is again it's a small scale but you can scale that up because it's again it's the same materials and it's the same water you know it's h2o <laughs> it's wet you know water is wet everyone newsflash um but you know you, you you've got to look at certain things in the fossil record and go hang on how did this form and again you've got dinosaurs that have drowned you've got living fossils as well that are perfectly preserved 
and you've got feathers being preserved as well. These are cataclysmic events. These are incredibly rapid burial events. And you've got rocks that bend as well. We didn't put this in the presentation, but you can you can search online where you've got strata that actually curve round. Interesting, because rocks shouldn't curve. So that should have formed when the rock was soft or the sedimental deposit, whatever you want to call it, was soft. That should have formed at that point and is then hardened into that position. You take a rock, you can't go, ooh, no, can't do that. It'll just go because it's hard and brittle. If you're looking at a strata, you're looking at hard rock. You've got, you know, limestone, you've got sandstone, you've got, you know, you've even got, uh, you know, even harder types of rock. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to sort of scourge my mind for all the different names and I'm, I, for some reason, I'm thinking of <laughs> Minecraft. Um, but um, uh, you've got, uh, yeah, bedrock. That's the one I'm looking, bedrock. There you go. Incredibly hard rock. Um, but you've, you've got to realize that you look across the entire world, you're seeing these entirely huge deposits, all deposited at one time. These, these don't form uh, multiple different millions of years. Uh, for instance, you know, you take a scientist, you look, take him to a polystrate tree, and you take him to the same rock deposit 100 miles away. They don't see a polystrate tree. You ask them, okay, so which one's which? You know, is it millions of years or is it, you know, was it formed rapidly? Now, the scientist who's looking at the polystrate tree will go, oh, okay, well, I mean, there's a fossilized tree in the middle of it, so... Yeah, so that must be must have formed rapidly in order for that to have been fossilized. Otherwise, it would have rotted away. And then the other scientists will go, oh, no, these are several billions of years, millions of years, because they don't see a fairly straight tree, but they're the same exact formation. Your worldview dictates what you believe. And it's very interesting to see just how far of a reach that's gotten into our society when you're talking about a an issue of old earth and newer and young earth mm. cataclysmic you know events you've got all of these things that are perfectly preserved in the fossil record and it, again you've got things that were preserved very quickly like for instance dinosaur bones that have got soft malleable tissue inside that doesn't form from a long time ago and again another issue with old earth creationism is the issue of sin where does sin come from? Where does it fit in? God created everything very good. Now, there would be no s death and destruction, but that's what we see all throughout the fossil record is death. That's literally what it is. It's death of something. It's been preserved. So where does sin fit into all of that? I, I've i never really gotten a very valuable answer. So I'll hand over to Joe because I've, I've had my two cents on that one. Okay. Um... If you want to talk about how do you find the, I mean, we did a whole program, right, called How Do You Recognize Flood Deposits? Um, and you can use a whole number of things. You can go onto our YouTube channel and find it. It was a, a fairly recent one. I say recent, it was this year uh, that I did for Answers in Genesis, another big organization. Um, and they had a big, uh, a big conference, right? And we did stuff for them. What we looked in is what evidence are you specifically looking for if you're looking for evidence that the, a flood uh, laid down these deposits? And then we looked to scale it up to a global flood scenario right and uh, i'll use the example of uh, the research paper the first ever research paper which i did right which was published through the university that i was doing at the time which looked at hans stanton hans stanton's a fairly small little deposit right it's chalk it's part of the uh, upper cretaceous uh, in norfolk in the uk it's sort of tucked out of the way but it's part of the global chalk deposits right and we looked in particular at one formation in it called the hunstanton formation which is a red chalk formation to look at the fossils in there to ask were these fossils buried in a shallow marine environment that slowly settled over hundreds if not thousands of years in fact it was over 1.2 million years uh, if you want to go by the secular dates or was it formed very quickly now, the way you can tell some indications of this include, do fossils have evidence of transportation? Now, transportation means that fossils were moved into place and didn't live, die, slowly settle and get buried there. Right Now, what is some evidence of transportation? Elongated fossils will be pointing the same way. So belemnites, which are squid, long squid-like creatures, if you find them all pointing the same way, the same as with trees, right? 
tree, trees, you have a few of them standing up, but at the base you have a mass amount of trees, which is a big log jam, all pointing more or less in the same direction, right? So you find balamnites that all point the same way. You find brachiopods and seashells that have been ripped up and turned upside down. Now they sit in one way in the rock, so when they die, they should literally just fall down at the sea floor, uh, the way up that they were living more or less. Uh, these are not, they are all without fail turned upside down. And you also have wood mixed up in there as well. So the fact that you've got evidence of transportation, these fossils have been washed into place. This is not a slow settling environment. They've been washed into place. You have got mixed environments, right? Because you have wood and sea creatures buried next to each other. And you also have got fossils which have been tipped up and turned upside down indicates that it's been a fairly rapidly moving water that's actually washed these into place. So there are a number of evidences that you can look to see how has this actually been formed? And when you scale it up to a worldwide scale, that's when you get, hang on a minute, these are worldwide deposits, right? Now, if you want the perspective of somebody who was an atheist, um, you can actually stream on our streaming site, creationresearchlive.com, right? We have all of our content on there. That's not free. That's on YouTube. Uh, you pay a small thing to just uh, stream it. You don't even have to download anything, right? Uh, you just stream it straight off the internet. There's a fascinating thing on there called Flood or Folly by Dr. Ron Nella. Now, Ron was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. He didn't believe in anything to do with God, right? But he came across evidence of a massive flood working as a geomorphologist in China. And he said, hang on a minute, the evidence from the fossils, the evidence from the deposits, the evidence that I can see working as a geomorphologist shows that this had to have been a really big flood. In fact, it had to be a flood on a worldwide scale. And so when he tried to actually publish this, he was completely knocked out of the park. You can't publish any reference to anything of a worldwide flood. But why not? The evidence is pointing that way. And he kept pushing it and he kept pushing it as an atheist, right? To the point that he was actually told, look, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to essentially let you go. We're going to have to lose your job over this, right? Because he kept pushing this thing, which did not fit in the secular paradigm. And uh, feeling rather dejected, he then left his university, not knowing why he had really been let go. And it wasn't until a friend opened up the Bible, held it under his nose and said, there's your flood, that he actually realized why uh, this was so controversial and he actually became a Christian through that but it was interesting that he recognized the evidence of a worldwide flood coming from a purely secular atheistic background uh, and the evidence really is there, but it requires you to think outside the box, particularly the box that Charles Lyell put all of science in when he set out to destroy the Bible and to remove scripture from people's thinking. His entire aim, he openly admitted, was to remove science from the Bible, or remove the Bible from science, rather, remove uh, free science from Moses was his exact quote. Uh, he wanted to get rid of of the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, the creation, Noah's flood, the Tower of Babel, and the law of God. It was a specifically anti-Christian agenda, and he went out there to remove that. He put all of scientific thinking into a single box, which was labeled, the present is the key to the past. And as a result, you have to actually step away from that philosophical assumption, that ideology, to actually look around the world that you've been given and say, hang on a minute, where does the evidence actually lead you? Um, so go and watch how to recognize a flood deposit. That goes into a lot more depth than we can do here. But the little example that I used at Hans Stanton can be applied just about anywhere in the world. And you'll find that the evidence clearly shows it is a rapid global water-based deposit. Wow. Awesome answers uh, from the both of you. Incredibly thorough. I appreciate that. Just fascinating information. Um, Okay, this next one comes in the form of a super chat from uh, Sentinel Apologetics. I appreciate the uh, super chat and the support, Rob. So his question is, if global, why pre-flood geography in Genesis 2 that Solomon referenced to build his temple? He puts uh, 1 Kings 9 to 10. Why did David say that day one conditions, the water world, will never again or will never occur again pre-flood. And then he, he puts uh, Psalms 104. Mm -hmm. I can I can tell that Joe's getting really serious now because he sighed and opened his Bible. <laughs> <laughs> it's on now. It's, it's on. Uh, um, I mean, I, I, I can probably give a brief glimpse here. Um, I'd say for the second question here um so that day one conditions water will never occur again pre-flood um 
I'd simply state that that's just how the world was as it as it was when God created started to create you know do the do the days of, of, of Genesis so it will never return to that form I think is probably what he's trying to get at I could be wrong I could be just spouting a whole load of fooey but I'll let I'll let Joe sort of um he's he's the more sort of learned scholar in the room <laughs> Okay, if you go to our uh, website and click on the Q and A, right, um, and you uh, type in Psalm 104 or something like that, right, uh, you will find there is a very, very long and very, very detailed talk about Psalm 104 because it's a fascinating chapter in the Bible, right? Your first problem is the reference to David. There, we don't actually know who the author of Psalm 104 was. I've heard all sorts of different things from Shem himself all the way up to uh, Moses and Noah and david and all sorts of stuff but the reality is we don't actually know it doesn't really matter though who wrote it um it's here in scripture but what you will find is if you uh, go through uh, psalm 104 you will find that the author is covering different points of time uh he's looking at things from the past he's looking at things from the present and he's clearly indicating there are different times in which he's talking about right he starts off in verses one down to uh, two about who god is and what god is like he then deals from chapter three uh down through chapter five to the beginning of chapter six to to um about the, the the day one of creation right uh, the creation of all things when the earth was covered in water and then it caused god caused the land to come out of the water to the water to flood off the land and so on and so forth but he then switches to talking about the flood um noah's flood how do you know well you can actually look at the hebrew word with words within there which is only ever used in context to the flood it's used once other time in in in, in psalms which is the word marbul right it's the only other time it's used in the hebrew is back in uh, genesis uh, chapter six when it's talking about the flood that is over the earth right so you'll find there's a clear connection between what um uh, the, the author of Psalm 104 is doing, he's comparing day one to the flood. Uh, you end up having the waters which rise out of the waters, and then it says here, God covered them over again. The water stood above the mountains. And that's a direct reference to Genesis, where it says that the waters cover the mountains uh, above 20 cubits, right? With cubit being sort of the length of your elbow to the tips of your fingers. At your rebuke, they fled. At the voice of your thunder, they hastened away. They went up over the mountains, down into the valleys, to the place where you were founded of them. You have set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the earth. Now, this is one of the biggest evidences you can tell that it's now talking about the flood because scripture cannot be inconsistent, right? Now, if you want to talk about what the earth means or what the flood means, we've used that word marbul, right? There's two other words to talk about in Genesis uh, where it talks about the flood. But also in the Psalms, it says that God sits a king over the marbul. God sits king over the flood. Now, the flood is clearly referring to the flood in Genesis because it uses that word marble. It's the only other place in the Bible where it talks about it. So if you're wanting to argue that it's a local flood, you're saying that God sits as king over only a very small area on the planet. Now, that's inconsistent. If you want to look at when it talks about the uh, flood covered all of the earth in uh, Genesis 6, 7, 8 and 9, right? Um, you will find that when it's talking about the flood covering all of the earth, that word earth can certainly be used in a local context uh, there's no doubt about it but to throw some statistics out at you uh, nearly 90 percent of the times that that hebrew word for earth is used it's always used in a global context the 10 percent of the times or just over 10 percent of the times that it's used in a local context you can clearly tell the difference because of the context the context surrounding your reading of the portion of scripture now when you're looking in um genesis how do we know one of the reasons that it's a global in uh, in extent well aside from the fact that it makes sense in a global in a global sense right because from what we're reading in genesis it talks about it rising over the mountains now you know how water works always goes to the lowest point right in order to rise 20 cubits above the mountains uh, above all the mountains even the highest mountains it says this has to be a global flood and extent so it makes sense from context from scripture it makes 
sense talking about who God actually is. He is the king over the flood, not just the king over a small little local place. And you can also get that evidence in Psalm 104 about how the author is comparing day one to the rebirth of the earth after the flood. Right? There's definitely a comparison being made there. And he goes on to talk about how great God is as a creator and so on and so forth. Right, So when you're dealing with uh, post plus well, pre and post flood geology and geography, you've got to remember one thing the person who was compiling these books, particularly Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers and Deuteronomy, was Moses, who was writing from a post flood perspective. All right now, that's key in actually bearing in mind when you're talking about these references in Two Kings and everything else. But you can clearly see from the context that we're talking about a global flood in context. Um, to argue otherwise is not only just to say, well, we are going to ignore all of the context and the 90% of other times when the word means global or means the whole earth, but you're also questioning who God actually is by saying, well, God is not the king over all of the earth. He's the king over a very small portion of the earth, right? So you've got to be very, very careful uh, when you're actually doing that. Again, thank you so much. That's a great answer. Uh, it's, it's a great question, and it's a question that's uh, put forth and a challenge put forth uh, a lot lately. Uh, you know, Matt can attest to that from the local flood proponent. So I appreciate such a a detailed answer. Has, a, uh, yeah. has John did John do a, a session on Psalm 104 a little while back with you guys? He did. Something in my he head did. is telling me that. Yeah, because that would be good to go. Um, yeah, well, so if we if we hadn't done it, it'd be good to do a special program on that and go into a lot more depth. But mm. um, yeah, go back and watch John. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. That was, I think, a month ago. Uh, he was here. Great presentation. Yeah. And we had a good audience Q&A. So Great I stuff. recommend people check that out. Um, so a follow up super chat. I do want to make sure I get to the super chats. Um, actually, if I could request the audience, you know, at, at this point, uh, you know, any more uh, questions, we're just not going to be able to get to. So um, anyway, can I just make a quick suggestion then, Bonnie, course, if there's yeah, lots yeah. and lots of other questions, um, if it wouldn't be too much work for you to kind of compile a list of them and send them across to us. One of the things that we like to do with Creation Conversations, our program on our YouTube is to have questions and answers, right? We deal with a big topic, uh, usually once a week or a little bit shorter some weeks, but we like to have good questions and we go through our previous programs mm. and get all the questions out. So if you're able to send the questions through to us, one of the things that we can do is we can bring them up in our Creation Conversations program and uh, and get either myself, Sam, or John, who's always there, to actually uh, uh, you know, have a go at some of these some of these questions and programs. So just yeah. a suggestion. I love it. I love it. That's a great uh, great idea. Great suggestion uh, because we'll do this follow up from uh, Sentinel Apologetics. Sure. He's, he's done a few more follow ups, but what I'll do, uh, Sentinel Apologetics, I appreciate all the support and the good questions. I'll save your next few follow ups um, and, and I'll, I'll hand them over through email to uh, the creation research team. So uh, we will do this one, though, at least from Rob. I appreciate it. He says if the Bible did demonstrate a local flood. So I guess we could go over if it does or not. Would all these anecdotal evidences for a global flood demonstrate a faulty scientific interpretation? All right. Well, I'll I'll just jump in very very briefly on this. Um, the question is 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 slightly redundant because we've already discussed the sort of the um, uh, evidence from scripture of a global flood, and I say we can go into a lot lot more detail than that. Um, if the Bible did demonstrate a local flood, then you would find that what we see in God's world is actually at conflict with what we read about um, in the scripture. Now, you will find that the original geological um, proponents who started, they hadn't quite got to Lyell's point of completely rejecting scripture, but they were certainly trying to fit the idea of long ages into the flood. And so they argued that the flood was either local in extent, or they argued that the flood was extremely calm in extent. And then they argued that there was a massive gap between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, during which time God created all animals. They fell because that was the time that Lucifer fell and became Satan. As a result, God sent a flood which just destroyed all of the um all of the 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 world right buried all of the fossils then god recreated again and noah's flood was only very small and local in extent right so you'll find that you're instantly bringing extra 
biblical uh, issues into the Bible in order to try and explain science from a perspective which goes against scripture, right? So that's what you'll end up doing if you take this question sort of um, literally, so to speak, or if you do believe in a local flood, but still want to believe in, um, you know, uh, 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 or if the scripture did indicate a global, uh, a local flood, and you want to try and explain how the evidence shows a global flood, these are some of the problems you'll run into. But just going on the point, because you did say in the question, if the Bible did What's the um, what are the implications or what are the consequences rather for modern science? Would it show a flaw in modern scientific thinking? Well, I think regardless of whether um, the flood indicated local or global, you've still got an indication of a problem with modern scientific thinking, and that goes back to that assumption which Charles Lyell makes, right? And he made and he ended up influencing not only the church but most of the public, including the scientific field, which is this philosophy of uniformitarianism: the present is the key to the past. Now, not only is that completely the opposite of what Scripture says, it is an ideology, it is a philosophy, and if you use that as your basis for interpreting the world and geology around you then you are always going to come up with a concept of millions of years deep time and evolution every single time you apply it to the world because that's simply the logical conclusion out of it however recognize it's based on a philosophy and not actually based on any evidence at all and we have our whole program on lyle and everything else and you can find it probably done it on standing for truth before and it's on our youtube and so on and so forth right so go and investigate a little bit more with that but uh, yes, I do believe there is, you know, aside of what the Bible indicates, I do believe there is a serious flaw in modern scientific thinking, and it's all centres around that philosophy which Lyell introduced, which was an anti anti biblical philosophy, and it's something that's affected all of science even now. To our academic, uh, the way that we run academia today has uh, major problems as a result of it. Yeah, what he said. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Joe, as, as we always say here, you are a, a walking encyclopedia. So, so much uh, great information and, and important information. Um, actually, Matt, if you wanted to unmute yourself, did you want to get that that super chat that just came in a couple minutes ago? Yes, I am just pulling it up now. Okay. We know who wrote it from the um, LXX. Oh, so the Septuagint and the DFS. Yeah. Uh, P R uh, four P uh, Q P uh, Psalm and uh, eleven Q P S A. It is the Masoretic text that lacks David. Uh, it is the uh, Palmic against the Egyptian uh, at ten creation hymn. Okay, um, for those uh, in the in who are watching this who don't know what all these different letters mean, these is a it's a controversial issue um, around what is the most reliable portion of scripture. What are the most reliable uh, original uh, versions and original transcripts of scripture? You've got the uh, Septuagint to all these different things and the Masoretic text and all these kind of different words, right? Um, we do not have enough time. <laughs> to go into all of this right now we will be here for many many hours in fact it might be interesting to do a program just on 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 these kind of bible translations and the original um written and stuff and i think that'd be a good one to get john involved in as well um because something that uh, somebody encouraged John many many years back was to learn a little bit of Hebrew and that's what he's kind of also passed on to me and so um, we, we, we know a little thing or two about these different backgrounds right um, it's 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 interesting I'm assuming he is referencing uh, Psalm 104 with who is the author and David and all this there's all sorts of controversy surrounding that um, personally I think it is likely to be David um, myself personally for a number of, of, of these reasons However, I would not go as far as to say we don't know. Uh, as, as far as to say we do know sorry um, I would still say there's enough controversy and issues because it's not just as straightforward as saying well here this says this therefore that's it right um, there's a reason why the Septuagint wasn't included now you can argue that it's to do with um, the sort of the history and the philosophy and the people who are actually writing or interpreting scripture particularly the authorised version right because you'll find if you read your authorised version or your King James Bible there's a difference between the scripture which is written in the Old Testament and the scripture which is written in the New Testament because they're quoting from different sources, right? So there's an interesting, very, very interesting history to this in 
In fact, we um, got asked a similar question to do with the King James Version versus the Septuagint versus so on and so forth. And we were planning on doing a whole program for Creation Conversation. So maybe we'll do that one day. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't personally, I don't think you can go as far as to say we know it's David. Um, but at the same time, I suspect that to be the case uh, for, for, for a number of reasons. But we just simply don't get don't have the time to delve into all of the, the history and the background of it. Unless you know any more, Sam what you said no. I, 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 I mean to be honest it just sounded like you were just going through the alphabet at the start so yeah, I was, I was so, just, yeah. Um, do we have any other questions from any other super chats or any other people Nice yeah, well, you know what? We do have, yes, we've got over a dozen questions left, Good. which is why Good. I'm just going to kind of wrap it because, you know, I want to be cognizant of, of your guys' time and I really appreciate your time. We are going on, you know, the two hour and 15 minute mark. So that being said, let's wrap it up with one or two more questions. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of them I'll send to you guys through email. That's fine. And, uh, you know, a couple of them might spark some interest in terms of future shows. So, mm -hmm. um, Jim P, this one came in a, a while ago. So, uh, Jim, I do appreciate your question. He asks, why don't we find many fossils below the Cambrian? Um, okay. Um, simply because I would suggest that the Archean and Proterozoic Pro um, rock layers were basically what you know Noah and the inhabitants of Earth would be walking on at that time. Um, and then obviously the floodwaters come sweeping all kinds of sediment and sand and mud silt bits of tree everything you know from the ocean floor up was being carried with the currents to form these different rock layers which are then burying themselves burying all these creatures in with themselves to form these different layers now if you take different types of sand and and what have you you form different layers even if you you know shake them up in a jar because different types of sand silt mud etc have different uh weights they all carry through water differently some will fall quicker than others which is why some for some again you find I would probably theorize that such a thing is like you that's why you find marine life and things like that at the bottom because these are already creatures who have been swept along with the flood flood waters all of these other creatures will have been knocked off their feet like dinosaurs and you know uh, all you know all kinds of creatures trees whatever have been knocked off their feet and carried with the flood water and obviously they've died now some most likely would have started being sort of mid floats or being carried with the current which is why you see sort of bigger animals maybe bearing being buried slightly higher in the rock layers i mean this is just one of my theories anyway um joe will probably berate me for saying that but um uh i would i most likely suggest that simply because the the, the further down the rock layers you'll go the, the further back in time towards the beginning of the flood you're going so you're you're getting all these marine creatures being washed into place being buried very rapidly and then you're getting all of these creatures land creatures again still you've got still got marine creatures being in there because again you've still got all these floodwaters constantly coming in from both the fountain of the great deep and also you've got water coming down from on top so you you've also got flooding on you know high hills or possibly mountains or whatever in this pre-flood world being, you know, you've heard of flash floods and things like that. You know, these are incredibly powerful torrents of water, rip trees up. And again, you see the same exact thing, even through Mount St. Helens and stuff like that. You see all of these trees being like a polystrate tree, no roots, no twigs, no branches, hardly any bark, completely stripped off. And it's only in a short amount of time. Water is incredibly powerful and a lot of people underestimate it. And unfortunately so, because so many people die in flash floods a year. Um, you got water coming from both directions. So a lot of people just think it's coming from one direction. You've actually got water coming from above as well. So you've got creatures being washed that way. You know, you, you, this is a, a huge cataclysmic event because you've got the fountains of the great deep, which is the, the, you know, the floods of the ocean coming in, which is bringing all the marine creatures, the sea creatures. But then you've also got the, you know, the, the sky it's raining so tremendously. You probably wouldn't be able to see your hand in front of your face. It was that heavy, you know, and you've got all of this water flowing down from the mountains, you know, carving these paths and things like that, these guides to get down into this chasm of, you know, you know you know with slur of like fresh water and salt water you've got you know 
again which is why you have you know land plants and marine creatures being buried together you've got these two mixes of uh, th th you know um uh you know different land and sea creatures being mixed together from different types of water uh and again we saw at the beginning of this of the slideshow uh, you know that um uh, looking at that sort of you know that more local flood but again you've got sea and land creatures being buried together again a similar thing but you scale it up on a massive scale you've got these you know f fantastic flood deposits that stretch across entire continents let alone you know states or countries you know continents of you know of de depositation you know um so that's that would be my answer is just simply because you know you've got that's when the destruction starts is the, all those the rock layers beforehand is simply just what was being walked on again there was no need for all these layers because there was no cataclysmic flood beforehand all right. Prepare to be berated, Sam. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you did it. No, it's it a good job. I, I would like to point out point out one thing, right? Because what you okay. did, you fell into the same trap that I fall into over and over again, and many other people fall into, right? You used two examples. The first one, you used the example of the glass of water where you put rocks and sand and silt and shake it up and let it settle, right? And then later on, you said, oh, but you know, the way that water moves and flows, you've got waters coming from this direction and that direction and down from the top and so on and so forth, right? Uh, what you're actually talking about are two completely different versions of the way that rocks form now your glass of water is great because you fill it up with water you shake it up so all the sediment is suspended and then you let it all settle now that would work brilliant if the earth was a glass of water but it's not right and it's this philosophy of the bottom layer got there first then the next layer then the next layer then the next layer which is was introduced uh, originally by nicholas stino who believed in creation and the flood in the bible but was hijacked by charles lyell to then argue well if the bottom got there first and the top got there last and the bottom's the oldest the top's the youngest therefore you've got a history of time right when the reality is if you actually look at the way that rocks form first of all you've got to get the sediment so you need erosion secondly you need to carry the sediment into place so you need a movement and thirdly you need to actually deposit it so you need to have something that is going to force those sediments to actually push down and you find both the force the movement and the erosion is all explained by moving water. Currents and water, which is moving in one direction at different speeds, carrying different types of uh, rock sediment, sediment and dumping it down, right? So that's your first point. And what you will find is this question of the Cambrian all the way up through to the Quaternary and so on and so forth. The standard geological model, which you used earlier in your talk, Sam, is based off of this assumption that the bottom got there first, the top got there last. And over the last sort of 250 years, it has been completely fabricated using this philosophy and therefore has been built using a secular deep time uh, point of view. Right, the bottom got there first and is therefore the oldest, the top got there last and is therefore the youngest. Whereas the reality is rocks don't form bottom to top, they actually form left to right, they form sideways as you have streams of water flowing. Now we've done loads of presentations, you can go on our YouTube channel and see our uh, strata experiments, some real fascinating stuff that is going on here, right? Um, but what you will find when you're talking about things like the Cambrian versus the posts, um, uh, the sort of the uh, the, the Cambrian up through Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, and so on and so forth. You did hit the nail on the head there, Sam, right at the beginning. I do also believe that the rocks, the base rocks, um, underneath what is known as the Great Unconformity, so the Precambrian rocks, are the original pre-flood rocks the rocks that had formed during day one uh, day three sorry of creation when god caused the waters to be gathered into one place let the dry land appear as the water as the land rises up out of the water and as the water rushes off the land incredible amounts of erosion and you end up with layer upon layer upon layer right as the water is flowing sideways rushing off of the land then you have creation garden of eden um you know adam and eve all the way down to noah and then the earth gets ripped open and you have a massive amount of more erosion including mixing up all the fossils dumping them down from sideways different ecosystems being buried in different places so on and so forth and you end up with a formation which we now know as flood rocks and then you have the ice age and so on and so forth after the flood which produces the post flood rocks but hey we're getting ahead of ourselves that's my topic for next time we're on standing for truth right so uh, you've you've got most of it right there sam but uh, a warning to you nicely 
and to everybody else who uh, interprets rocks from this bottom to top sequence, it simply doesn't work in the real world. Um, so that's something you've really got to be careful of. Well, all I can say is oops. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, great work. Great job, guys. You uh, you guys are awesome and a blessing. So what we're going to do is I'm going to pick out one last question of all these questions we have. I'm going to send you the rest of them through email. Uh, there are some interesting ones, uh, so definitely I'm sure you'll have fun looking through them. But this last one is a question that came in again near the beginning. So, uh, you know, out of respect, I do want to get to it. Mm -hmm. and, but now I think I might have. Oh, here it is. Okay. Uh, question from Second Best Bob. If the flood did actually happen, how did all the trees and plants survive? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, That's a good question. My, my, fir my first point is what happened to first best Bob? Why just second best? <laughs> you know, why, you, why, why just call yourself, you know, best Bob? Come on. You know, <laughs> we love you, man. Come on. Anyway, I, I kid, I kid. Um, so you're looking at plants and seeds and things like that surviving the floods okay so you can actually get a surprisingly amount of um of seeds and uh again a, a plant life and things like that that can actually survive it, you know sort of it, i would assume some form of hibernation within water or you know in soil or whatever i'm probably wrong again probably gonna get berated again um but that's fine um uh, but also remember as well that um noah took you know you look back at the at the account it says take food and seeds and all kinds of things onto the ark with you i mean this is you know this is this is not just a you know a, this is not a you know zoological perspective this is literally saving life this is a ark this is you know what what it is you know you've got the the whole issue here is that people assume that oh you know especially secularists you know you know oh, you know oh you've got you know eight zookeepers and you know da, 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 da. no they weren't zookeepers they were just humans who were just keeping everything alive as long as possible to ensure that they could repopulate the earth you know we're not talking you know, i mean I'm, I'm sure they were incredibly skilled at what they did i mean obviously because noah built the massive ark um but i mean we're, talk we're not talking about people who you know like Joe, who spent you know many years of their lives actually you know learning and actually looking after animals for a living, you know most likely you know Noah could have possibly been a some form of carpenter, a very skilled carpenter, or you know been in that trade or whatever. Um, we simply just don't know. Um, so all of that is speculation. But when you're looking at you know that's what the ark was there for is to preserve and sustain life after the flood um and seeds sometimes will float onto the surface you know you get some which have a low um uh low uh well low low density um and the actual water tension will actually cause it to float um obviously as plants break down and the um you know in the flood waters um is you know you get some which would float on top you know they wouldn't get fossilized they just rot away on top i mean it's same again you know you probably have that's probably how birds would survive would be feasting they'd be constantly flying and landing on you know bodies and you know bits of wood and stuff like that as long as they could before they couldn't fly anymore and eventually died you know falling into the ocean getting washed you know washed away um but these pl plants would be floating on top and you know they break down the seeds would come out and float on the top and then obviously as the flood waters come down they just rest upon the, upon the top soil or top dirt or whatever you know and would nestle there um i mean you can look at some forms of modern plants and they do survive underwater for a long period of time i mean you know grass is pretty tough stuff you can't really get rid of grass uh, because the seeds are so minuscule and minute um uh but the thing is with um with most seeds they are quite large so again it's it's this is where the art sort of comes in to try and save the planet is to you know repopulate the earth with tree seeds and you know all kinds of you know food and grasses and everything reeds everything 
I'll be if my I can answer. just uh, just jump in there quickly, Sam. Um, okay, what does Noah get told to take aboard the Ark? Now, it's a perfectly reasonable explanation that he took aboard seeds and stuff, particularly for farming afterwards. I mean, we know that Noah became a farmer afterwards because he grew grapes. So it stands to reason that he brought his prized grape seeds along with him, right, in order to grow them. Uh, and you find agriculture is there pretty much straight away after the flood. So it would stand to reason that in order to help humans survive, they took agriculture with them, right, in order to, to, to help. Of course, that doesn't really explain how, I mean, Noah himself didn't wander over to, uh, you know, Australia or America or whatever to plant your yeah, pine trees and seeds and all this kind of stuff. Okay, what did Noah get told to take aboard the ark? Or rather, what did God send Noah to take him uh, to take aboard the ark? Two of every land-dwelling, air-breathing animal, seven of every land-dwelling, air-breathing, clean animal, and two of every bird or flying creature right um and uh, and of creeping things and stuff as well right okay so no sea creatures that's the first one and also specifically not any plants why well both sea creatures and plants are both very very good at surviving in water right in fact many seeds almost seem designed to actually cope with vast quantities of water in order to be able to survive we have a, a great um sea bean it's absolutely massive in uh, in our museum collection but the individual pods break off and they slowly rot over a number of months as they float along and uh, the sea bean ends up being washed out and washes ashore where it can grow i uh, know these can survive for so long and uh for such sort of massive um uh, you know, currents and stuff. These grow in the Amazon, right? And they fall off into the Amazon River and they can actually float out to sea, hit the Gulf Stream and end up on our beaches in Scotland, right? And some of them even come all the way over the top of Scotland and end up on the beaches of my native Norfolk. Right? So these can actually travel a very, very long way and cope absolutely fine. In fact, they actually need to be in the water for a number of months to actually be able to grow. And if you just buy the seed straight out and you want to ha have to help them to germinate, you need to soak them uh, for quite a long period of time before that coconut is another example coco de mer uh, the largest nut in the world is another example these are all designed to flight but what you'll also find is seeds can actually survive an incredibly long time you can go and get grain right out of the uh, uh, ancient egyptian um uh, pyramids and tombs and stuff and can sow it and it grows they do remarkably well at growing and they do remarkably well at coping with wet as well particularly if the conditions are with no oxygen so you'll find a lot of these seeds can easily survive a major flood particularly if you have large groups of floating mats i mean if you have a, a massive amount of vegetation pre-flood a lot of this is obviously going to turn into coal and oil but you still have large amounts of these floating log mats which can carry seeds and all sorts of stuff which end up uh, being able to spread out and repopulate themselves after the flood so i suspect it's got more to do with seeds being able to cope with large amounts of water than it has noah taking it specifically to help repopulate the earth with plants but it certainly stands to reason as uh, as sam said that noah would have taken these plants and seeds and so on and so forth aboard with him particularly the ones that can actually help with agriculture um things like the grains things like the vines uh things that can actually be mass produced because you'll find a lot of plants don't do very well with being mass produced but there's a small number which do exceedingly well with mass production these include the cereals and the grasses right and so on and so forth uh, and they just to happen to be the ones that are most beneficial for us as being able to raise and eat and consume as a human race so a little bit of interesting agricultural history uh, there as well again yeah. great answers uh sorry i was on mute um lots of great comments coming in we're still at 70 people but uh we did hit the two and a half hour mark joe sam great endurance uh you know somebody it's, uh, yeah mid middle of the night here at the moment yeah it's <laughs> we're always, gonna wrap it's always, it's always good to be on here yes i appreciate that we're gonna wrap it up here we've got uh your links being posted in the chat they're also in the description box i have um made a document with all the questions so i will send them to you Again, thank you. thank you so much for the presentation, uh, Sam and Joe. Fantastic answers to some really good uh, questions. Uh, any any final words, final thoughts, uh, Sam and Joe, before we uh, shut it down? I'll let Joe go first. 
All right. Well, uh, keep asking questions. That's the first one. Um, I think Sam did a really great job tonight for his sort of first creation research outing. Oh, yeah. So uh, well done there for Sam. That was really, really, really good. Um, and uh, of course, just a reminder of some of the things that we, we've got coming up. We obviously have creation conversations on our program every Friday. Keep an eye out for that trailer about the climate change political side of things, because that'll be uh, interesting coming up fairly soon as well. And um, yeah, we look forward to uh, joining you next time where i'll be going through the flood post flood boundary which is a very controversial topic amongst creationists so i'll be giving you my perspective which is um uh, maybe not the conventional one but uh, we'll we'll see how we go with we'll see how we go with that well thank you so much joe i'm really i know there's a lot of in-house discussion on that uh, uh -huh. specific uh -huh. topic so i know there's a lot of us including matt who are just really excited for that so i appreciate all the time you guys give us Great uh, stuff. Sam. Sam, yeah um out. i've i've loved being on here it's been fantastic um we've been planning this for ages and it finally came around so it's been really exciting um i will say that um the the genesis film is going well uh, I'm glad you guys love the trailer. Uh, that's been sort of like a secret I've had to keep for a little while now. Um, and um, I know that, you know, these guys, Matt and Donnie, are, are super excited. And, you know, Joe's excited as well. You know, we're all, we're all chomping at the bit to get this to, into your hands as quick as possible. And we will get it to your hands as quick as possible. You know, I do want you guys to see it. Um, but we won't release it until it's ready. That's the only caveat I will say is that if we don't feel it's right, we won't release it. Um, not full stop. We're not bringing the project all together. I don't want to worry anyone. Um, but um, but yeah, we're we we I'm working hard on it. Um, I'm doing a little bit of uh, work on the music and the um, the titles at the minute. Um, the base content I think is pretty much there. Um, might be a few tweaks here and there, but I mean you know there always is tweaks. I mean nothing, nothing's ever perfect. Um, but I will say that obviously this is not intended to be a literal inter, you know, like, you know, as in like, you know, letter by letter interpretation of what actually happened at Genesis. This is, we are taking artistic liberties here. Um, so this is not a, something to, uh, to get all sort of, you know, Oh, well you, you did this, you did that. Well, you know, I mean, we, we weren't there, so we don't know. So I, I, I'm having to guess with a few things. Um, but we are going on what we can best do. And, and also it's about relating it to the modern audience as well. You know, using imagery from today to relate to what we read and how God may indeed have created the world. We don't know, but we, we're we taking a wild stab at it and it's coming out really well. So I'm, I'm, I'm super stoked, guys. I really can't wait to do it. And we're definitely, we're definitely going to do a premiere. We have to do a premiere now. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> proper premiere with music and lights and well maybe not that but um you know oh, so, red, the red carpet. carpet the red carpet yeah oh well, i don't know i'll tell you what we'll just do a live i'll just hold up a red carpet you know there you go, <laughs> red carpet there. um but yeah so we'll, we'll definitely do that and we'll, obviously we'll invite all you guys and i think we may even do like a multi-stream to everywhere of the premiere and then we'll yeah we'll go from there hopefully i mean we think we'll it's still in the planning stages so well, I appreciate those final words. Uh, great final words, Joe and Sam. I know it's not always easy keeping these, uh, you know, big projects a secret. Mm -hmm. So you did a great job. <laughs> I know I'm never good with that. And uh, right before we shut it down, Matt, great job today uh, with the questions and, uh, you know, being co-host. Any final words, final thoughts from you, brother? Yeah, good uh, job, Matt. Yeah. Thanks. And um, yeah, I'll give up my time and I'm going to play the trailer one more time for the people that just jumped in and haven't got to see it yet. <laughs> oh, awesome. Let's do it.
so good. Awesome. <laughs> so good. Love it. I got to say, I love the Spinosaurus, the Plesiosaurs, you know, the dinosaur. You know, this is an accurate depiction. So yes. awesome trailer. We will have it uploaded in the next hour or two on the channel as well. Both channels. We did a uh, double stream tonight and it, and it went well. So I think we're going to start doing this more often. So that being said, thanks again, Joe, Sam, Matt. Uh, thanks to everybody in the audience. God bless you all. And uh, Standing for Truth is out. Yeah.